The Machine Gunners by Robert Westall Chapter 1 When Chaz awakened, the air raid shelter was silent. Grey winter light was creeping round the door curtain. It could have been any time. His mother was gone, and the little brown attache case with the insurance policies and bottle of brandy for emergencies. He could hear the milk cart coming round the square. The all-clear must have gone. He climbed out of the shelter, scratching his head, and looked round carefully. Everything was just the same. Same whistling milkman, same cart horse. But there was too much milk on the cart, and that was bad. Every extra bottle meant some family bombed out during the night. He trailed round to the kitchen door. His mother had the paraffin heater on, bread frying. It smelled safe. There were two more panes of glass out of the window and his father had blocked the gaps with cardboard from a Nestle's milk box. The lettering on the cardboard was the right way up. Father was fussy about things like that. Father was sitting by the heater with his pint mug of tea. He looked weary, but still neat in his warden's uniform, with his berry tucked under his shoulder strap. You remember that lass in the greengrocers? The ginger-haired one, said his mother, still bending over the stove. Aye, a direct hit. They found half of her in the front garden and the other half right across the house. She didn't believe in going down the shelter. She was always frightened of being buried alive. From the way his mother hunched her shoulders, Chaz could tell she was trying not to cry. Chaz's father turned to him. Your rabbits are all right. Chinny had some glass in her straw, but I shifted it. But there's six pains out of the greenhouse. If it goes on this way, there'll be no chrysanthemums for Christmas. It won't be the same without croissants, said his mother. Her lips were tight together, but shaking slightly. Here's your breakfast. Chaz cheered up. Two whole slices of fried bread and a roll of pale pink sausage meat. It tasted queer. Not at all like sausage before the war, but he was starting to like the queerness. He ate silently, listening to his parents. If he shut up, they soon forgot he was there. You heard much more interesting things if you didn't butt in. I thought we were a goner last night, I really did. That dive bomber. I thought it was going to land on top of the shelter. Mrs. Spaulding had one of her turns. It wasn't a dive bomber, announced Father with authority. It had two engines. He came down on the rooftops because one of the RAF lads was after him, right on his tail. You could see his guns firing, and he got him. Crashed on the old laundry at Churton. Full bomb load. I felt the heat on me face a mile away. Mother's face froze. Nobody killed, love. That laundry's been empty for years. Just as well. There's not much left of it. Charles finished his last carefully cut dice of fried bread and looked hopefully at his father. Can I go and see it? Ah, you can go and look, but you won't find out but bricks. Everything just went. Mother looked doubtful. Do you think he should? Let him go, lass. There's nought left. No one exploded bombs? No. A quiet night, really. Lots of our fighters up. That's why you didn't hear any guns. Can I borrow your old shopping basket, said Chaz. I suppose so, but don't lose it. And don't bring any of your old rubbish back in the house. Take it straight down the greenhouse. What time school, said his father. Half past ten. The raid went on after midnight. War had its compensations. Chaz had the second best collection of war souvenirs in Garmouth. It was all a matter of knowing where to look. Silly kids looked on the pavements or in the gutters, as if anything there wasn't picked up straight away. The best places to look were where no one else would dream, like in the dry soil under privet hedges. You often found machine gun bullets there, turned into little metal mushrooms as they hit the ground. Fools thought nothing could fall through a hedge. As he walked, Chaz's eyes were everywhere. At the corner of Marston Road, the pavement was burnt into a white patch a yard across. Incendiary bomb. The tail fin would be somewhere near. They normally bounced off hard when the bomb hit. He retrieved the fin from a front garden and wiped it on his coat. A good one, not bent. The dark green paint not even chipped. But he had ten of those already. Bodza Brown had fifteen. Bodza had the best collection of souvenirs in Garmouth. Everyone said so. There had been some doubt until Botza found the nose cone of a 3.7-inch anti-aircraft shell, and that settled it. Chaz sighed and put the fin in his basket. 
A hundred tail fins couldn't equal a nose comb. He knew the old laundry would be no good even before he got there. He began finding bits of the plane, but they were only lumps of aluminium, black on the sides and shiny at the edges, crumpled like soggy paper. They were useless as souvenirs. Other kids just laughed and said you'd cut up your mother's tin kettle. Unless it was a piece that had a number on it, or a German word, or even, Chaz sighed at the tightness in his chest, a real swastika. But these were just black and silver. The scene of the crash was a complete catastrophe. It was the partial catastrophes that Chaz found interesting. Picture frames still hanging on exposed walls five stories up, chimneys balanced on the verge of toppling whereas the old laundry had been flattened as completely as if the council's demolition gang had done it. Just piles of brick and the bomber's two engines. One engine was in the front garden of a council house that had its windows out and its ceiling down. The family was scurrying around like ants from a broken nest, making heaps of belongings they had salvaged, and then breaking up the heaps to make new heaps. Chaz watched them as if they were ants, without sympathy, because they were a slummy kind of family a great fat woman in carpet slippers and a horde of boys of assorted sizes, hair like lavatory brushes, coarse maroon jerseys that wouldn't fasten at the neck, and boots with steel heel plates. Chaz went on staring over the garden wall. The woman paused in her doorway, a slopping, handleless chamber pot in her hand. Bugger off staring, ghoul! Haven't you got anything better to do? Can I see the engine? said Chaz hopelessly. No, it's ours. No, it isn't. It belongs to the air ministry, by law. Chaz sounded confident, but his heart wasn't in it. No, it don't. It's ours, cos it knocked our house down. Bugger off, or I'll set our Cuthbert on you. Cuthbert, the largest lavatory brush, picked up a stone, a sudden look of interest dawning on his face. The other lavatory brushes closed round him in an offensive phalanx. Chaz drew himself up for a parting shot. West Churton rubbish, he said, in a tone he had often heard his mother use. Balkwell snob, go back to where you came from, sour engine. The newspaper's coming to take photos of us today. She drew herself up, adjusting a lump of front door that stood propped against the wall. On it was chalked the legend, business as usual. The first stone flew from the fist of a lavatory brush. The phalanx began to move forward. Chaz took to his heels. The other engine was guarded by the local policeman, Fatty Harding. He was wearing a white tin hat with P on it and looking important. But he was still the fatty hardy who had chased Chaz off many a building site before the war. Stupid. This engine was much better than the one in the front garden. It still had its propeller. Though the blades were bent into horseshoes, the middle was unharmed. A lovely shiny egg shape painted red. Chaz nearly choked with greed. If only he had that. That was better than any 3.7 inch nose cone. The whole propeller was loose. It waggled when the wind blew. Chaz's mouth actually filled with saliva, as if he could smell a pie cooking. How could he get rid of Fatty Hardy? An unexploded bomb? Swiftly, he bashed his eyes with his fists, throwing handfuls of dust into them until they began to stream with tears. Then he ran towards Fatty Hardy, boring incoherently. As he reached the policeman, he put his hand up. School died hard. Please, sir, Mum says come quick. There's a deep hole in our garden, and there's a ticking coming from it. Fatty looked distinctly worried. Airplane engines was airplane engines and needed protecting from thieving kids. But unexploded bombs was unexploded bombs. Hurry, sir. There's little kids all round it, looking down the hall. Fatty grabbed his shoulders and shook him roughly. Where? Where? Take me, take me. Please, sir. No, sir. Mum says I mustn't go back there in case it goes off. I've got to go to me grand, sir. Put the bombs at 19 Marston Road. Fatty went off at a wobbling run, his gas mask case flogging his broad bottom. Before he was out of sight, Chaz was at the engine. Its realness was overwhelming. There were German words on the cowling. Ur was the only one he could recognise. Everything was bigger close to. The twisted prop blades curled into the air like palm leaves. The red spinner, which he had thought as carryable as a rugby ball, now seemed as big as a brewery barrel. He tugged at it. It came off so far and then stuck. He heaved again at the shiny red newness. It still resisted. Nazi pigs, he screamed as his hands slipped and the blood came. 
he picked up a lump of brickwork, four bricks still cemented together, and raising it above his head, flung it at the spinner. The beautiful red thing crushed in, but it still wouldn't budge. He hit it again. Another great white flaking dent appeared. It was a mess now, hardly worth having, but still it refused to come off. There was a sudden roar of rage from behind. Fatty Hardy had returned, sweaty face working. Chaz ran. He wasn't greatly worried. Hardy was puffing already. He wouldn't last 50 yards. The only worry was the piles of rubble underfoot. If he fell, Hardy would have him. Placing his feet carefully, he ran towards the wood. The wood was in the grounds of West Churton Hall. At one time, his father said, the people at the hall had owned everything. But then the factories came, and the council estate, and the owners of the hall just curled up and died for shame. Now the house itself was just a hole in the ground lined with brick and a black cinder floor. There was a big water tank full of rusty water and nothing else. The wood was bleak and ugly too. Grown-ups dumped rubbish round the outside, and kids climbed and broke the trees. But nobody went into the middle. Some said it was haunted, but Chaz had never found anything there but a feeling of cold misery, which wasn't exciting like headless horsemen. Still, it was an oddly discouraging sort of place. Each year, the briars grew thicker. Even Chaz knew only one way through them. He took it now, wriggling under arches of briars as thick as your finger, interlaced like barbed wire. He was safe. Fatty Hardy couldn't even try to follow. He picked himself up quickly because the grass was soaking. The sky seemed even greyer through the bare branches, and he felt fed up. Still... Since he was here, he might as well search for souvenirs. Churton Hall was another place no one ever looked. He'd found his best bit of shrapnel there, a foot long, smooth and milled on the sides, but with jagged edges like bad teeth. He sniffed. There was a foreign smell in the wood, like petrol and fireworks. Funny. It wasn't Guy Fawkes yet. Some kids must have been messing about. As he pressed on, the smell grew stronger. There must be an awful lot of petrol. Something was blocking out the light through the branches. A new building? A secret army base? A new anti-aircraft gun? He couldn't quite see, except that it was black. And then he saw, quite clearly at the top, a swastika, black outlined in white. He didn't know whether to run towards it or away. So he stayed stock still listening. Not a sound except the buzzing of flies. The angry way they buzzed off dog dirt when you waved your hand over it. It was late in the year for flies. He moved forward again. It was so tall, like a house. And now it was divided into four arms at right angles to each other. He burst into the clearing. It was the tail of an aeroplane. The German bomber that had crashed on the laundry. At least, most of it had crashed on the laundry. The tail, breaking off in the air, had spun to earth like a sycamore seed. He'd read of that happening in books. He could also tell from books that this had been a Heinkel HE-111. Suddenly he felt very proud. He'd report the find and be on the nine o'clock news. He could hear the newsreader's voice. The mystery bomber shot down over Garmouth on the night of the 1st of November has been identified as a new and secret variation of the Heinkel HE-111. It was found by a nearly unknown schoolboy, Charles McGill of Garmouth High School. Uh, sorry, I'll read that again. Form 3A at Garmouth High School. There is no doubt that but for the sharp eyes of this young man, several enemy secret weapons vital to the Blitzkrieg would have remained undiscovered. Chaz sighed. If he reported it, they'd just come and take it away for scrap. Like when he'd taken that shiny new incendiary bomb rack to the warden's post. They'd not even said thank you. And he wouldn't get into the news? It was a perfectly normal Heinkel 111. Registration letters HXL, with typical dorsal turret mounting one machine gun. Chas gulped. The machine gun was still there, hanging from the turret, shiny and black. Chapter 2 Chaz reached up and tugged at the gun barrel. 
One leg of its swivel had snapped with the impact. He wrenched at the other, but the aluminium of the aircraft body just bent without breaking. Besides, a belt of shining cartridges went from the gun back into the aircraft. It supported the gun like a sling against Chaz's downward pulls. Perhaps if he loosened the cartridge belt. He grabbed the round barrel, put his plimsolls against the curving sides of the plane, and went up like a monkey. He peered over the edge of the cockpit. The gunner was sitting there, watching him. One hand in a soft fur mitt was stretched up as if to retrieve the gun. The other lay in his overall lap. He wore the black leather flying helmet of the Luftwaffe and goggles. His right eye, pale grey, watched through the goggle glass tolerantly and a little sadly. He looked a nice man, young. The glass of the other goggle was gone. Its rim was thick with sticky red, and inside was a seething mass of flies, which rose and buzzed angrily at Chaz's arrival, then sank back into the goggle again. For a terrible moment, Chaz thought the Nazi was alive, that the mitted hand would reach out and grab him. And even worse, he knew he was dead. It was like that moment in a fight when you think you're winning, and then suddenly you're lying on the ground with your mouth full of salty blood, and you know you're going to lose, so you start shaking all over. Only this was ten times worse. He wanted to let go of the fuselage, drop off and run home, but something in his mind wouldn't let him. Something found the dead man fascinating. Something made him reach out and touch the gloved hand. Inside the sheepskin, the fingers were hard as iron. The arm and whole body was stiff. The gunner moved, but only as a statue or a toy soldier would move, all in one piece. The flies rose and buzzed. Inside the goggle was a deep red hole full of what looked like... Chaz dropped and was violently sick against a little door marked Nicht Anfassen. He thought his mother would be angry at him for having wasted a good breakfast when food was hard to get. Then he heard the nine o'clock hooter. Everyone set their watches by the factory hooters. They went at seven and eight and twelve and five. But this one, a little silly warbly one, went at nine. Chaz knew it well because it told him if he was late for school. School? School was half past ten, and he had to get home and change into uniform. He must hurry. He scurried off through the brambles without a backward look. But nightmares aren't so easily shaken off. On his way home, he wiped the splashes of sick off his jerkin. But his mother noticed how pale he was. Looked like you seen a ghost. What you been up to? Nothing, Mum. Had to run all the way cos I was late and I've got a stitch. Where's me basket? Jazz's jaw fell open. The basket was lying by the little door marked Nicht Anfassen. I, I forgot it. it. It's all right. I've, I've hidden it in a safe place. I'll get it tonight after school. For an awful moment he thought she was going to drag him back for the basket there and then. She did things like that when she got into a temper but she also had a dread of him being late for school. So she just said, See you do. You can't get a basket for love nor money these days. Your dad bought that for me at Newcastle Market when we were courting. Now get off to school before you get the stick. He sighed. She would never understand that you didn't get the stick for being late these days. But even at school, the nightmare persisted. Right through double maths and into English, usually his favourite subject... That goggled face kept on coming back. His hands turned shiny with sweat. It ran down his forehead. He never even heard the question Mr. Little, the English master, asked him. Usually he was first with his hand up. What's the matter with you this morning, McGill? You ill? God, no. Being ill meant being sent home, answering questions, being sent to fetch that basket. Sorry, sir. Couldn't sleep in the shelter. Woman next door had kittens because she thought that bomber was diving on her personally. The class roared. The English master regarded Chaz sharply for a moment, then decided to join in the laugh. Then he stifled a yawn and ran his hands through his greying hair. Mr. Little doubled nights as Captain Little of the Garmouth Home Guard and found the experience wearing. Besides, McGill was a good pupil usually, but he had too vivid an imagination. A boy to like, but not a boy to trust. Chaz went back to his vision of the machine gunner. For there was something else in the vision, 
the machine gun black, you, listening. Even in his terror, because of his terror, he wanted that gun. He wanted to beat Bodsa Brown. But how? First, cut it free. His father's hacksaw should see to that. All his father's tools were wonderful, powerful, could cope with anything. But then he would need some way of moving the gun. From the way it had swung on its mount, he knew it would be heavy. Cemetery Jones's bogey. That could do it. He had a vision of the bogey, a heavy two-inch plank with big pram wheels at each end and a soapbox for a body. And Cemetery Jones was just the one who would go with him into Churtonwood at dusk. Cemetery Jones was called after his father, who was also called Cemetery Jones. He was the keeper of the Garmouth graveyard and marched ahead of funerals in black gaiters and a top hat wrapped in black muslin, looking like the devil leading sinners at a brisk pace to the gates of hell. Off duty, he was very cheerful, with straw-coloured hair, pale blue eyes, some very grisly jokes, and a laugh like a horse. He had gleaming white-spaced teeth like marble tombstones, which he was said to clean six times every day. Cemetery Junior had the same laugh, hair, eyes, and teeth, though he didn't clean his at all, so they were very yellow. He said a dentist had once told him that they were so widely spaced they would never rot, and he was testing the theory out. Charles caught Sam in school dinner. School dinner was a kind of self-discipline. The potatoes and the thin translucent custard tasted so queer that they required an effort of will to eat. But Charles had an uncle who was chief engineer on an oil tanker in the Persian Gulf. Every so often, Uncle William was invited to a feast by the local sheikh, who would suddenly hand him a whole sheep's eye with grease-dripping fingers. If Uncle William could swallow it in one gulp without gagging, the oil would continue to flow. If not, on such small things hung the fate of the free world. Jazz was training himself to be like Uncle William. He was even training himself to like the smell of burning rubber. It's an acquired taste, he'd say to his friends airily. Cemetery's approach to school dinner was different. He treated his plate as an artist treats his palate, whirling gravy, dried potato, dried peas and dried egg into cosmic whirls and brushwork occasionally flipping a choice piece of impasto into his mouth. By the time all had collapsed into a grey, soggy, amorphous mass from which no further reaction could be derived, it was three-quarters eaten. This procedure he called the potato irrigation scheme. I've found something, announced Chaz mysteriously, over the ginger stodge. It's big. I need your bogey to shift it. Can't got me guy on the bogey. What do you want a guy for? No bonfires allowed this year, no fireworks in the shops, nothing. You're potty. I use the money I collect to buy sweets. Look, it's just one night. This is big, bigger than anything you've ever seen. Go on, you always say that. Come and see for yourself, then. When? Tonight. Got to do me homework before the raid starts. We've only got one candle in our shelter, and Mum says it ruins your eyes. Look. I'll give you an incendiary bomb fin, a real smasher, not a dent. I'll come for the fin then, but I don't believe the other. Chaz's eyes suddenly glinted. He'd had one of his famous ideas. And bring your bogey with the guy still on it. They were going down to West Churton. Chaz was on the bogey and Sam was pulling it, snorting and grunting like a horse. He always insisted on pulling the bogey, so he never got a ride. When asked why, he always said he was getting his muscles up, but everyone knew he was really scared of letting go of the tow rope in case someone ran off with the bogey. People didn't grumble. They enjoyed the ride. Suddenly there was the wild ringing of a bicycle bell behind. Oh, hell, said Chaz and Cemetery together. Where are you kids going? asked a bossy female voice. And why have you got two guys on your bogey this year, Cemetery? Oh, ha, ha, said Chaz in disgust. Faff off, Audrey Parton, we're busy. Busy? The scorn was finally done. Little things please little minds, while bigger fools look on, retorted Chaz, in disgust at themselves. It was an old, boring routine, but Sam laughed like a horse. Audrey Parton rode past and slewed round her bike to block the road. Tell me where you're going, or I won't let you past. There was something in the threat. She was bigger than either Sam or Chaz. 
what Mrs. McGill called a fine strapping lass. She had bulging hocking muscles and grey ankle socks and red hair and pigtails and freckles. She fought boys and, alas, sometimes won. On the other hand, there were some good things about her, which made her the only girl Sam and Charles ever talked to. Her chest was quite flat, and she didn't giggle and whisper to other girls as you went past. She never told anyone to her mother, and she was as good climbing trees and drain pipes as any boy. For a long time she'd led her own girls' gang, but now they'd all deserted her for sheer lyle stockings, ringlets, and mother's powder puff. She'd become a misfit. She said she always wanted to be a boy. She was the only girl who always had sticking plasters on her knees. Mrs. McGill treated Audrey with respect, because her family were posh and owned a car. But Mr. McGill said her father was skulking in a reserved occupation, making his fortune while better men went to fight for their country. When Mr. McGill spoke in that sort of voice, nobody argued. Where are you going? asked Audrey. Can I come? Charles muttered under his breath a phrase he'd heard sailors use. Going to me auntie's at West Churton, said Sim. You haven't got an auntie at West Churton. Have so, haven't so. This went on for some time. Chaz eyed her bulging muscles speculatively. That machine gun was heavy. She might come in useful. Besides, the dead German would scare the little cow silly. She wouldn't interfere with men's business again. All right, you can come with us. Lead on, Muckduff, said Audrey, patting him on the head as the bogey rolled past. Chaz felt his hair suddenly prickle, as if it was full of nits. They hid Audrey's bike on the edge of the wood and pushed in. They had to lay the guy down to get the bogey through the briars. Chaz thought that in the dusk he looked like a dead man. He had to keep shushing Sam and Audrey. They both had fits of the giggles as they felt the tension. It's all just one of your stupid jokes, said Sam, but it'll cost you that bomb fin. I'm not going to do any dirty things with you two in this wood, so you needn't think I am, said Audrey, caught between fear and desire. I don't mind kissing, but no more. Yuck, said Sam. Who'd want to with you? Chaz's chest was getting tighter and tighter. He was glad he wasn't alone. At least he'd get Mum's basket back. When Sam saw the bomber, he laughed as if it was a joke. Shut up, said Chaz. There's a dead German inside. You can look if you want, but Audrey can't. Sam climbed up, dropped down again and whistled. That's one for me, Dad. No, it's not. They don't bury them here. Yes, they do. Dad had a coffin full of bits from this bomber at lunchtime. Well screwed down, it was, I can tell you. Go on. They send them all... Yeah? To the war office to count them, said Chas stoutly through chattering teeth. Is there really? said Audrey, all eyes and woman for once. Chas was not displeased with the effect he was having on her. But he said severely, girls aren't allowed to look. They can't stand it. Poor man, said Audrey. He's a long way from home. Look, said Chaz, we came for this, he waggled the gun. Quo, cool, you're not... How can we get it off? Got me dad's saw. He pulled it out from under his jerkin. Hold the gun steady. He began to saw. It was hard work. He kept catching his knuckles on the rivets of the fuselage and soon blisters came. When he handed over to Sam, he'd cut a quarter of the way through the aluminium strut. Can't see where I've got to saw, said Sam. I've got a torch. The fuselage lit up, and the trees around. Charles couldn't resist a peep upwards to see if the dead German was looking down, watching them. When he took over the saw from Sam, they were halfway through. There's a funny smell, said Audrey. What's that funny smell? That's him said Sam, nodding towards the shadowy fuselage with a professional air. It gets worse as it goes along. I want to go home, said Audrey, beginning to sniff. Go then. There's probably other dead ones in the wood, waiting to get you. Audrey gave a little scream. Keep that torch straight. I knew a girl wouldn't be any good. Oh, shut up. But the torch beam straightened and held steady. Put that light out! The yell came from the edge of the wood. Audrey screamed and dropped the torch. There was the sound of breaking glass and it went out. Oh, God, said Sam. That's Fatty Hardy. Shush. But Chaz went on sawing like a mad thing. 
He was nearly through that aluminium strut, and he wasn't going to be cheated now. He felt the strut give, and the gun fell agonisingly on his foot. He grabbed it up, and immediately it shook and leapt in his arms. A golden red light filled the clearing, and a noise like Guy Fawkes gone mad. He let go of the gun, and the noise stopped. But he could see where the aircraft tail bulked large against the sky. A great ragged hole had been torn in it. A police whistle shrilled on the edge of the wood. God, that's done it, said Sam. Shall we run? But Chaz sat hunched in a dream of power, remembering the vibration against his foot, the red spark shooting up, and beyond them, flights of dark bullets winging through the dark enemy sky. What are we going to do? whispered Sam frantically. Abruptly, Chaz returned to the present. Even shaking from head to foot, he was still the one who thought up the plan. What's your guy's legs made of? Sticks. Get one out. What for? We're putting the gun up it. The gun went, though it split the guy's trousers. The old Wellington boot just covered the end, though one of the guy's legs was now inches longer than the other. Still, guys were like that. Chaz used all the string and wire in his pockets to make it secure and stuffed the straw back into all the gaps. Right, out we go. He didn't forget his mum's shopping basket. They crawled through the briars towards Audrey's bike. Oh, Lord, groaned Sam. Fatty Hardy was standing some yards off, staring straight at where they lay. He was accompanied by a warden, a woman in a headscarf, two small boys and a dog. It was the small boys who worried Chaz, but it was the dog which barked and ran straight at them. Tears of rage filled Chaz's eyes to be so near to owning the gun and then... The dog stopped two yards off and stood yapping hysterically. Chaz threw a stick at it and missed. The dog retreated a yard and continued its din. Hey, that dog's found something, shouted Fatty Hardy, advancing. Chapter Three Chaz despaired, and then suddenly the night turned white, black, white, black, white. A great hammer banged on the dark tin tray of the sky, crushing their eardrums again and again. Anti-aircraft guns. Then, in the following silence, came the noise of an aircraft engine. Chug, 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 chug. One of theirs, whispered Sem. The dog whined and fled. Fatty Hardy shouted, and the whole group of bystanders were streaking away to the nearest shelter. Then that hammer was beating the sky again. Echoes of its blows rippled away like someone slamming doors further and further off down a corridor. Chaz stared at the sky, trying to guess where the next white flashes would come from. They came in, in a scattered pattern moving west, five at a time. That was the guns at the castle. Then a group of three together. That was the guns at Willington Quay. What shall we do? whispered Audrey. Take your bike and get to a shelter. We can manage without you. But I shouldn't be out in the open during an air raid. You don't think these trees will shelter you from anything, said Chaz brutally. She went, wobbling wildly across the waste ground. What about us, said Sam. I'm getting this gun home while the streets are empty. This air raid's the best chance we've got. The wardens will stop us. Not if we go by Bogey Lane. Bogey Lane was a little used cinder track that led through the allotments to near home. No one will think of looking there. Right, come on then. The blackness of night was back. As they dragged and bounced through the dark, the warning note of the air raid siren sounded. Dozy swine, caught asleep as usual, said Sam in disgust. It's a sneak raider. They glide in without engines. And he's hit something. Sam nodded to the west, where a rapidly growing yellow glare was lighting up the rooftops. Or else they got him. Must be Howden way. Only the one. All clear will sound in a minute. But it didn't. They were halfway up Bogey Lane when they heard the chug, chug, chug of enemy engines again. More than one. Six or seven. Ahead, the night lit up as if great blue floodlights had been switched on. Blue points of light hung motionless in the sky, brighter than stars. They're dropping parachute flares. The chug, chug, chug grew nearer. They felt like two small flies crawling across a white tablecloth. Up there, thought Chaz. Nazi bomb aimers were staring down through black goggles, teeth clenched, hands tight on bomb release toggles, waiting for the crosshairs on their bomb sites to meet on Bogey Lane and the two flies who crawled there. 
They dived for cover into a patch of winter broccoli. It smelled safe because they had some in the vegetable rack at home. Chaz envied the broccoli because whatever happened, it would still be growing here tomorrow in the sane world of daylight, just ordinary. As ordinary as the Fry's chocolate sign that the allotment owner had used, upside down to mend a hole in his fence. Chug, 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 overhead now. They were safe, because bombs always dropped in a curve in front of the bombers. He'd watched them fall in the newsreels of the Polish campaign, out of black stukas. Bang, bang, bang. The hammer was at it again, right overhead. This meant a new danger. Falling shell shrapnel. Chas could hear it, whispering and pattering down like steel rain all around. Go on, screamed Chas. Get the bastards! Kill the bastards! Then silence. Blackness. Nothing. The parachute flares had gone out. Come on, shouted Chas, dragging Sam to his feet. They'll be back in a minute. The bogey wheels crunched along the cinders, and they could hear the hard knock-knock of the machine gun on the bogey's planks. They got back to the square before trouble started again. A rough hand grabbed Chaz's shoulder. Where the hell you been? It was his father, wearing a tin hat. Your mother's worried sick. She knew I was going down Churton, squawked Chaz. Get down the shelter. Who's that with you? Sam, get him down as well. I'll go and tell his mother he's safe. What about the guy? Mr McGill dragged the bogey roughly against the garden hedge. It'll have to take its chance. E, you had me worried sick, said Mrs. McGill. And Mrs. Spaulding here too. Mrs. Spaulding nodded and sniffed. Her son Colin in the bottom bunk looked self-righteous. Her Colin never leaves her back garden at nights. He's a good lad. And I was cooking fish and chips when the siren went, and I had to turn the gas off, and now they're ruined. And I don't know what else we're going to have for supper, because there's only dry bread in the house. And your father's supposed to be on night shift and he can't get to work for the raid, so we'll have no money, and I wonder that they don't pay him for being a warden. After all, he works hard enough at it. Chas lay back on his bunk, let her words drift over his head. He was thinking about the machine gun out there in the dark. And leading Cyril off, strain with you? Cemetery's real name was Cyril, which is why he preferred being called Cemetery. I mean, leading Cyril astray like that. If anything had happened to him, I could never have looked Mrs Jones in the face again. Ben shouldn't be let wander in the dark these days. Real wickedness, I call it, said Mrs. Spaulding. Charles shot her a look of hate from the shadow of his bunk. She had fat knees and ginger stockings, which kept straying apart so he could see she was wearing apricot knickers. Her legs were mottled through sitting too close to the fire. His mother's legs dangling over his head had pinker stockings, and thank God she always kept her knees together. They sat round, bleary-eyed in the dawn light. No more windows had been broken in the kitchen. The paraffin heater and gas stove were on again. I put Sam's bogey in the greenhouse, said Mr. McGill. By God, it's a rare wit. What does he make his guy of? Drain pipes? Dunno, said Chaz, cutting his fried bread into careful cubes. I'll take it back tonight. You can take it back this morning. No school today. The old clear's still not gone. Do you think it's safe? asked Mrs. McGill. Her husband looked out at the cloudless November sky. They'll not come again. Though the RAF lads at Acklington will have something to say about it. Is there much damage in the town? Nothing. It was Howden that copped it. They hit a gas main and it's still burning. After breakfast, Chas crept down to the greenhouse with his father's spanner. The greenhouse had had a boiler and hot water pipes for heating before the war, when coke was off the ration. Now it was drained dry and Chaz had found he could take the ends off the big fat hot water pipes. The machine gun could be slid down inside, if he could get those sticking out drums off it. He fiddled with them carefully. He didn't want to blow the end out of his father's greenhouse. He got them off in the end. One was full of live bullets, and the other full of spent cartridge cases. Chaz hesitated. He'd have liked to have taken one or two bullets to school to show around, but... Once Fatty Hardy found that bomber's tail, he'd be around all the schools making inquiries, and there'd always be some kid who blabbed. Better safe than sorry. He wrapped the gun in cloth and slid it into the water pipe without looking at it further. He screwed the end of the water pipe back on. He hid the drums of bullets in the thick straw of Chinny's hutch. He'd just finished when his father came down. You're pulling Sim's guy to bits. Chas controlled a guilty start and said casually, Just mending the leg. 
You leave that the same. It's his guy. I sometimes think you're a bit too free with other people's property. Got no sense of mine and thine. That's your trouble. Chas said humbly, Yes, Dad. Mr. McGill cocked an eyebrow at such humble obedience, but he soon wandered off to poke at his chrysanthemums. For some reason, Fatty Harley did not go back and find the bomber. Others did. Two days later, Sam whispered to Chaz in school assembly, You know those round things full of bullets? Got four more. They were clipped to the fuselage round the gunner's feet. Why you got them? Under some plant pots in the shed. It's all right. Dad never goes there since the war. They're all cobwebs and chrysalises. Look at this one. It's live. Chaz jumped an inch in the air. But it wasn't a brass bullet Sam held out inside his hymn book. Only a black and yellow chrysalis. You can hear it tapping to get out. Is the gunner still there? Yeah. Whoa. He didn't half niff. I don't know how you can stand it, said Chaz savagely. Ain't you got no feelings? You get used to it. It's in the family. When my father went on an embalming course, he saw one fella eating his sandwiches, reading a book propped against a body. Yuck, said Chaz loudly. If you insist on talking an assembly boy, boomed the head, you can have a little talk with my cane afterwards. Yes, you with the freckles and three A. Yes, you, the one who's turning round to look behind him so innocently. Three of the best for you. Now school, hymn 235. New every morning is the love. But getting the cane was not the worst. Two days later, Chaz saw a crowd standing round Bodsa Brown in the playground. They were all looking at something and laughing. Chaz hated Bodsa. He had round spectacles and cropped hair like a German, and a great gangling grown-up body. He was stupid and a bully, an arm twister who made his pleasure last a long time. One day last term, he and his gang had held a kid's head down the toilet and flushed it three times. The kid nearly drowned and was off school for a week. Bods had got cane, but you might as well cane a rhinoceros. Chas sometimes dreamt of beating in his skull with an iron bar. But he could never leave Bodser alone. He was so easy to take the mickey out of. And when he started to get rough, he could always shout, Quick fist, slow wits, or don't get worked up, you'll give yourself a heart attack. And everyone would laugh, because no one liked Bodzer really. And Bodzer was nearly as afraid of laughter as Chaz was of Bodzer's fists. Taking the mickey out of Bodzer was like bullfighting. Deadly, but fun. Chaz walked across to the laughing group. Hey, what's up? Ah, McGill, said Bodzer. King of the incendiary bombs. Why don't you wear your nose cone permanently? It would go with your spectacles. There was a titter. Bodzer flushed. Got something better than a nose cone to wear. Look! He dangled a black leather flying helmet under Chaz's nose. Chaz didn't have to guess it belonged to the German gunner. His nose told him. But he said calmly, Where'd you get that? Woolworths. Never you mind. That's genuine Nazi. And so's this money. He showed a fistful of notes marked with Hitler's face and swastikas. And what about this? Mein Liebling, she's called. He thrust a photo of a blonde girl with pigtails. She won't be getting any more you-know-what for a bit. There was a brown trickle down one corner of the photograph. Chaz broke out in a sweat and felt sick. Bodzer had been through the dead man's pockets. Chaz turned away abruptly and walked towards the cloakrooms. That's better than your rotten shrapnel, shouted Bodzer in triumph after him. Chapter 4 Mr. Little Stan Little turned back towards the headmaster's door, wondering what he'd done to bring that waspish tone into the head's voice. Mr. Little Henry Montgomery turned up his nose distastefully. We have a policeman in school apparently wanting to see you. He hasn't seen fit to tell me his business, top secret apparently. Anyway, he has asked permission to use my study to interview you. Please see it's empty by the time I get back from break. I have parents coming. He stalked away, black gown quivering with indignation. Stan went in. There was a police sergeant standing by the fireplace, staring at Henry Montgomery's imitation marble bust of Shakespeare. As he turned, Stan saw he had a bad limp. 
Hello, sir. It wasn't the way policemen say, sir. It was the way a schoolboy says, sir. Familiar eyes stared out at Stan from an unfamiliar face, a face twisted by a scar that ran from chin to hairline, and tight lines of pain around the eyes and mouth. I it's... it's green, isn't it? Yes, sir. The schoolboy grin was still there, though the man looked forty. But I thought you had a commission in the army. Stan could have bitten his tongue off the next minute, remembering the limp and scar. I copped it at Dunkirk. They got me in the foot, the face, and the nerves, so I was shoveled out as an invalid. Still, I'm trying to make myself useful. Stops me remembering. Sit down, won't you? said Stan awkwardly. I'd like your advice, sir. Uh, we've found something. It's not pretty. The inspector's left it to me. We're short-handed. It's not really important, and yet it niggles me. Lying awake last night thinking about it, I remembered you, sir and the way you always knew what to do when I was at school. Anything I can do, said Stan. He felt embarrassed. I'd like you to come and look at it, sir. As I said, it's not pretty, but I'd be grateful. I mean, well, you're in the home guard, and so you know about weapons. And I think it's the work of boys. No one knows boys like you do. They drove from school in a police car. Stan hadn't bothered to consult Henry Montgomery. If he didn't like it, he could lump it. A way had been beaten into Churton Wood at last by the heavy boots of constables. One still remained on guard, looking queasy. We well, haven't touched anything yet, sir, though it'll have to be cleared up by tonight, and this is confidential. Uh, we don't want rumours spreading. The bomber's tail section was still there, but changed. Every piece that could be twisted off for a souvenir had been. Bricks had smashed the last of the perspex and caved in the aluminium sides. Someone had tried to set the whole thing on fire, and various obscenities had been scrawled on the black sides in chalk. Nasty, isn't it? And I don't think that's dog dirt either. That's not the smell of dog dirt. No, it was neighbours complaining about the smell that put us onto it. There's a dead man inside. I wouldn't look if I was you, sir. Everything that's been done to the plane's been done to him as well, poor devil. I know they're the enemy, but really... Sergeant Green was at a loss for words. Why I brought you here, sir? Look at this. He pointed to an aluminium spar still sticking out of the wreckage. Sawn through with a hacksaw, said Stan. Now, what would have been attached to that, sir? Machine gun, I suppose. And there's ammunition missing, too. These planes carry 2,000 spare rounds in the rear gun position. I checked with RAF Acklington. But who could have pinched them? We thought it might be the IRA at first. They've been pinching the odd rifle recently. But who ever heard of the IRA this far north? Lancashire, yes, but... Look at that hacksaw cut. Can you imagine a grown-up being that cack-handed? I reckon it's kids, sir. Oh, surely. What about that, then, sir? Green pointed to the bullet holes in the rudder hanging overhead. Made by the fighter that shot him down. Wrong calibre. They are 7.62 millimetre. The RAF used 0.303. Then the gunner shot through his own tail in panic. The angle's impossible. Those holes were made when the machine gun was already detached from the plane. One of my beat bobbies actually heard it happen, the night after the plane was shot down. Why didn't he investigate? He didn't know what it was. And then the siren went. He thought it was part of the raid. I'm afraid he's not very bright. You mean... Some bright kids got a gun and 2,000 rounds of live ammo. And that gun's no pea shooter. It'll go through a brick wall at a quarter of a mile. It's true. And it's some really well-organised kid, too. Finding it, going home for the saw, getting the gun home through the streets and hiding it where his parents can't find it. That takes some planning. That's not a primary kid, sir. That's a grammar school boy. Oh, you can't be one of our boys. Green gave a wry grin. I know them, sir, and you know them. Primary school kids can be tough and louts, but for real devilment, give me a grammar school boy gone wrong every time. The head's not going to like this. He'll have to lump it. That's where you could help, sir. Oh, thanks. I wouldn't have asked, sir, but if they cut loose with that thing, they could kill 20 people without even knowing they'd done it.
Chapter 5 Hey, said Sem, looking up from his potato irrigation scheme. There was a police sergeant in to see the head this morning. He saw little too. Trouble for some, said Chaz. Perhaps Little's pawned the alderman Buick chromium plated cup for effort. No such luck. Hey, do you think they're on to you know what? The way Bod says shooting his mouth off, it'll be any moment now. What about you going to Churton Wood and having a check? Oh, it'll be all right for today. That's what Julius Caesar thought on the Ides of March. Do you think I ought to go and have a look, honestly? Yeah. Hey, carrot juice, can we borrow your bike this lunchtime? He addressed a high-pitched scream to a very small first year with ginger hair across a dismal landscape of spilled water and melting discarded peas. Cost ya, said Carrot Juice, without stopping spooning in disgusting custard, his third helping. Two empty cartridge cases from a Spitfire. Bet you picked them up on the Home Guard rifle range. No, I didn't. My cousin's an RAF gun repairer. Cobber Kane gave them to him personally. Cobber Kane's dead, shot down, anybody knows that. He gave them to my cousin the day he died. Tripe. But I'll take them anyway, even if they are home guard. Right. Sem pedalled off steadily on Carrot Juice's ancient sunbeam roadster. The saddle was so low that his knees seemed up round his ears. It felt a long, long way to Churton Wood. When he got there, he left the bike in a patch of stinging nettles so no one without gloves could pinch it. The wood looked deserted, but a great path had been carved in by Rosa's beetle crushes. Sam knew he'd seen enough, knew he should go straight back to school, but he couldn't resist a peep. Gotcha! Two large hands grabbed him from behind. Help police murder, screamed Sam, and kicked and struggled, even though he knew the voice was Fatty Hardy's. He went on screaming till two passing housewives stopped to stare, and Hardy's face grew red with embarrassment. Oh, sorry, constable, I thought you were the murderer. Fatty Hardy hated being called constable. What murderer? The one who did the girl in in these woods, the Polish fella. Fatty Hardy's face betrayed a trace of doubt. What Polish fella? The soldier from the camp at Monkseaton who strangled the Wafir Saturday night. Who told you that? Woman in the chip shop. That's why I came here to look for clues. He done her in with her own silk stocking, didn't he? She was all blue in the face with her tongue sticking out. Rubbish. Someone's been having you on. What? No murder? No and push off before I run you in. Yes, sir, said Sam respectfully, and turned to the nettle bed to retrieve the bike. As he rode off, the look of triumph faded from Fatty Hardy's face. He'd forgotten to ask the one question he'd been specially told to ask. Hey, lad, come back. What's your name? Where do you live? I have to have your name. But Sam seemed to have turned stone deaf. Perhaps it was the effort of peddling so hard. Sam dropped into a neighbouring desk, Puffing. They found it. Thought so. Watch it. He is little. Stan Little swept in with his usual gusto, gown flowing and a too short pullover displaying the bottoms of his braces. This suited Stan well, as he liked hooking his thumbs into his braces while he talked. He usually had something interesting to say, and today was no exception. Found this this morning, he announced, holding up the tail fin of an incendiary bomb. The class craned and muttered, That's now, sir. Bodza Brown's got fifteen, and McGill's got ten. Not like this one. See, it's painted black instead of green, and has a yellow stripe. It's a new type that Jerry's have just started to use, twice as powerful. That caught their attention, and he held it for the next half hour, because he talked inside Jen on weapons. He held up home guard training posters, diagrams of grenades and rifles. Then the talk turned to machine guns and alarm bells began ringing in Chaz's head. You cunning sod, little, he thought, and waited, unscrewing the top of his ink bottle. There was one big poster lying still rolled up on the desk, and Chaz knew what it was. A diagram of the machine gun. Stan would hold it up and throw his quick glance around the class, looking for the guilty face. Sam's face. There was no time to warn him. As Stan held up the rolled poster with a flourish, Chaz knocked over his bottle of ink. Oh, hell! It went all over Sam's trousers. Everyone turned to look, including Sam. Stan's moment of truth was completely ruined. Chaz mopped wildly with a hanky at Sam's trousers. That's a picture of our gun he's got. Watch your face. For heaven's sake, McGill, will you pay attention? 
and you, Jones. This is a picture of a German aircraft machine gun, the MG-15 calibre 7.62mm, firing a thousand rounds a minute, effective range one mile. The class looked at him, but now they looked not all innocent, but at least all equally disorganised. Stan knew he was beaten. Right, boys, open your English exercise books. I want an essay on war souvenirs. Silence fell, but for the scratch of pens. Chaz knew how he could gain one hour and no more, and that hour would be his last chance to save the gun. He stuck his tongue out of the corner of his mouth and wrote. I used to have the best collection of war souvenirs in this town. I have 11 incendiary bomb fins, 26 spent bullets, 18 pieces of shrapnel, including one piece a foot long, and 50 empty cartridge cases, including 10 in clips that my dad's friend who was in the armed trawlers gave me. But now my collection is second best, because Bodzer Brown in 3B has beaten me. He has a 3.7 inch nose cone and a pongy German flyer's helmet and lots of German money with Hitler's face on it and a picture of a German girl in pigtails called Mein Liebling. I wish I knew how he got these things because he's beating me hollow and if I can't beat him soon I shall have to give up and start collecting cigarette cards instead. The bell went for the end of the lesson. Close your books and pass them up, said Mr. Little. There was a storm of protest. But, but, sir, we haven't finished. Can't we finish it for homework? No, pass them up. You could tell Mr. Little couldn't wait to get his hand on those books. Charles grinned to himself. He owed Bodzer Brown that one. By four o'clock, Bodzer was outside the head's door, sweating. By five, he had been given six of the best. By half past five, the police were at his mother's door with a search warrant. But long before half past five, two dogged figures were trundling a guy on a bogey through the foggy night, shouting, Penny for the guy! Hey, we're making a fortune, said Sam. But where are we going? Quick, down bogey lane. They angled the bogey into the narrow entry and vanished from adult Ken. But where can we hide it? asked Sam. Bunty's yard. Bunty was a builder, but Bunty was now in the army concreting pillboxes and stringing wire on the South Downs for the duration. Bunty's old dad came up some days to take care of the yard, but all he ever did was to sit in the cabin and get the stove going and brew tea. He liked talking to kids because there was no one else to talk to. He let Charles and Sam poke round the yard sometimes, providing they didn't break anything. Bunty's yard had a ten-foot brick wall with jagged glass set in concrete on top. On three sides, that was. The side next to the railway line was just a rotten fence with two loose planks. It was these planks that Charles now pulled out. The bogey and its burden slid through. Where? Into those old sewerage pipes, bottom one in the middle. Won't it get rusty? What do you think I brought these oily rags for? Where'd you get them? Me dad brings them home from work. Me mum uses them to light the fire. The gun slid into its hiding place. Rags were stuffed up each end and sand gently tossed against them. Within ten minutes, plaintive voices could again be heard on the main street shouting, Penny for the guy! As they approached Chaz's house, they saw a black police car standing outside. Ow, said Sam, Scarper! No, said Chaz, let's get it over with. Just remember, if you keep your mouth shut, and I do, no one will ever find that gun till Bundy comes back from the war. Right, said Sam, like a bulldog getting his teeth into a Nazi's shin. Chaz barred straight in, bold as brass. Hey, Dad, Sam and I made three bob with Penny for the guy. His dad was standing by the fire looking pretty mad, not with him, but with the police sergeant sitting on the settee. He had a funny sort of scar on his face. Mr. Little was there as well, looking rather alarming in a captain's uniform. Chaz's dad didn't like policemen. He said they were officious gets who would take the world off you if you let them. And half of them are crooks anyway. Besides, the police car at the door would set the neighbours talking. And that had upset Mrs. McGill, who stood in a corner compulsively wiping her hands on her apron. Anything that upset his wife made Mr. McGill mad. The police sergeant now made things worse for himself. Penny for the guy? That's begging and vagrancy. I could have you up in court for that. Ah, you can take me to court as well for that, said Mr. McGill. I had many a penny for the guy when I was a lad, didn't you, Sergeant? Let's get to business, said Stan Little uncomfortably. You could tell he knew the Sergeant was playing it all wrong. 
You are Charles Harold McGill, said the sergeant in an ominous voice. No, he's Charlie Peace, the burglar, said Dad rudely. Cut the cattle and stop asking daft questions. Please don't tell me how to run my business, said the sergeant. Mr McGill turned and spat in the fire. The spittle hissed and danced on the black shiny grate. Heavens, his dad must be really mad to do that. Charles McGill, have you found any war souvenirs in the last few days? Charles pretended to rack his brains. Uh, only a tail fin. Gave it to Sam here. You got it, Sam? Yeah. Sam fumbled in his pocket and produced it, putting it on the table with a loud clink. The sergeant picked it up and looked at it a long time and put it down again. He's doing that to try and scare us, thought Chaz. Are you sure that's all? Yeah. Quite sure? Yeah. You were down West Churton the morning after that bomber crashed? Yeah. Why are you looking so guilty, lad? Chaz hung his head. Well? I, I tried to pinch a nose cone off an engine. Fatty, um, Constable Hardy chased me. That all? Yeah. Where do you keep your souvenirs? Down the greenhouse. Let's go and see, shall we? They all went down the garden with shaded torches. The rabbits blinked and bolted through their straw in the sudden light. Chaz remembered the bullet magazine in Chinny's hutch and closed his eyes in horror. He was glad it was dark. Let's see them. They all came tumbling out of their roll of sacking. Hmm, said the sergeant. I think these better come along with us. It was a silly thing to say. Chaz suddenly let himself go. But they're mine. I've been collecting them a year. All the kids have got them. The nation needs scrap metal, the sergeant went all pompous. But they're the second best collection in Garmouth. Let the band keep them, sergeant, said Mr McGill, a real edge coming into his voice. Chas could tell Mr Little was turning against the sergeant too. But the sergeant blundered on. His crippled foot was giving him hell. All such things are the property of the crown. Tripe, said Chas's dad. I think you'd better get this young man to bed, sir. He's getting quite hysterical. Just like a bobby. Pinch all a kid's treasures and then blame him for crying. Take him away, please. I'm afraid we're going to have to search your house and the whole garden if need be. Take the band to bed, Maggie, said his father. I'm staying here. You can't trust bobbies. So Charles went to bed, while his father stood like an outraged colossus, watching the police dig up every part of his precious garden dismantle his greenhouse heating system and break three panes of glass. Pity you haven't got anything better to do than ruining good plants and frightening rabbits. The police went at last, frustrated and in a blazing temper. Be sure to let us know if anything turns up, sir. Get lost, said Mr McGill viciously. I'm going to the lawyers about you in the morning. It really was all very lucky. The police never dared open Chinny's hutch. Besides, it was too small to hold a machine gun. What was even luckier was that Mr. McGill never questioned Chaz about the gun himself. He was the only one Chaz could never have deceived. And if anyone ever again mentioned war souvenirs to Chaz, he only stormed on and on about dirty policemen. And who could blame him? As for Stan Little, he walked off to the Home Guard HQ feeling an utter failure. The Home Guard HQ was in Billings Mill, Four hundred years ago, Mr. Billing had built his windmill on the highest hill in Garmouth to catch the best of the wind. By 1940, though, the sails, great wooden drive shaft and cogs had rotted to nothing. All that was left was a blackened shell of stone shaped like a milk bottle, containing only a half-buried millstone, the buzz of flies and the occasional corpse of a cat. Now, thanks to one Sandy Sanderson, it had a corrugated iron roof, new floor, and sandbags everywhere it should have sandbags. There was a lookout post on top, with a telephone, and a huge pair of binoculars salvaged from a wrecked Polish destroyer. Whenever Stan Little felt miserable or a failure, he went for a talk to Sandy. Sandy was more solid even than Billings Mill. He had appeared at the drill hall the day the appeal went out for Home Guard volunteers. Among the blazed schoolboys and pinstripe bank managers, he stood out like the Rock of Gibraltar. He was six foot four, broad as a house, immaculate in the blue uniform of a sergeant of the Coldstream Guards, which smelt strongly of mothballs. Sandy had the air of coming out of mothballs himself. Invalided out of the Guards in 1933 after some nonsense with a machine gun, 
He had spent the last seven years moving from uniform to uniform. He had been a hotel porter, an AA patrolman, a cinema commissionaire, but none of them for long. His voice was too loud, his stare too fierce, his division of the world into gentlemen officers and barrack room scrimshankers too simple. In Civvy Street, all too often, it was the scrimshankers who had the money and power. That first day in the drill hall, Sandy walked in, glared round, and everyone fell silent. His eye fell on Stan, and detected beneath twenty years of schoolmastery shabbiness the bright young subaltern of 1918. He singled Stan out and drove him down the far end of the hall, like a sheepdog picking out the ram from his flock. Then Sandy's mouth caped wide. Company! Chat! Schoolboys and bank managers leapt a foot in the air and stood transfixed. Sandy counted them and strode up to Stan, every step of his hobnail boots as certain as a chime of Big Ben. Eighty-four men correct and accounted for, sir. All Stan could think of to say was, carry on, Sergeant Major. Sandy did. Stan watched aghast as coal miners, accountants and errand boys were arranged in size, numbered from the left, divided into platoons and sections. Sandy had an unerring eye for men. The local doctor was extracted, appointed M.O., and dispatched to join Stan in the invisible officer's mess. First World War corporals were sniffed out, told to get haircuts and pull their socks up, and promoted sergeant. When, half an hour later, the local army commander showed up, it was all over. The senior bank manager, now a Lance Corporal Clark, was writing down the names, religions and next of kin of C platoon. The army commander's face changed from worry to relief. So you've got things under control? Um, yes, said Stan. I envy you your son, Major. Wish I had him. Can't beat the guards. Um, no, said Stan. Well, leave it to it. Cheerio. And so the Garmouth Home Guard was born. Since then, all Stan had done was to make two promotions, at Sandy's suggestion. And Sandy had won a lot of stuff. Winning was Sandy's word. Things the Home Guard needed simply appeared. Sandbags, telephone, binoculars, mugs, white china, wood, and an army van to carry them in. Stan never dared ask where anything came from. When Billings Mill was re-roofed, Sandy moved in. Stan never saw where he slept, but he was always there and always busy, oiling rifles or whitewashing everything with layer upon layer of whitewash. In the middle of all 1940s gloom and despondency, Sandy was simply and profoundly happy. If Hitler came, he would die, as he had lived in uniform. He listened now while Stan poured out his troubles. Then he thought for a long time. Cheer up, sir. Your plan of attack was first rate. Quite obvious that copper mistimed his offensive. Didn't read the enemy's mind correctly, sir. Kids is cunning little beggars, just like new recruits. Can't turn you back a minute with them. But we'll outmanoeuvre them yet, sir. And if we got that gun, I know just the place we could best use it. But it's not ours, sir, Major. We could win it, sir. We could win it. Chapter 6 the next Wednesday evening started quite well. Mr McGill was on the tootle ten shift, so there were only Chaz and his mum for tea. But Cousin Gordon called on leave again, bright in brass and Air Force blue. He was carrying his rifle, because he had to be ready to defend Britain against invasion at any time, and because Aunt Rose said she wouldn't have the great greasy murderous thing round her house while he was out. He was just letting Chaz play with it, with clips of dummy bullets, when the siren went. Get down the shelter, you two, while I put the sausage and chips onto plates. This is one meal hit and is not spoiling. It was nearly as good as a picnic, scrambling down into the Anderson with knives and forks, teapot and plate of dried bread. Charles sat by the shelter door to eat his tea, staring at the garden path. If I was that beetle out there, I might be wiped out at any moment by a piece of shrapnel. But in here, I'm safe. It had all the pleasure of standing dry in a doorway, watching the rain make everything else wet. He thought of the steel and earth above him, and felt deliciously safe eating his chips. He nodded at Cousin Gordon's rifle. Pity he didn't bring home something bigger. Then you and me could have had a go at the bombers when they come. No need, said Cousin Gordon. We like playing the expert. You can shoot down a bomber with a rifle. We're trained for it. You have to aim a hand's breadth in front of them to allow for their speed. But bombers fly too high. 
Don't you believe it? Most bombers fly at 5,000 feet, which is a mile. This thing can kill at a mile. He stroked his rifle. Can the German guns fire that far? Yeah, far further. Their Schmeissers can go right through the trunk of a tree. What's a Schmeisser? Machine gun. Chas finished his chips thoughtfully, impaling five on his fork at once and then ramming the lot into his mouth. How often have I got to tell you, said Mrs. McGill, cut them before you put them in your mouth. Around ten, the all clear went. Nothing had happened but two showers of rain, and long before the end you could hear people standing chatting by their shelter doors. What a waste of time, said Mrs. McGill. I could have done the ironing. Good night, Gordon. Tell your mother I'll call on Friday. Good night. I'd better get back while it's quiet. They heard his boots clink away and sat waiting for another clink of boots up the path and the clicking of a pushed bicycle. Dad. Hello, love, Mrs. McGill kissed her grimy husband on the cheek. Chaz had never seen his father come through the back door without his mother kissing him on the cheek. It must taste awfully sooty and oily. How much soot and oil she must have swallowed since she married him. Here's your supper, nice and hot. Mr. McGill washed his hands but not his face. That came after eating. First things first. He didn't take his grimy boots off either. Mrs. McGill always put a copy of the Daily Express under his chair to save the carpet. Nice having the raid over early for once. I could do with a good night's sleep in my own bed. Don't count your chickens, there's still a yellow alert on. But the old clear went. That's the end of the red alert. The buggers are still hanging about somewhere. I think I'd better get my uniform on. Mr. McGill, foreman at the gasworks, knew such things. But your tea'll be spoiled. Put it back in the oven. Mrs. McGill sniffed and picked up the Daily Express off the floor. Work boots might never be cleaned, but ARP boots were always spotless and shining. Mr. McGill, immaculate now, bury under shoulder strap, sat down again to eat. Next moment, the lights went out. Then the cracks round the drawn blackout curtains lit up with successive streaks of light. Mr. McGill's plate went crash on the floor. Oh, those lovely sausages, screamed his wife. Get down, Hinny. Turn your face from the window. It's one of those sneak raiders. But it wasn't. Chaz, lying face down under the sofa, heard the sound of many engines. Run for it! They ran down the front passage and pulled open the front door. It was like day outside. There were so many parachute flares falling. You could have seen a pin on the crazy paving path to the shelter. The insurance policy, screamed his mother, trying to turn back. His father stopped her bodily and for a moment his parents wrestled like drunks in the front passage. Run for God's sake, panted his father. The moment Chas set foot on the path outside, the bombs began to scream down. Chas thought his legs had stopped working for good. The black hole of the shelter door seemed to get further away instead of nearer. They said you never hear the bomb that hit you. But how could they know? Only the dead knew that, like the girl who had worked in the greengrocers. Chas saw the top half of her body, still obscenely weighing out potatoes. Then he threw himself through the shelter door. He caught his knee on a corner of the bunk and it was agony. Then his mother landed on top of him, knocking him flat, and he heard Dad's boots running as he'd never heard them before. And a crack like thunder, and another, and another, and another, and another. Great thunder boots walking steadily towards them. The next would certainly crush them. But the next never came. Only the sound of bricks falling, like Coleman tipping coal into the cellar and glass breaking and breaking. His father drew down the heavy tarpaulin over the shelter door and his mother lit the little oil lamp with her third trembling match. Then she lit the candle under a plant pot that kept the shelter warm. Did you shut the front door, love? She said to his father. I'm frightened someone will nip in and steal those insurance policies. And where's Mrs. Spaulding and Colin? Chug, 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 chug. The buggers is coming again, shouted Mr. McGill. Where's the guns? Where's the fighters? Above the chugging came a kind of Rhythmic panting, screeching, and a kind of dragging, hopping like a kangaroo in its death throes. It was even more frightening than the chugging, and it came right up to the shelter door. A body fell through. It was Mrs. Spaulding. Is she dead? said Mrs. McGill. No, but she's got her knickers round her ankle, said Mr. McGill. I had to hop all the way, gasped Mrs. Spaulding. I was on the outside, love, and I couldn't finish. The boogers blew the lav door off. And they've hit the wreck cinema as well. Is there a spot of brandy? I pulled the chain, ma'am. It flushed all right. It was Colin with a self-satisfied smirk on his face. 
You'll get the Victoria Cross for that, said Chaz with a wild giggle. Shut up, Charles. Have you got no feelings? Mum turned to Mrs. Spaulding, who had crawled under her bunk and was busy pulling up her knickers. I'm sorry, love. We've got down this shelter so quick I left the brandy in the case behind. I'm worried about the insurance, too. Jack didn't shut the front door. Go back and get them, Jack. But the bombs had begun whining down again. Every time he heard one, Chaz stared hard at the shelter wall. Mr. McGill had painted it white and set tiny bits of cork in the wet paint to absorb condensation. Chaz would start to count inside his head. When the counting reached twenty, he would either be dead or he would see little bits of cork fall off the shelter wall with a shockwave and he knew he had survived. Till the next whistling started. It was a silly, pointless game with no real magic in it, but it stopped you wanting to scream. His grand always said, one only hit you if it had your name on it. He'd seen photographs of RAF blokes chalking names on their bombs. Did the Germans do that too? How would they know his name? Did they have lists of everyone who lived in England? Perhaps the Gestapo had. He must stop thinking like that or he would scream, make a fool of himself like Mrs. Spaulding. Play another game, quick. Yes, there was another game. He was lying in a trench with Sam and carrot juice. The black machine gun was in his hands, leaping, vibrating, spraying out orange fire at the black bombers. And he was hitting them every time. They were blowing up. It was their crews who were screaming now, being blown in half. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, this was a good game. Try as they might, the bombers could not reach him. He got them first, swept them away on the blast of the big black gun, sent them down into hell to burn. Hey, cheer up, son. It might never happen. It was his father's voice, and he was staring at the white, corky wall again. And for the moment, the bombs had stopped. At dawn, they climbed out stiffly. They were surprised to see their house still standing, and the rest of the houses in the square, and the next row beyond the long back gardens quite untouched. Except two were simply gone. The ones on either side were windowless, had slates missing. But two was simply gone. Ronnie Boyce lives there, said Chas. He'd given Ronnie Boyce a bloody nose two days ago. He did live there, said his father. It was over quick. They can never have known what hit them. Fat Ronnie Boyce, with his shiny boots and his mum with asthma. Where was he now? Up in heaven? With a harp and a halo to go with his shiny boots? He hoped God wasn't too rough on him. He was a terrible thief. But probably being blown to bits was enough punishment for being a thief. Charles, lad, said his father, very quiet. I'm going to see if Nana and Grand are all right. Most of the stuff that was dropped fell by the river last night. I want you to come with me. Charles felt his stomach go heavy, as if he'd swallowed a cannonball. Not Nana and Grand are too. He saw in his mind their neat house in Henry Street, with a white wheel for a gate, and the big white seashells in the garden, and the freshly painted flagstaff where his granddad ran at the Union Jack every morning and saluted it. Don't take the band, Jack, said his mother, fingering her apron. He's going, said his father grimly. He's fourteen now, and there might be errands to run, and clearing up to do. He'd better wear his best suit, then. Don't be daft, woman. It's not a funeral yet. You might get it ruined for nought. Come on, son. They walked side by side down the road. Chas felt proud that his father needed him. It was a solemn occasion, a family occasion, an adult occasion. But his hands wouldn't stop shaking. He wondered how it would be. There might be Nana putting the kettle on, and Granda getting his morning coughing over. Everyone would tell bomb stories. Or there might be only a hole in the ground, like Ronnie Boyce's house. The whole world seemed broken in half. Nearby, the same old streets, women gossiping at doors, kids peering over walls. But above the familiar rooftops billowed more smoke than he had ever seen. Oily, black smoke rolling over itself, trailing east to cover the rising sun, so that they walked from sunshine to shadow every minute. It looked like a photo Chaz had seen of Dunkirk. In a way, he liked the smoke clouds. They were exciting. But was Nana's house making that smoke? They turned into Church Lane. Blocked. Big red notices saying, access prohibited and danger. Policemen controlling traffic. 
men pulling crowbars off the backs of lorries, a wriggling mass of white hose pipes connected to hydrants that peed streams of water into the gutters like naughty boys. At the far end of the street, the red brick spire of Holy Saviour's was burning. Flames licked from every window from top to bottom, joining into a smoke column that blew away east. Even the Germans across the North Sea would be smelling the burning this morning and laughing. His father was asking a policeman which streets to the lower town were open. The policeman was shaking his head. Chaz watched the church. God lived there. If even God wasn't safe from Hitler, who was? Why didn't God get Hitler for what he was doing? Why didn't he send a thunderbolt on Berchtesgarten? Wasn't Hitler afraid to do such things to God? Chaz had once spat in a church pew for a laugh and walked in fear and trembling for a week afterwards. Where was God? As he watched, the spire seemed to shimmer in the heat. It was shimmering more and more. It was twisting like an outlaw shot in a western. All that great brick height. It made Chas feel dizzy. Even a hundred yards away, he wanted to run. Great chunks of brickwork fell inwards into the church spire like, like a jigsaw breaking up. The gilded weathercock on top tilted. Firemen were running in all directions. And then slowly, ever so slowly, the spire pounced downwards at the firemen like a leaping red lion. It landed in the street and leapt forward again, with a mane of red brick dust grasping for those running legs. One man fell as it touched him. Two of his comrades picked him up and ran, dragging him without stopping while the red lion still pursued. And then it stopped, and Chas became aware of the rumbling and shouting. A group gathered round the fallen fireman, lifting him so his blackened face stared at the heavens. They forced some stuff from a little brown bottle down his throat, he began to walk about, doubled up, coughing. He's all right, said Mr. McGill. By God, he was lucky. He'll never be luckier. Come on. They walked to the next street. I watched Holy Saviour's being built as a kid, said Mr. McGill. Will they build it again? God knows. But did God know? The next street was empty, normal except for one policeman and a notice saying, unexploded bomb. There was a little hole halfway down the street, surrounded by the kind of red and white barriers workmen use when they lay drain pipes. A cat was sniffing at the little hole. Chas would have been worried about the cat, if he hadn't already been worried about Nana. It'll have to take its chance, that cat, said Mr. McGill. I expect Savile Street will be open, said Chas. It was the most important street in the town, with no less than three toy shops. But Savile Street no longer existed. It was just piles of bricks. The shops were piles of brick, and the roadway was piles of brick. There was a green lorry at the near end marked Heavy Rescue. A grimy man in a white tin hat marked R was sitting on the tailboard with a mug of tea. The mug was white and shiny, but it had black finger marks all over it. How do, Geordie? said his father in a familiar sort of way. Heavens, the man was Uncle George, Cousin Gordon's father. His face was so black he looked like a nigger minstrel. Uncle George grimaced, showing perfect false teeth. By gum, he said. I thought I'd seen it all in the trenches in the last lot, but I've seen out like this morning. There's bits of bairns under that. We'll be three days before we get the last of them out. How many dead? Twenty-seven so far, and three out alive. We had to use our bare hands, brick by brick. They were that frightened the whole lot would come down on top of us. He pulled a sandwich out of a screw of greaseproof paper with those same bare hands and began to eat it. How could he be so heartless? Your family all right, George? Aye. Rosie's gone to her mother's and young Gordon's to his girlfriend's at Monk's Eaton. Heard anything about Henry Street? They had it bad. Taking the young un down, are you? He gave Chaz a look. Take care. He finished off his sandwich and licked his fingers. Rudyard Street's just about open now. Rudyard Street was no worse than what Chaz was used to. Slates off, ceiling down, windows gone. Every second house carried that silly notice, business as usual. The photographer from the Garmouth Evening Gazette was busy. The nearer they approached the corner of Henry Street, the more Chaz's heart sank. Mr. McGill walked faster and faster, like a man going to have a fight. 
His steel heel caps rang louder and louder. Chaz found it harder and harder to breathe. They turned the corner. The wheel gate, the seashells, the flagpole were untouched. The Union Jack still flew. But the roof was a wooden, slateless skeleton, and sky showed through the bedroom windows. We'll knock at the front door, said his dad. Stand beside me, and if I say shut your eyes, you bloody shut them quick, understand? Charles gulped and nodded. Mr. McGill knocked. Nana opened the door in her flowered pinafore. I knew you'd come, and the bairn. Do you see what Hilda and his Germans have done? Her blue eyes were snapping with fury, her brawny arms folded on her large bosom. She always called Hitler Hilter and spoke about him as if he were a personal enemy, a sneaky-minded neighbour who did sneaky things like tipping refuse over your garden fence. If I could get hold of that bloody man, I'd strangle him. He should have been strangled at both, snotty-nosed get. He's really done for your grandar, you know. He was going to brew some tea when it happened. It blew him all the way down the yard and split the back of his top coat from top to bottom. The buggers couldn't kill him at Caporetto in 1918, but they've nigh done from this time. It's a crying shame he's passed it. Twenty years ago he'd have seen the buggers off. Riff raff. What's Hilton more than a house painter when all's said and done? All the time she was talking, Chaz had the absurd fancy that Hitler and the Germans were sitting down to breakfast about two streets away, and that one attack by Nana and her famous rolling pin would settle the war once and for all. Come in if you can get, said Nana. Grandar was sitting in his armchair, warming his hands on a mug of tea. He was wearing furry brown slippers, striped pyjamas, a split overcoat, and a black berry with two highly polished brass badges on it. One was his old regimental badge, a lamb carrying a flag, the other was a German army badge with the worn figure of a charging infantryman and lettering no one could read. Grandar pointed to that badge now. I knew I'd cop it last night. I dreamt he came back for his badge. He was an Austrian soldier whom Grandar had killed in a bayonet fight at Caporetto. Grandar had taken the badge as a trophy and ever since had dreams that the dead man came back and mutely asked for his possession. Grandar had lived in terror of that man for twenty-five years, yet he could never be persuaded to throw the badge away. There was a fire on the hearth, and the huge black kettle on it as usual. It began to boil now, and the lid began to rattle. Grandar's teeth began to chatter, and Nana took the kettle off quickly. That lid always reminds him of the machine guns. But it was too late. Grandar was lost in his old nightmare. His hands did strange things pulled invisible levers, settled together in front of his chest as if he grasped the handles of some weapon. The index finger of his right hand tightened slowly on an invisible trigger as his left eye closed and his right squinted tight. Range? 375, gun cocked, 200 rounds expended, three boxes of ammo in reserve, barrel cold, topped up with water, spare barrel in reserve, half worn out, sir. The family watched. Suddenly he braced himself, shuffling his feet as if groping for a hold. His body tensed like a dog when it sees a rabbit. Then he began to shake all over, as if the invisible gun was leaping almost beyond control. He's badly, said Nana. He hasn't done that for ten years. He thinks they're coming for him. Oh, my God, screamed Grandar. Breach is jammed. Recock, discharge, recock. His hands moved frantically. I'll mix him one of his powders, said Nana. Come and give me a hand, Chaz. They were kept busy at Nana's for the rest of the day. There was no hope for the house. The walls were cracked. Even if the roof could have been put back on, the walls would have collapsed under the weight. The most they could do was rescue all the bits and pieces. The glass paperweight with the view of Boulogne in 1898, the great black Bible with the tarnished clasp, the bamboo table, and pack them up for storage. Grandar dozed in his chair. The Battle of Caporetto fought and lost, his kitchener moustache trailing over his open mouth. It was terribly black inside Grandar's mouth. Chaz was fascinated by it, kept staring at it, trying to see something in the blackness. Had Grandar fought his last battle? Would he die there and then among his bits and pieces? Sometimes his breathing went funny, but it always recovered. Sometimes he moved in his sleep. Chaz was glad to go down to the corner shop for some more cardboard boxes. The corner shop was untouched, just
just fuller than usual. Only once did he allow himself to slip away and look at Grandar's special treasure. In the coal shed, open to the sky now, on a nail in the wall behind the heap coal, hung a helmet. It was thick with rust, and the twisted leather chin strap was hard as iron, but on top was a little bobble of candle grease. In the dugout at Caporetto, Grandar had used the helmet as a candlestick. That was the original candle grease. He had never removed it. At three o'clock, men came with a van for the furniture. It was going, Dad said, to the repository. Charles thought the word had a sinister sound, like mortuary or infirmary, but he didn't say so. At ten past three, a taxi for Nana and Grandar arrived at the end of the road. Nana and Grandar were coming to live at the square. Charles had lost his bedroom. He would sleep on the settee in the front room, with the mysteries of chiming clock, wedding photographs and mothballs. He didn't mind. He was much more interested in that helmet, if no one remembered it. Nana took a last look round her home. Pity about the coal in the coal house, she said. Some trash will steal it, ghouls. You can't put coal into a repository, Hinny, said Mr McGill crossly. He was tired and had a night shift to look forward to. Come on, that taxi's costing money. Come on, Chaz. Can I walk home? I want to see what's happened at the church. His dad glanced at his watch. Two full hours to bomber time, he nodded. See you don't go near that unexploded bomb and be home by five. Yes, Dad. The taxi drew away, leaving the house to looters and to chats. The Union Jack still flew. He took it down, took it to the coal house and wrapped his new treasure in it. Then he bounced along to Bunty's yard, skipping and mouthing Grandar's remembered words. Range 375, cocked, 200 rounds expended. The Germans were about to face a new McGill with a new machine gun. You're mad, said Sem. No, I'm not. We've got Clogger now, said Chaz. Even with Clogger, you're mad. There's usually ten of them. Ah, oh, tripe, said Clogger. He never said much of anything except I or no or och tripe, even to masters. He was very silent and very hard. He was the junior team scrum half. They'd once played a whole match after losing two front teeth spitting blood thoughtfully before putting the ball in the scrum and scoring two tries. He was down from Scotland to stay with his auntie for the duration, because his mum was dead and his father in the Navy. If he'd wanted to throw his weight about, he could have been the boss a terror, but he was content to trail around after Chaz because he liked his stupid jokes and had actually been seen to smile at them twice. He had ginger hair and freckles and always spat on his hands before he started any job, even a maths exercise. He knew about the gun, but he was safe. He never told anybody anything, even the time from his watch. Look, said Chaz, Sicky Nicky has something we need. We've got to make it worth his while. Why do we have to build our camp in his garden? Because it's in the right place, and because nobody ever goes there anymore. Where else do you know that's private? Sem shrugged. He was beaten there. Right, so what do we offer Nicky? What does he need? All right, so we walk home with him, and Bodser will kick your head in. We'll see. They were packing their school bags to go home. Across the classroom, alone as always, Nicky was packing his neat books, expensive drawing instruments, into an expensive bag, nearly new, but all scuffed, mauled. Nicky's time of ordeal had come. He looked pale, was already starting to pant, Outside, the wolf pack was gathering, waiting to pull his bag from his hand, strew his books over the pavement, kick him when he bent down to pick them up, pour gravel down his shirt, pull his shoes off and throw them over walls. Not till Nicky was reduced to screaming blind hysterics would he be allowed to creep home weeping. Every night it happened, regular as clockwork. The wolf pack never tired of it. Mornings they didn't bother. They were sleepy or had homework worries or were late, but the end of the day was always rounded off by an hour of torture. Charles looked at Nicky. The face was good-looking, with a pale girl's good looks. The hair was curly and kept long. He had an operation scar on the side of his neck, but did that explain the constant bullying? Every kid had some peculiarity, was fat or thin or had big ears. Charles got twitted because he had thick lips and a funny fold of skin on the back of his neck. So why was Nicky singled out? 
Chaz wondered how he himself felt about Nicky. He'd never touched him, but constantly teased him. Why? Chaz shrugged. That wasn't the job in hand. The job was to see that for once Nicky got home unscathed, but not too painlessly. That would look suspicious. Nicky sighed, closed his desk, and walked to the classroom door. Chaz, Sam and Clogger closed in round him. Good evening, Nickers, my dear chap, started Chaz. How seems the world to you today? Nicky looked frightened and hopeful at the same time. Anything was better than the wolf pack. They walked downstairs and into the yard, making remarks about Nicky's puny muscles, asking him how many times a day he went to the toilet and whether he wiped his bottom with his left hand or his right. Nicky blushed, but it wasn't as bad as being hit with school bags. The wolf gang was waiting just beyond the school gate. Nine of them, including pack leader Bodzer Brown. Chaz kept up his flow of rudenesses, but watched Bodzer out of the corner of his eye. Bodzer was looking worried. He didn't like anything unusual. Get away, McGill. He's ours, said Bodzer. I beg your pardon, almighty one, O star of the east, O moon of my delight. Your beauty is dazzling, especially your haircut, four eyes. There was a titter, even among the wolf pack. Bodzer reddened. He looked uneasily at Clogger. He didn't like the new confidence in Chaz's voice. Get away, McGill. I'm warning you. I've got no quarrel with you, for now. Oh, thank you, thank you, worshipful lord, said Chaz, making low salams. May Allah bless your luscious toenails. The smaller group moved past the larger one. So far, so good. They went on down Hawkey's Lane, not hurrying. Hurrying would be fatal. The wolf gang looked at Bodzer. Already their victim was past any previous torture place, getting nearer the main road where adults might interfere. Pull him out, said Bodzer to two of his minions. The minions dived for Nicky, who was between Chaz and Sam. Clogger moved like grease lightning. His steel toe cap caught the first minion on the knee, leaving him writhing in the gutter. His fist caught the second full on the nose, drawing a satisfying stream of blood. The wolf gang drew back and looked pointedly at Bodzer. It was up to him now and the main road full of people who might telephone the school was only forty yards away. Get past them, shouted Bodzer. The wolf gang streamed past, well clear of Clogger's boots, and blocked the end of the lane, solid. Told you so, said Sam ruefully. Bloody fool, Chaz. But he doubled his fists. He was loyal. Bodzer stepped out in front. Right, McGill. You've asked for this. His bluster was gone. He had made up his mind as a man might decide to nail up a fence he'd watched sagging all winter. Chaz had made Bodzer's dignity sag a bit lately. Now it was to be mended with Chaz's blood. Bodzer didn't even sound cruel or gloating, as he did when he tortured Nicky, just determined. The time for talk, Chaz decided, was over. It was time for action. But what? Chaz was quick and not soft. But no one he knew could stand up long to the pounding of Bodzer's fists, except perhaps Clogger. And it wasn't Clogger's fight. He could dive head down for Bodzer's midriff, slide down and pinion Bodzer's legs and hope to push him over. But that would end inevitably with Bodzer sitting on his chest, banging his head against the pavement. Bodzer took off his gas mask haversack, then his school bag, his school raincoat, his blazer. He rolled up his sleeves slowly one after the other. Chaz could think of nothing but to do likewise. He took off his gas mask case. It was not like Bodzer's. It was a circular tin, twice the size of a large tin of beans and nearly as heavy. It swung from a long, thin leather strap. And then the idea came to Chaz. It set him aghast. But it was maim or be maimed now. He put the case down carefully and took off his school bag and coat and blazer laying them in the fine gravel of the gutter. He came up with his fists clenched ready. Bodzer advanced without hurry. Take your specks off, shouted Chaz. I don't want your mum complaining to me, Dad, if I break them. Playing for time, McGill, jeered Bodzer. That won't save you. But he took off his spectacles and handed them to a minion and advanced again. Chaz saw the first blow coming and ducked it. Then he swung his right fist wildly, a yard from Bodzer's face, and opened his hand. Fine gravel sprayed into Bodzer's eyes. There was no need for the second handful. 
The huge, menacing figure was suddenly crouched up, helpless, tears streaming down his face. Calmly, full of murder, Chas picked up his gas mask case and swung it. It hit the side of Bodza's head with a sound like a splitting pumpkin. Bodza screamed but did not fall. Chaz swung at him again. The gas mask case dented dramatically. Botzer crashed into the corrugated iron fence. Chaz raised his tin a third time. All the hate of all the years infant school, junior school, boiled up in him. It was as well that Sem snatched the gas mask from his hand. You're bloody mad! Stop it! Stop it! Sem yelled. Chaz snatched for his weapon again. Clogger kicked it away and held Chaz's arms behind his back. Then everyone watched Bodzer aghast as he reeled about, blood spurting from both hands held across his face. Then the wolf gang turned and fled. It was Clogger who approached the moaning lump, pulled the hands away and looked. A two-inch flap of forehead hung loose. Shut your wheel in, man, you lev, he said to Bodzer. Stop going on like a wee bairn, he turned to the group. We'd better be getting him to the hospital. Fortunately, he was only 200 yards away. A stiff, starch sister took over. How did this happen? She said, like a high court judge. I hit him, said Chaz. What with? Me gas mask. You're a wicked, vicious boy, said the sister. I shall ring up your headmaster personally. You grammar school boys should know better. You might have killed him. He was bigger than me. That's no excuse. British boys fight with their fists. Chaz felt like a criminal. British boys fight with their fists, said Chaz's dad, and went off to mend the greenhouse. He didn't speak to Chaz for two whole days, and neither did his mother, even all through the air raid. Britishers do not use weapons, they fight only with their fists, said the headmaster, flexing his cane. Bend over, boy. It was six of the best, and very painful. The class treated him with awestruck and horrified silence. It was their opinion that Bodzer had asked for it. But Chaz shouldn't have done it. But what do you do if you're small? asked Chaz hopelessly. Nobody answered. They got on with their classwork. The neighbours said Chaz was a wicked boy who would come to an evil end, mark their words. It was all very trying. Chaz felt imprisoned in a glass bubble. No one would talk to him but Audrey. So it was Chaz, Nicky and Audrey who started the whole thing off one night after school. Look, there's Bodser, said Audrey. Both Nicky and Chaz jumped for their different reasons. But Bodser was only getting on a bus to go home with his mum, his head still completely encased in a spotless white bandage that was changed every night. The school was beginning to call him the Sheik of Araby because it looked like a turban. Botzer had come down in the world since the fight. For a start, his mother kept him off school a whole week and then began calling at school for him every day at four o'clock in case the big rough boys got him again. She went on and on to everyone who would listen about the amount of bullying that went on at Garmouth High School. But one or two people had told her a few home truths about her darling's arm twisting, so it was doubtful if even she knew herself whether she was guarding Botzer from the world or the world from Botzer. But even discounting his mother's goings-on, Botzer was a flop. His gang didn't want to know him any more. They had been a disaster, and they wanted a new leader. Besides, now he knew what the other side of pain was like, he was uncertain of himself. He put out his tongue at Chaz as the bus swept past and fell to dreaming of future revenge. Sit up, you great hulk, said his mother, poking him in the ribs with her elbow, and wipe your nose. Chaz, Audrey and Nicky reached Nicky's gate and hung around, unwilling to break up. They were all outcasts now. Like to see my goldfish? asked Nicky. It's six inches long. Get off, said Chaz. They always die when they get too big for the jam jar. Tisn't in a jam jar. He's got a pond all to himself. He's four years old. And my pet rabbit's ninety-four, retorted Chaz, but without much heat. He was nosy so he let himself be led in. They passed the lodge at the entrance, with its windows boarded up and people's names chalked on the door. That's where Gray and the gardener lives, said Nicky, 
but he's gone to Birmingham to work on munitions. The drive zigzagged through thick, damp rhododendrons and ended up nearly where it started. There was a great white front door like a Greek temple, but the paint was peeling off it. A sailor sat on the steps cleaning his boots. They stared at him, but he just said, Faff off, without looking up. We've got ratings billeted on us, said Nicky. Come round to the kitchen. Might be something to eat. They went in. There was something to eat. A loaf still warm and a seven-pound tin of butter opened and left lying like a tin of cheap peas. Nicky carved great lumps off the loaf. It bent like a concertina and stayed bent. Chaz stabbed into the deep well of butter. You could have got lost in it. Chaz had never seen so much butter in one place since the war. Where'd you get it? Oh, it comes off the destroyers. Everything comes off the destroyers. Nicky kicked at a mass of empty gin bottles that lay stacked under the kitchen sink. Chaz thought his mum wouldn't have liked that much. All the plates of cold egg and bacon in the sink with the cold water dripping on them. Or the half glass of something brown with a dead fly in it. He suddenly felt sorry for Nicky. Money wasn't everything. What does your mum do? Not much since my father got killed. Nicky's father had been a ship's captain. Before the war, Chaz had often seen his ship steam in with its great white hull and yellow funnels. Captain Nickel had always dressed in spotless white, too, with yellow braid on his shoulders. Every time he came home, he gave parties and garden parties, and Mrs. McGill said that people who got invited really thought they were somebody. Then in January 1940, the Cyclades was hit by a German torpedo off Gibraltar, even though she was camouflaged with grey stripes, and smiling, handsome Captain Nickel vanished beneath the waves forever, and his photograph never appeared in the local paper again. Have some more, said Nicky, pointing at the bread. Ta, said Chaz. What are you doing, Benjamin? The new voice was haughty, but rather wobbly. A tall, thin woman was standing in the doorway with a glass in her hand. Chaz thought she looked like a film star gone wrong. She was still wearing her dressing gown, though it was past four o'clock. There were stains down the front. It could have been tea or marmalade. What are you doing? Who are these children? Mrs. Nicholl let go of the doorpost to come into the room, staggered and changed her mind. Her dressing gown was falling open, and Chaz thought she wasn't wearing much. He felt all queer. Fiona, what are you doing? Another voice, a man's, came from the room behind Mrs. Nicholl. That's the chap in charge of the ratings, muttered Nicky. He lives here too. Mind you behave yourself, Benjamin said Mrs. Nicholl vaguely, and drifted away. There was a long silence in the kitchen. Let's go and see the goldfish, said Audrey abruptly. They went down the long back garden. It was full of interesting things, walls and steps and statues, and queer marble pots on stands. Charles wondered if those were the pots where Mrs. Nicholl kept her money. His mum always said the Nicholls had pots of money. But Ivy was growing over everything. They peered into the green depths of a large pool and were rewarded by a flash of red gold all of six inches long. Nicky sprinkled breadcrumbs under the thick green water and the fish rose, mouthing silently. There used to be twelve of them, said Nicky. My father imported them from China, but this is the only one left. He's called Oscar. Hello, Oscar, said Audrey softly. He only speaks Chinese, said Chaz. What's at the bottom of the garden? There was a huge rockery, all overgrown with ivy too, and the gravestones of cats and dogs. Nicky knew all their names and talked about them as if they were still alive. The last wooden cross had no name on it. What's that one? asked Chaz. That's for my father, said Nicky, and the other two looked away. What's over the fence? said Chaz at last, stammering. He climbed to the top of the rockery and peered over. And there it was. The view down to the bay and the sea. Exactly the way any Germans would come. I vote we make a secret camp here, in the rockery, he said. Oh, yes, please, said Audrey. Nicky nodded after a moment. They were his only friends, and he wanted to keep them. Where you been? asked his mother. Nicholas' house. You what? 
I've been to Benny Nichols' house. He's got a goldfish six inches long in a pool. Mr McGill set down the newspaper with its glaring headline, Invasion Imminent, and took off his reading spectacles. What you been up to now? Chaz's voice went up to a screech of righteous indignation. Nothing! I was walking home with him when he said he'd got this fish, and I said he hadn't. You're not to go there again, and you're not to play with that nickel boy again. Why not? Never mind why not, because I damn well say not. Look, tell me why. You almost tell me why I can't do things. His father looked at his mother, and his mother at his father. They both seemed acutely embarrassed. We can't tell you. You're too young to understand. But it's a marvellous place to play. Sensing their embarrassment, Chaz pressed on unmercifully. You can play anywhere else if you like, but not at the Nichols house, and that's final. Mr McGill vanished again behind the Daily Express. Mrs McGill went on with her ironing. Chaz knew a brick wall when he saw one. But he also had a taste for getting round brick walls. Nicky's house had suddenly become the most desirable place on earth. Oh, damn, said Audrey. I've split another fingernail. She sucked and bit her nail meditatively, looking up at the sky. It was a fine sunset for December, with the rim of sun just showing over the trees to the west. I'll go and get some lemonade, said Nicky. They watched him running and ducking towards the house, keeping out of sight of the sitting room where his mother was, with the officer. He's not a bad kid when you get to know him, said Chaz. My mother doesn't like him, said Audrey. She's told me not to come here. Mine too, Chaz scuffed his foot. What's everyone got against the poor kid? I think it's because his mother drinks. So does my granddad, but everybody likes him. Well, it's, you know, sailors, Audrey blushed. Chaz blushed. The barrage balloons are high tonight. Must be going to be a raid. Go on, they only send them up that high to test their cables. They both looked up at the barrage balloons. There were five round the mouth of the river, each known to the locals by an affectionate nickname. There was the South Shield Sausage and the Willington Windbag. The nearest one was called the Fish Key Buster. Their raising and lowering by RAF men sweating at winches was a regular treat for crowds of children nearly as good as going to the cinema. For the adults, they were a kind of air raid barometer, except that no one really knew what their raising and lowering meant. At this time of night, the last of the sunlight caught them, long after the rest of the earth was dark. When they were very high, they glowed so small and bright it was impossible to tell them from the first stars. But they were not that high tonight. You could see their silver sides and fat fins. They looked like flabby silver elephants nosing this way and that in the light breeze. And then, and then, Chas gasped. Black on the blue dusk from the east it came. Black, twin-engined, propellers idling like fans, soundlessly gliding slow and low. A German aircraft. A moan broke from Chas's lips, not of fear but frustration. A gun! but it was a mile away in Bunty's yard. The plane drew nearer, lower. A faint sighing came from it, a whistling of strings and wires like a kite. It was a fighter with four cannon in the nose. The fighter wobbled, the nose veered, and the tiny black cannon mouths pointed straight at Chaz. A face without goggles looked down at him from the cockpit, from rooftop height and only a football pitch away. Get down, screamed Audrey. What's happening, said Nicky, and dropped a whole tray of lemonade on the remains of the rockery. But Chas stood, glaring at the pilot of the fighter. He was a Britisher. He didn't jump into holes like a rabbit for no German, even if he had four cannon. The German would laugh if he did, feel powerful. Nazi pig! He stuck up two fingers in the air, and not Churchill's way either. The pilot laughed. The plane filled the sky, and then there was an ear-splitting roar, and the air was full of black, oily smoke. I'm dead, thought Chaz. I'm dead, and I didn't feel a thing. Then he started coughing, and his eyes started streaming. I'm in hell, said Chaz. He wasn't very surprised. But it seemed Audrey and Nicky were in hell too, for there they were, lying at his feet, coughing as well, and the smoke was thinning, and there was the fence, and... 
The plane was nowhere to be seen. You fool, said Audrey. He started up his engines. There he is. A black shape was streaking up the river. The odd gun was firing now from the ships. Black roses blossomed round the plain, above, behind, never on target. Go on! Get him! screamed Chaz. But the pilot was in a playful mood. He turned and looped and spun his wings like a boy showing off by riding a bicycle with no hands. By that time, every gun had joined in. Traces from the pom-poms on the bank top grew like red-hot stitches on the blue surge of the sky. But they were so slow, all was too slow to catch the German. And then he was climbing, headed straight for the South Shields barrage balloon. The sound of his cannon fire came, thin as a zip fastener, and a yellow rose grew among the black. The balloon was burning, falling, silver turning black, dropping off like the paper on a French cigarette. Get that nazi swine, yelled Chaz, jumping up and down. Are you blind? Get your eyes chalked. Men shouted that to the ref at football matches. The fighter performed a beautiful half loop, rolled over at the top of it, and made for the Wellington Key wind bag, which was being winched down as quickly as its frantic crew could turn the handles. The Akak gunners intensified their efforts. Oh, God, screamed Chaz. You couldn't hit a drunk in Guthrie's bar of a Saturday night. This was a phrase of his grandfather's that his mother didn't like. It was at that moment that an over-enthusiastic anti-aircraft team scored a hit on the Wellington windbag. It made a lovely bang that turned the fighter over on its back. Oh, no! Chas beat a tree in agony. Where are those spitfires from Acklington? The German recovered and made straight at them. What? Chaz glanced up. The fish key buster, on its way down, was right overhead. Get down! Audrey pulled him into the camp they had dug, a shallow pit three feet deep, with a wall of rocks a foot high around it. A weak, striving, blisters, broken fingernails, and it felt pathetic now. The guns were following the fighter. The flashes were terrible. The shrapnel fell like black rain. Chaz threw himself across Audrey protectively. It was a man's duty. Then the plane's cannons fired. The air stank with cordite. Shell fragments slashed through the trees and privet of Mrs. Nichols' garden. With a roar, the fish key buster exploded. The stones of the rockery glowed brighter than day, and the burning balloon was falling right on them. They huddled together in a final terror, pressed tight like kittens. Then there was a rustling, a last roar of engines dwindling. They got up. The trees above them were full of silver, draped in festoons like a tent roof. It was the remains of the buster. It looked very large, and they were awed. Then reality reasserted itself. Quick, grab some down. That stuff's waterproof. We'll need some for the camp. As Chaz climbed and hacked at it, the air raid warning sounded, and three very angry spitfires hurtled overhead. You could almost hear the pilots gnashing their teeth above the whine of their superchargers. They hid great pieces of the fish key buster in a disused potting shed. Good stuff, that, said Chaz. Waterproof. It'll roof in the fortress lovely. What fortress? asked Audrey. Chaz pointed to the hole in the rockery. That will be our fortress. But it's hopeless, said Audrey. We've worked for a week, and it's only a little hole. We need more help. It's time we buried our differences. Not with Bod, sir, said Nicky nervously. No, Sam and Clogger. We must work together for the common good. Pompous ass, said Audrey under her breath, but not so she could be heard. She was tired of digging in the rockery. Hey, Clogger, whispered Bod, sir. Want to join my gang? Show you some dirty postcards my uncle got in port side. Up, oh, tripe said Clogger, and walked away. Botzer didn't follow him. Hey, Sam, whispered Botzer. Want to see me uncle's postcards from Egypt? Sam, who was rather attached to camels and pyramids, said yes. Botzer passed across a grubby pack of nude men and women in peculiar positions. Sam looked first incredulous, then embarrassed. Don't like that fellow's moustache, he said, after thought. Bodsa changed tack. Glad you've broken off with that McGill. 
Would you like to come round one night and play with me railway? Potts's railway was much more highly thought of than his uncle's postcards, being British. I might, said Sam, flattered. Then Botser, over-eager, made his mistake. McGill's got that German machine gun, hasn't he? A look of disgust crossed Sam's face. Yeah, and two Matilda tanks behind his rabbit hutch and a smelly pair of Hitler's underpants in his handkerchief drawer. Botser retired in a deeply hurt silence to his French exercise. His back had the look of a hard-done-by man. They'd all been hoping it would happen. But when it did, they were surprised. Charles and Sam were walking to school in the gloom of a December morning. As Garmouth High came into view, Sam gave his great guffaw. Coo-hoo-hoo! Look at the new chimney! Charles, who had been carefully kicking a bobble jar along the gutter, glanced up. A long, thin aircraft tail was sticking up out of the school roof. Dawny a D.O. 17, said Charles automatically. Gone. It's a Yonkers 88. Tisn't. Tis. Just look at those tail fins. Sam pulled his aircraft recognition book out of his pocket. But the picture of the Yonkers 88 had been worn away by long contact with conkers and toffees. Hey, there's Stan Little. Let's ask him. Hello, McGill. After another machine gun? Charles let his mouth fall open in innocent amazement. What do you mean, sir? Skip it. What is it, sir? Chaz pointed at the long, thin tail. I'll tell you what it is. It's an early start to the Christmas holiday as far as you're concerned. No school, sir. It hasn't made a very big hole. No, but its petrol tanks burst. The school's full of fumes. One accidental spark and up it goes. Aren't we going to another school, sir? No room. Churton Junior copped it last night and Priory inference was flattened. They hung around. The others joined them and there was the usual bomb gossip. A baby got born in our shelter last night, said Audrey, big-eyed. Congratulations, dear, what are you going to call it? I didn't know you was expecting. Audrey blushed to everyone's satisfaction. Me dad's busy, said Sam. Some of the pensioners are dying in the shelters. Bronchitis with the damp. Everyone was reluctant to go home. It wasn't that they liked school, but it left a gap in their lives. Let's go and work on the fortress, suggested Charles hopefully but everybody just groaned. Two mornings later, they were in Nicky's garden. With school gone, what else was there to do? Where's Chas? He said he wouldn't be long, said Sam. He's got a new idea for making the fortress. But it's like the old idea, shifting rocks. Here we are, then, said Chas triumphantly from behind them. They turned and drew back in a shocked huddle. There was an adult with Chas. A very large adult indeed, a man of about forty, strong and pot-bellied. They all knew him. He looked like a photograph of somebody's granddad taken forty years ago. Blonde hair clipped in the Prussian style and a big bushy kitchen and moustache. He wore an old-fashioned suit with waistcoat watch and chain, polished boots and a stiff collar. A perfect Victorian alderman, prosperous and proud. You fool, Chaz, said Clogger. Now you've blown it. No, I've not. You know John Simple. He doesn't understand a word you say. He's just like an elephant, only not so bright, but feel his muscles. Clogger stepped forward and felt the bulging muscles. John smiled cherubically and said, Where are you going now? That's all he ever says, where are you going now? Otherwise he just grunts. How do you get him to follow you? He always helps the milkman give out his bottles. So I got an old milk bottle and waved it at him, and he came. Won't he be missed? He lives with his mother, and she works all day. What use will he be if he can't understand what you say? He'll imitate what you do. Just try him. Clogger turned to the biggest rock in the rockery, a rock that had already broken two spades, and defied them for a week. He tugged at it futilely. John bent down and grunted, and the rock tore from its earthy bed. Here, John, here, cried Chas, pointing at the place in the parapet where the rock was meant to go. John put it down exactly. Gosh, said Sam, his face lighting up. He is as strong as an elephant. I just hope he never runs a muck. Mr McGill was tireder than any man should ever be. 
the warden's post had vanished under a direct hit, and the full-time sector leader and his three phones with it. Mr McGill was now sector leader, with one phone in the front of a boarded-up windowless house. In between he kept the gasworks together, with tin cans and bent wire. Charles hardly saw his father. The moment Mr McGill sat down, he simply fell asleep, even wearing his tin helmet. Often Mrs McGill would hurry to the kitchen to fetch his hot meal, only to return to find him face down on the tablecloth, snoring. Then she would hover piteously with a laden plate in her hands, wondering whether to wake him. Which did he need more, food or sleep? Chaz got used to a sleeping father in the room. He listened to Itmar on the radio, did extra French homework to the sound of gentle snores. Mr McGill gently stank. The last three times he had tried to bath, the siren had gone as he was undressing. Mrs McGill was terrified he would be injured or killed wearing dirty underpants. What shame it would bring on the family. I don't think you mind me getting killed, Hinny, if me pants was clean. Mrs McGill was busy too. Grandad had taken bronchitis badly, and his cough dominated the house. When she wasn't nursing, she was walking miles from shop to shop, wheedling things out from under shopkeepers' counters. The odd bit of sausage, ten cigarettes here and ten cigarettes there. Neither insults nor stony silence deterred her desperate attempts to charm. Things were not easy between her and Nana. There were low mutterings about two women don't fit in one kitchen. So although Mr McGill sometimes stirred from his heavy slumbers to ask how the bairn was, or where he was, or what he was doing, nobody bothered much. Charles was in one piece, clean and cheerful, and came home promptly for meals. That was enough. It was quieter and easier for everyone when he was out of the house. Sam's sister had a boyfriend home on leave. Andrew Morgan had a brand new subaltern's pip and 24 hours left in England before a darkened troop ship carried him off God knew where for God knew how long. It was Saturday night and for once a fire was lit in the Jones's front room. Sam Senior and his missus had tactfully gone to the National Savings Whist Drive. Andy had his tie unloosened, a glass of beer in one hand, and the waist of the delectable Miss Jones in the other. The only fly in the ointment was Sem Junior, who was sitting on the hearthrug building towers of wooden blocks and knocking them down again. He hadn't played with the blocks for years. It was very irritating. Haven't you got any homework to do? No school, so no homework. Why don't you go and listen to the kitchen radio? Ah, there's only a stupid play on. All love and kissing. Yuck! Sam kicked a block so hard it hit his sister on her silken shin. Cyril, you've ladded them and they're my last pair. Miss Jones forgot her party manners enough to aim a clout at her brother's head. Steady, said Andrew nervously. This could be his last chance to kiss a girl, perhaps forever. Miss Jones remembered herself. Why don't you just go off somewhere else? Course this is the only warm room in the house. I'm not going out in the cold, so you two can... Anyway, Mum said I didn't have to. Andrew reached in his pocket for half a crown. Fancy the pictures? Nothing on but love films, said Sam. His sister sniffed furiously. Isn't there anything you want to do? Yeah, sit here with me blocks. Course, I could go to me bedroom and use these blocks to build a machine gun emplacement for me model army. If only somebody would show me how. Andy sighed. He knew all about the designing of emplacements, being newly commissioned in the Durham Light Infantry. But that pamphlet had been marked secret. He hesitated. Miss Jones heaved her splendid bosom in indignation, and that decided Andy. Drawing a child a gun emplacement couldn't possibly harm the war effort. He reached for Sam's French exercise book, temptingly laid near at hand with a sharpened pencil on top. Mind you make it absolutely authentic, said Sem savagely. Yes, Constable Hardy, said the police sergeant with a scarred face wearily. Who wasn't weary? It's a strange bit of nicking on my patch, Sarge. It don't make sense. Well? Somebody's pinching sandbags, Sarge. 
the ones we tie to the lamppost for use against incendiary bombs. Somebody's emptying out the sand and taking them away. But they're the ones dogs pee on. They're so smelly, people won't even use them against incendiary bombs. That's the point, Sarge, said Fatty Hardy triumphantly. No person in their right mind would pinch them. That leaves only one conclusion. It's the work of enemy agents. I wonder they don't just slash them, though. The sergeant leapt up, ignoring his crippled foot, pulled a lock of black hair over his right eye, stuck an ink rubber under his nose and gave the Nazi salute. To hands, dear ripper, an iron cross first class for demolishing von hundred and fifty Britisher pig sandbags. Heil Hitler! He collapsed into his chair, laughing hysterically. Fatty looked round nervously for the first aid kit. Thank you, Hardy. That's the first good laugh I've had in weeks. Darling, said Mrs Nicholl. She was standing staring out of the bedroom window in a negligee, looking wistful and smoking a cigarette. Yeah? Commander Horsfall was lying on the bed, scratching his head. Someone's stolen our air raid shelter. Go on. I threw an empty fag packet into it this morning. Not that one. That's the one for the family. There was a much bigger one in the shrubbery for the servants. Then they all got directed to war work, so it was never used. What's the problem, then? Well, it's the principle of the thing. I mean, it was ours, even if we never used it. People seem to think they can do what they like with other people's property these days. Everyone's gone so immoral. And all they do is blame it on the war. Come back to bed. I'm on duty in half an hour. But I want to know where it's gone. Sir? Yes, Petty Officer? Commander Horsfall paused on the house steps. The Petty Officer was the man Audrey and Charles had seen cleaning his boots there the first day. Uh, there's some thieving going on, sir. That from you, Petty Officer Robinson, is pretty rich. You mean someone's been thieving from you for a change? Yes, sir. What's missing? Three tin hats, two fire buckets, one notice board, one stove, paraffin, eating, and one pump stirrup. Hardly the black market gang's line, are they, Petty Officer? Now, seven pound tins of butter. Robinson had the grace to blush. Reckon it's that kid, sir. Hers. Sly little devil. Horsfall frowned. The last thing he wanted was trouble with that kid. Oh, we don't want no bother, sir, do we? Far too snug we are here, sir. Horsfall nodded. Make out a requisition for new ones. Say the old ones fell overboard, I'll sign it. I'll help you with that concrete in, Dad, said Chance. It was a bright Sunday morning after a bombless night, and Mr McGill felt like doing a bit in the garden. But he still looked up suspiciously. Help me? You feeling all right? What's the matter? All your little friends gone to church? No, said Chaz, at his most innocent. I just felt like helping. I want to see how you do it. Well, said Mr McGill, you won't see much. Some thieving gets pinched off me cement. You wouldn't know anything about that. No, Dad, said Chaz. Chapter 7 It was Christmas Eve and getting dark, with quick flurries of snow on the east wind. Chaz and Clogger were in the crow's nest. Chaz was wearing his suede jerkin and a bright red steel helmet marked Caporetto in fairly neat white lettering. Clogger was wearing his Boy Scout uniform and another bright red helmet also marked Caporetto. Chaz was very uncomfortable. The wind made his eyes water and the iron-hard chin strap of the old helmet was cutting into his chin. The crow's nest was well made of Royal Navy packing cases and perched in the highest tree. It had a roof of fish key buster that rippled like thunder in the wind. Clogger swept the horizon again with the great brass telescope that had belonged to Captain Nicholl. Nothing in sight, sir. You'll no come tonight. Visibility's down to a hundred yards and my auntie'll be mad if I'm not home for my tea soon. OK. Stand down, petty officer. They climbed stiffly down the rope ladder, manhandling the telescope between them and wriggled into Fortress Caporetto. It was great in the fortress. 
The quartermaster cook had the kettle nearly boiling on the paraffin heater, and the long Anderson shelter was as warm as toast. You could make toast on the paraffin heater if you were patient enough. It took half an hour, and it was hard to tell if the dark patches were toasting or soot, but it tasted hot and fine, spread with plenty of butter from the seven-pound tin. Clogger said the tin of butter would keep for ages in this cold weather. Sergeant Jones, Private Nickel, and Corporal Carstairs, otherwise known as Carrot Juice, lounged on the pink spring mattresses that covered the bunks, staring at the candle flames and waiting for their brew, as content as cats. There was nowhere as safe as Fortress Caporetto in the whole of Garmouth. Above the thin steel of the Anderson's arched roof were three solid feet of earth and rockery, concreted together here and there. It would have withstood anything but a direct hit from the Bismarck. An old patchwork quilt kept draughts from the door. Beyond lay the machine gun emplacement, walled with pongy sandbags and floored with a framework of boards. Chaz's heart glowed with pride. All done in a fortnight and as dry as a bone, thanks to the fish key buster. And the quartermaster, she kept it so neat with rows of shining white mugs, red fire buckets brimming with sand, red helmets hanging on the wall, and a notice board marked Fortress Caporetto, Standing Orders. Chas was not quite sure what standing orders were, so they were read out twice a day, with everybody standing up respectfully. 1. Anyone who steals food from the fortress, if found guilty by court-martial, shall be thrown into the goldfish pond. They may take off any clothes they want to first, but keep it decent. 2. Anyone touching the gun without permission will be chucked out of the fortress for three months. Anyone who speaks to Bods of Brown for any reason will be chucked out for good. 3. Anyone lying on the bunks will tidy up afterwards. 4. No peeing within 50 yards, or anything else. 5. Always come in by the back fence after making sure you're not followed. 6. No stealing from shops without permission. All goods stolen belong to the fortress. 7. Only sentries will touch the air rifle. Hand back all pellets out of your pockets, etc., when coming off duty. 8. Do not mess about with catapults inside the fortress, or you will wash up for four days. 9. Do not mess about at all. 10. Penalty for splitting to parents, teachers, etc., is death. 11. Do not waste anything. 12. Anyone who brings in useless old junk will take it back to the tip where they got it. 13. Quartermaster gives out all the eats. Don't argue with her. After the orders had been read out, everyone bent and swore to keep them with their hands on the machine gun. John sat in the seat of honour, the only armchair. He was always given the first cup of tea and the first piece of toast. After all, it was John who had made it all possible. Chaz's scheme had worked very well. John had come willingly, enjoying the chains from milk bottles. And he was a good imitator. You didn't have to show him any job twice. It was just that he was so very strong. Sometimes, when he got an idea wrong, he was impossible to stop. Once he carried a great section of Anderson shelter right past the windows of Mrs Nichols' bedroom. But somehow she hadn't heard or looked, and the whole gang, heaving and straining, had pulled John back on course. But that had been the early days. Now the children could handle him firmly and precisely, as a good mahout handles a good elephant. Only now Fortress Caporetto was finished. There was no more work for him to do, and he did take up a lot of space. Where are you going now? he said, slurping his tea noisily. What are we going to do with him? whispered Sam. Just not fetch him any more, said Chaz. He's not bright enough to find his way here by himself. I hope you're right, said Sam. So as the night fell, they took John home for what they thought was the last time. Nicky wakened with a start. He switched on his bedside light. His alarm clock said half past one. Why had he wakened? He slept till morning, usually. Sleep was a refuge. Was it bombers coming? He listened. The night was silent. He got up to go to the toilet. As he passed his mother's door, he saw her light was still on, and he heard her voice 
low and whispering, laughing. Then that man's voice. He was in there again. Nicky stood, his fist clenched. He hated that man. He would like to rush in and kill him. But he was only sicky Nicky, puny, puny, puny. Tears started in his eyes and he fled to the toilet. Sitting on it, he began wondering again what had wakened him. But he could think of nothing. Only there had been the smell of the sea in his bedroom, as there was some nights when the wind was in the east. The wind carried the sound of the foghorn, too. When his father had been alive and at sea, Nicky had liked that smell of the sea and the sound of the foghorn. It made him imagine the bridge of the Cyclades, lit by the dim lights of the compass binnacle and chart table, and his father's face, keen, commanding, bringing the great ship home through the dark. He had felt close to his father. But now the smell of the sea and the sound of the horn were a desolation. He tiptoed back past the hated door and slept again. And again he awakened to the smell of the sea. He tiptoed right round the house. Sailors snored behind doors. In the kitchen, mice scattered from view as the light went on. He put the light out again and lifted a corner of the blackout curtain. Stars and silence. The fog must be clearing from the harbour mouth. The horn had stopped. But now the fear was in him. Something terrible was going to happen. He must run. But where? Beneath the stars he could see the trees where the crow's nest was. The fortress. That's where he must run to. Quickly, now. The danger was near. He snatched up clothes, shoes, a torch and his teddy bear and ran. Dead in their bed of sin there was, said Mrs. Spaulding dramatically, waggling the curling pins under her headscarf. And a judgment, I call it. Lying there without a stitch on or a mark on their bodies. It was the blast what done it, or the hand of God. God is not mocked. Uh, not in front of the bairn, please, Mrs. Spaulding, said Chaz's father, putting down his knife and fork with an ominous clink, but not sufficiently ominous to stop Mrs. Spaulding in full cry. But that bairn, that poor little bairn who never did any harm, why did God take him? She raised her finger to the cracked ceiling, as if the Almighty were perched on the lampshade like a pet budgie. Mrs. Spaulding, thundered Mr. McGill. The bomb fell right on his little room where he was lying innocent asleep. They found not one little piece of him. He's with the angels now. Chaz had an absurd picture of angels piecing together some unknown innocent's arms and legs as if he were a jigsaw puzzle. Mr. McGill looked at Chaz and jerked his head. Out! Chaz fled. As far as the keyhole of the kitchen door, he listened intently. Mrs. Spaulding said, you needn't look at me like that, Mr. McGill. I'm doing no more than speaking the truth. There's been sin and wickedness in that house ever since Captain Nickel was lost. God rest his soul. Chas felt sick. Nicky's house had been bombed. Nicky, his mother and that naval officer all dead. Oh, Lord, the fortress. The machine gun. And all them poor sailor boys, stiff and stark, intoned Mrs. Spaulding. Chaz ran like the wind. The nickel house looked almost normal. The bomb had hit at the back, and the front retained its roof, and even some windows. Police wardens, heavy rescue and ambulance had departed. Someone had closed the front gates and wired them together. The garden wall was high, with spikes on top. Chaz looked round furtively and climbed over the wired gate. He skirted the house and went into the back garden. The overgrown lawn was strewn with bricks and tiles. Where Nick's bedroom had once been, there was a brick-red gash. Chaz couldn't see any blood splashes. Further on, statues and garden urns lay toppled. The goldfish pond had cracked and was empty. One dead goldfish lay on the frozen weed at the bottom. The tiny stream that had fed the pool was spreading across the whole garden, turning it into a swamp and then freezing. The crow's nest was still there, though thrown askew by the blast. Well, that could be rebuilt. The fortress, they had built well. There was not a sandbag out of place. Chas pulled back the old quilt and went in. 
his skin crept. There was something alive with him in the dark. An odd voice said, Chaz? Dicky, how did you escape? My father came in a dream and warned me. Oh, they're all dead, even the ratings. Oh, I went back and found them. Oh, what do you do now? There was a long pause. I don't know. There's no one else in our family. I suppose they'll put me in a home. Hard luck. I wish you could stay with us, but... Well, me nana and granda are staying with us till the end of the war. I don't want to leave this place. I mean, all this is mine now. And I'd rather be with you than strangers. He held out his hand. Charles felt very strange. He had prickles up and down his spine. He felt bigger and stronger than ever before, and yet more frightened at the same time. He clasped the proffered hand in both of his. We'll have a meeting. We'll see you through. Nicky showed the pale ghost of a smile. I know where there's a lot of food. That petty officer that got killed was in the black market. The old stables are full of stuff. OK, let's get it before somebody else does. It'll mean enlarging the fortress, though. More work for funny old John. Everyone listened as Nicky told his story. Audrey sat picking at the scabs on her knees. Sam didn't laugh for once. When Nicky had finished, they looked at each other in a long silence. We must tell some grown-up, said Carrot Juice. They all think he's dead. It'll be in the records at the town hall and things. People will be worrying. Who? asked Clogger. Who is there who cares? There was silence. Carrot Juice set his face stubbornly. Grown-ups know what's best. They do what's best for grown-ups, said Clogger. They'll tidy him away into a home and forget him. Like they did with me when my ma died. They give you porridge without sugar and belt you if you leave your shoes lying about. He could stay with one of us, said Audrey. Would you arm my him? Audrey hung her head. She knew what her mother would say. They all knew what their mothers would say. But where can he live? He could manage here, said Clogger. We've got grub for a year. I've known folks put up with worse in Glasgow. Suppose he gets ill. Take him to the doctor. Plenty kids can go on their own now. But won't he get lonely? Then quite an awful thing happened. Nicky began to cry and he couldn't stop. It was nothing like the way kids cry when they fall and hurt themselves. Words came bubbling out of his mouth about his father and his mother and that man and hate and death. Everyone was rooted to the spot. Then all the boys looked at Audrey. She took a timid step forward and stroked his hair gingerly. It didn't make him any worse. She began to say his name gently, over and over. Everyone do it. So they knelt and stroked his hair, his back, his arms, his knees. Nicky, Nicky, Nicky. In the end, he stopped crying, sniffed and said, All right now. Sorry. Audrey gave him a hanky and he wiped his face. It'd better no live here alone, said Clogger. I'll come and live with him. But what will your auntie say? Ah, uh, Mick, I think I've gone home to Glasgow. But she'll be worried sick. Not her. She's not really my auntie, just my ma's cousin. She wasn't so keen to have me in the first place, and we're sleeping three in a bed. She'll miss the money my dad sends, that's all. But doesn't she love you? Charles blushed as he said it. Love me? You kids don't know you're born. All she and my uncle love is their beer and fags. I've thought of running away many a time. Everyone stared at him aghast, so that even Clogger became uncomfortable. I'll be a while then. I'll have to hurry if I want to be back before dark. Before you go, said Chaz, aye. Everyone swear on the gun. So they brought the gun out of its wrapping and laid Grandar's Union Jack on it, and everyone put their hands on the gun and swore to look after Nicky. In the swearing, Fortress Caporetto became more than a game. It became a nation, and the Germans ceased to be the only enemies. 
All the adults were a kind of enemy now, except John. Clogger returned long after nightfall, his old bike laden with gear. He came by the back way, the loose boards in the fence. Easy. I left a note from my auntie whilst they were snoozing off that dinner. I biked to Otterburn and posted a postcard there. They'll think I'm away or the Scottish border by now. Nicky really smiled. I'm glad you're back. I'll get your supper. The police sergeant went round the homes of all Clogger's mates and questioned them. But it was easy to be stony-faced and lie when you pretended you were a French resistance fighter and he was a Gestapo swine. At each house the sergeant sensed something in the boy he talked to. Not guilt, but hostility and cunning. At McGill's, the last house, he turned to Chaz's father on the doorstep. This war's doing bad things to kids. They're running wild. You don't know where you are with them anymore. These are decent kids from decent homes, but they go on more like slum kids with a dad in the nick. You know, against the police on principle. Maybe that says more about the police than the kids. Mr McGill spat on the doorstep and turned away to shut the door in the sergeant's face. Look, said the sergeant, desperately jamming his foot in the door. They're up to something. Take your foot out of my house, said Mr McGill dangerously. The sergeant left, but Mr McGill was worried about Chaz for all his fighting words. He beckoned Chaz to come into the cold front room with its big chiming clock. Chaz trembled. He knew what was coming. He couldn't even pretend his father was some kind of Gestapo swine like the police sergeant, or the head flexing his cane. His father understood how kids really felt about things, more than most. Ever since he was little, Dad had meant safety. Large, solid, bristly-faced, smelling of tobacco. His thumb always grew in three segments, where he had hit it with a hammer while he was an apprentice. But could any grown-up keep you safe now? They couldn't stop the German bombers. They hadn't saved Poland, or Norway, or France, or the battleship the German submarine torpedoed and scarp aflow itself. Their own air raid shelter at home. It wasn't as safe as the fortress. It was only covered with a foot of soil. Couldn't Dad have done better than that? He looked at his father and saw a weary, helpless, middle-aged man. Dad wasn't any kind of God anymore. Chaz screwed himself up to lie. And for some reason Dad made it easy. Maybe because he was just so tired. He never looked at Chaz. He took the big family Bible off the sideboard and made Chaz swear on it that he knew nothing about machine guns or clogger. And Dad didn't even believe in God. Chaz swore with his eyes on the Bible. He could never have done it looking at his dad. It all worked like a charm. With John's help, they dug up the second Anderson shelter, the small one intended for the Nickel family. They made it entirely underground, buried deep. It could only be reached by a tunnel from the big one. They filled it with food and useful things from the bombed house, enamel jugs and bowls and mirrors. Nothing from the bomb damage was wasted. Another foot of rubble was piled over the fortress. The gun emplacement was roofed in with old doors and soil. Only the three loopholes for the gun showed from the outside, and that was the way you got in. They worked on the garden, too, directing the waters of the tiny stream with dams, so that the whole area became an ankle-deep swamp through which no one could pass. At the other side, they fixed a whole section of fence so that it would fall outward when someone pulled a rope from inside the fortress. That gave what Lieutenant Andrew Morgan had called a good field of fire. Audrey uprooted plants and privet bushes and planted them on top for camouflage. All was ready, just in time. But not all the fortress's defences were made by hands. Some were made with mouths. It was queer how rumours got around about the Nickel House. It became even more notorious in death than in life. Some people said there was another bomb there, unexploded, never found. Others reckoned there were ghosts. Ghostly scrawlings of sailor obscenities on walls. Laughter in a lighted bedroom, which no longer had a floor. Perhaps it was the fact that it looked so undamaged, though so many had died there. 
People pointed out its gables above the trees to visiting strangers. But no one went there, except the children. Chapter 8 Frost lay on the branches and froze Clogger's breath on the eyepiece of the telescope. He wiped it angrily with his glove. But it was impossible to be really unhappy on such an evening. The sky was a dimming blue from horizon to horizon. The January evenings were beginning to draw out. Clogger consulted the old watch and chain that the lookouts always carried in their top pockets. Five o'clock. Fifteen minutes more in the crow's nest. He scanned the horizon with the telescope again. He was shivering so much that the horizon jumped round like a kangaroo. Then he sucked in his breath. There was a dot, low over the waves. He lost it and couldn't find it again. A stream of frightful Glaswegian words escaped his lips. When he finally spotted it again, it was nearer. He could see it had two engines. Captain, sir! Chaz's head emerged from a loophole. Plane, sir, to an engine, flying low. Scarper! shouted Chaz. Gone out! They whipped the silver fabric off the gun and pushed the muzzle past Clogger as he scrambled in. He watch it. I don't want a hole where my dinner is. Chaz gripped the gun and peered down the gun sight. Lower the fence. Sem undid the knotted rope and the section of fence fell away, revealing the view over the bay. There was nothing in sight. Oh no, another false alarm. Clogger, you been at your uncle's whiskey again. There was something, I tell you. It's too far off to see without the telescope yet. Wait. And soon, there it was. A British plane? A Blenheim? Chaz's eyes watered with the strain of looking. It was very low for a British plane, but perhaps it was damaged. No. The propellers had that same queer windmill look. It was gliding in, with its engines shut off. It was black. It was him. And as before, it would pass right overhead. He lined up the sights on it. It grew bigger and bigger. Wait, wait. Finger on the curving trigger. Go on, said Sam, and nudged him. There was a flash and a roar. Something hit Chaz in the chest, much harder than Bodser Brown's fist. He fell over backwards, pulling the gun with him. He lay on the ground with the thing still punching away at his chest. Wood splinters and soil rained down. He stared aghast at a gaping hole in the roof, through which he saw the German plane, crosses and all, pass as in a dream. It looked completely unharmed. The tremendous banging of the gun ceased. Sam stared at the enormous hole in the roof. Cor, blimey! The stream of bullets from the machine gun missed the German fighter by miles. But it startled the pilot so much he put the plane into a near-vertical climb and nearly stalled. While he was battling to regain control, he was spotted by a lone pom-pom gunner on the bank top, who had been seeing to his gun sight. Long lines of red stitching followed the fighter up the sky. More pom-poms opened up. One blew off the fighter's wingtip, and that seemed to drive the pilot mad. Far from trying to escape, he started a personal vendetta against the pom-poms. Once he came so low, he curved round the lighthouse on the bank top at zero feet, causing a fat woman with a pram to faint at the entrance to Chapel Street. The end to such mad behaviour was inevitable. Three spitfires from Acklington got between him and the sea. But the pilot seemed beyond caring. He headed straight for the spitfires, guns blazing. They were still blazing when he blew up over the harbour mouth. You could hear people cheering on both sides of the river. What with the explosion and the cheering, nobody had noticed a small dark mass that had detached itself from the Messerschmitt at the last possible moment. It fell nearly to the ground before a parachute opened, and it still hit the ground rather hard. Sergeant Rudy Gerlart of the victorious Luftwaffe tried to stand up, but his ankle was agony, so he crawled instead, gathering the telltale folds of parachute as he went into a clumsy bundle. He was in some sort of garden. Apart from the forest of Brussels sprouts around him, the only cover were some little wooden sheds. He crawled to the first shed and opened the door, only to be greeted by a frantic clucking and fluttering. Hens. And where there were hens, people came to feed them. No go. He shut the door and crawled on. 
The next hut contained one big fat rabbit, who regarded Rudy thoughtfully while chewing his way up a long dandelion leaf. Rabbit, I envy you, said Rudy. Rabbits live longer than rear gunners. The next hut was empty, except for spades and sacks. Rudy climbed in painfully, pulling the muddy parachute after him. He looked at his ankle. It wasn't broken or even bleeding. Just sprained so he couldn't walk. Might as well surrender, he thought. Might be a hot meal before interrogation. I'd reveal all the secrets of the Third Reich for a glass of schnapps and a lump of sausage. He opened the hut door and shouted loudly. Nobody came. Eventually he got tired of shouting and fell asleep. The glare of the exploding plane right overhead did queer things to Chaz's eyes. Everything he looked at had a glowing blue hole in it, the shape and size of the explosion. He wondered whether he would go permanently blind. It would be a tragic loss to the world. He heard a BBC announcer's voice in his head say, He could have been the finest brain surgeon England has ever seen. Even blind, he is a superb concert pianist. But how sad he should never see the blue sky again. He went on, walking round in circles and peering at things. The hole in his eyes seemed to be fading. He suddenly felt hungry and wondered what was for tea. Sam was capering like a dervish on top of the fortress, pulling up Audrey's camouflage bushes and whirling them round his head. We've got him! We've got him! You and how many spitfires, said Audrey acidly. You've certainly blown a fine hole in our roof with that thing. Stop squabbling, you two, announced Chaz with tears in his eyes. A brave man has died. He died facing his foes. What more can any man hope for? He felt all grand and squashy inside, like when they played Land of Hope and Glory at school. But the next second he felt cross, because the Messerschmitt had blown up above the waters of the harbour, and there wouldn't be any souvenirs to pick up. What about that hole in the roof? asked Audrey again. And next time you might kill somebody with that nasty great gun. That's what it's for. That's what I was trying to do, so. Anyway, what do stupid girls know about it? Besides he, he pointed to Sam, that stupid laughing fool jogged me arm. Weren't that, said Sam. You couldn't hold the gun steady. You're puny, that's your trouble. Nobody could have held it, said Chaz. It kicks like a mule. You haven't even tried firing it. Gone. Errol Flynn did it in that film. He charged the Jerry's firing from the hip and won the VC. You're wrong. Only British can get the VC, shouted Audrey. Girls, they all shouted together. What do girls know about it? And then they went back to squabbling. You can't believe what's on films. Wasn't a real machine gun. Was. It was flashing. Wasn't. Was. Wasn't. What about that hole in the roof? And I'm not going back into the camp to make tea until you put that nasty great thing away. Shut up! Oh, we'd better do as she says. Or no get a cup of tea. And you better find some way of holding that gun down. It nearly shot my head off. My dad could make a stand to hold it. I dare say he could. But how are you going to ask him? You can hardly say, Da, make us a stand for my real loaded machine gun. Chas looked thoughtful. I can get him to make me one but I'll have to borrow the telescope for a few days. Why not? There's nought left to watch out for now, anyway. Rudy wakened stiff and cold. No matter how carefully he arranged them, the sacks fell off him during the night. His ankle was up like a pudding. He wouldn't be able to walk for a week. He opened the hut door and looked out. The sky was grey. His watch had stopped and there was no way of telling the time. He was terribly hungry. Even the frosted Brussels sprouts began to seem appetising. He spent an hour crawling over and gathering some. He had to suck the frost out of them before he could chew them. They were as hard as bullets. He wished he could surrender, but no one came. He fell asleep. When he awakened again, the sky was still grey. He was beginning to lose feeling in his legs. When he finally got the circulation back, the pins and needles were awful. He decided to crawl in and surrender. It seemed a hundred miles to the edge of the allotments. When he got to the fence and looked through a gap, there was only a cinder track, a disused gas lamp, and the high brick wall of some factory. It was getting dark and starting to snow, so he had to crawl all the way back. 
He became so confused he couldn't find his hut at first. He slept again. It was the rabbits who saved him that week. Most of the huts contained a few. In their hutches he found food, crusts of toast, baked potato peelings, bran mash, drinkable water. In the beginning the beasts bolted when he opened their hutch doors to steal their dinner. Bundles of warm, panicky fur hurled themselves from one side to the other, pressing their panting sides into patterns against the hutch wire. He contemplated killing one for the meat, but he wasn't desperate enough yet. After five days, the rabbits got used to him and eyed him placidly. He spent hours in their company, giving them pet names. Birgit, Franz, Heinz. He talked to them, and they seemed to listen, drooping first one ear and then the other. When were they fed? Why did he never see the owners? He couldn't tell. He contemplated sleeping with them, waiting to be captured. But he had an aversion to being taken in his sleep. Besides, a distrust of all humans was setting in. Not the fear of a prisoner of war for his enemies, but the distrust of a wild animal, daily growing wilder. He only saw one other human being in all his time on the allotment, an old man picking Brussels sprouts. It took Rudy a long time to pluck up courage to shout and wave. The old man gave one panicky look and ran. Rudy expected him back with soldiers, but he didn't come. Perhaps the old man had been a thief and hadn't realised Rudy was a German. Chaz knew very well how to approach his dad. He carried the telescope home and dumped it in front of him. Where'd you get that? Sam Jones wants a swap. It was his granddad's. He wants my train set. Is it worth it? Mr. McGill reached for the telescope, turning it over in his clever mechanic's hands, feeling the solid craftsmanship. Sam Jones is a fool. This is worth a lot more than your train set. Does his dad know he's swapping it? Yeah, he was there. He said this was mucky old rubbish and not worth a good train set. He said I was a fool. Mr. McGill bridled. He didn't like Mr. Jones. There was a long-standing row between the families. That man knows nought but tombstones. A bairn could see this is a good piece of stuff. Already he was taking the telescope to pieces. Needs a bit of seeing to, though. Go and fetch me with tools and the brasso. It was a peaceful evening, like one before the war. Grandar was better and had gone off to the pub to have a crack with his mates. Nana was skinning a rabbit in the kitchen, her brawny red arms snowed with tufts of fur. Mrs. McGill put some potatoes to bake next to the fire, in their jackets. Mr. McGill worked on the telescope, laying out parts in careful order on a sheet of newspaper. How would he ever put them together again? But he did, gleaming and shining, pointing out things of interest to Chaz as he did so. Can I swap, then? Aye, you're growing up, and a railway's a bairns thing. Better not show the telescope to Mr. Jones now, though, or he'll change his mind. <laughs> Old rubbish, indeed. The man's an idiot. Now was the moment. Chaz took a deep breath. <sighs> Only trouble is, Dad, it, it's so heavy, I, I, I can't hold it steady. Mr. McGill looked up at him with a slow grin. I knew there'd be a catch. Want me to make you a tripod for it? Yeah. In his moment of triumph, Chaz felt a rat. It was a much worse pain than parting with his beloved railway. Mr. McGill was good at his work. He liked a technical problem, and he had time to solve it. The gasworks for once did not break down. The tripod was finished in a week. Mr. McGill made things to last, in quarter-inch steel and inch gas pipe, solidly welded together and given a black finish to proof it against rust. The tripod held the round body of the telescope just fine. It would hold the round body of the machine gun equally well. And if the legs were bedded in concrete... Chapter 9 Got a funny case here, Sarge, said Fatty Hardy. The sergeant groaned. More than bombers or the coming invasion, he dreaded Fatty Hardy's funny cases. Pinched sandbags, missing machine guns, haunted houses. The constable was a lunatic. What is it this time? It's a woman with a funny story. Let her in to tell it, then. I haven't had a laugh in weeks. I didn't mean a joke, Sarge. 
Hardy looked baffled. Oh, send her in and go. The woman perched herself on the edge of a chair like a bird, clasped her hands and closed her eyes. Let us pray, said the sergeant, before he could stop himself. It was the tiredness that did it. Let us pray indeed, young man, for these are the latter days when the foul beast shall be loosed from the pit. Book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 11. Oh, Lord, thought the sergeant, she's one of those. What is more, the servants of the foul beast have been machine gunning my mother. Do you what? gasped the sergeant, nearly falling out of his chair. Three days ago, as I live and breathe, I'd just taken mother a cup of tea and was reading to her from the good book when something came through our roof and smashed the goddess love that hangs over her bed. What sort of something? asked the sergeant cautiously. The woman dug in her purse and dropped a flattened bullet into his hand. The sergeant could see it wasn't British. What happened then? I ran to the window and saw that fearsome machine fleeing God's wrath going straight up into the heavens. Strange choice of direction, thought the sergeant, but caught his tongue in time. German, it bore the crooked cross. The sergeant tossed the bullet thoughtfully up and down. It had been that German fighter that exploded all right, the one everybody called the tea-time sneaker. Where do you live? Simpson Street, across the river. Are you the war damage? Am I what? The war damage. Mrs. Spink said if I reported to the war damage, they'd come and mend the hole in our roof and give us a new goddess love. Madam, I am not the war damage, but leave your address and I will send round the man who is. The woman sniffed and left. The sergeant sat on. It didn't make sense. The tea-time sneaker had been a reconnaissance plane, relying on stealth. Why should it open fire on a street miles from any military target? Nervous rear gunner? But Simpson Street lay at right angles to the sneaker's flight path. Even a nervous rear gunner would not turn his gun through ninety degrees of slipstream before going trigger-happy. Were they all mad in that plane? It had climbed vertically immediately afterwards, which was a mad enough thing to do. Or had something upset a normally steady crew? Something like being fired on from the ground by a machine gun whose bullets missed and landed among houses across the river. But they were German bullets. The sergeant banged his fist on the desk and swore. That missing machine gun, what a fool he'd been. The sergeant surveyed God is Love and its line of bullet holes. The text was not alone on the bedroom walls at Simpson Street. God blessed this house where the border of blue kittens and pansies hung above the empty fireplace. Thou God seest me, stitched round a large and malevolent eye, hung over the door. Not only God's eye surveyed the sergeant. The bright beady eyes of the old lady in bed followed him everywhere. Haven't got a fire, have ye? I'm right gasping. She won't let me have em, you know. Says they're ungodly. Her and her God. She's potty, you know. It's a case when a poor old body can't have her deathbed comforts. The sergeant offered a bent woodbine and lit it. She sucked in smoke, her face wreathed in beatific smiles, like a baby having its bottle. That's the force this week. Mrs. Davies slips me one when she calls, but she's laid up with her sciatica. Where do you put the ash? asked the sergeant nervously. The old lady pointed to a rose-wreathed chamber pot under the bed. Last time the doctor came to test me water, he nearly had a fit. Excuse me, said the sergeant. He must get on with his job. He tied a piece of string with a weight on the end to the bullet holes in the ceiling. Then he put his head against the shattered God is love and looked beyond the string through the window. He was now looking down the path the bullets had come. They had come from a clump of trees across the river, with a chimney pot sticking up through them. Help! <coughs> gasped the old lady, breaking into a paroxysm of coughing. The sergeant thought she was starting a fit. Her eyes were swivelling wildly, but he finally realised she wanted him to take the cigarette. He had just taken it when the daughter burst in. The old lady must have hearing like radar. Smoking, said the daughter triumphantly, her eyes alighted on the woodbine in the sergeant's hand. This whole room stinks like the foul pit. I've told him he wouldn't have smoking, Ada, said the old woman, but he wouldn't heed. He took advantage of me lying here helpless. So you say. I'll think my own thoughts about what happens to those who abuse God's truth on Judgment Day. Meanwhile, Sergeant, 
I'll ask you to leave. You're only here on sufferance. You're not even war damaged. Madam, I have my job to do. What's that? And what's this rubbish? She pulled at the string that dangled from the ceiling. It came loose, pulling half the ceiling with it. Look at me plaster on me best carpet. Get out or I'll set the police on you. Madam, I am the police. Have you got a search warrant? She screamed. The sergeant decided it was time to flee the foul tempter. All the way back over the river to the ferry, he tried to work out which was the little clump of trees on the north bank he'd seen beyond the string. But there were so many clumps. It would be a long job finding it. At last came the morning when Rudy found he could walk. But walk where? To a policeman? A prison camp? It was tempting. Warm blankets, a bath, hot soup and bread, comrades who spoke German. But the problem was getting safe to the prison camp. He knew how much Garmouth had been bombed. Night after night he had lain under a thin wooden roof while bombs rained down, while searchlights revolved like spokes of giant wheels, while fires burned and the bells of fire engines clanged through the streets. People who had been bombed hated enemy flyers. Rudy had seen the capture of a British flyer in Berlin, the first night it had been bombed. The man stumbled along between two Wehrmacht, who used their fixed bayonets to keep the German civilians back. Civilians who threw stones and dog dirt at the airmen, and his captors alike. One woman had leapt in screaming and clawed the flyer's face. That was when the officer had ordered his soldiers to fire their rifles in the air. But suppose the soldiers hadn't been there. There were stories of airmen hanged from lampposts, run through with pitchforks. Rudy opened the holster on his belt. Alone of his possessions, the Luger pistol was clean. That would deal with those who brought ropes and pitchforks. Then there was the pain of being a prisoner. All his life Rudy had hated being fastened in. Once he had run away from the Oberschule because the master had locked him in a cupboard. All his boyhood he had roamed the streets until his mother accused him of turning into a criminal. But he was never a criminal. He just had to be free. But where could he go to stay free? He must stick to Wasteland, where no English went. Old dumps and bombed houses. And he would walk to the sea, which the British called the North Sea, and the Germans the German Ocean. There might be a boat he could steal, or a Swedish cargo ship to stow away on. It was a forlorn hope, but before he was captured or killed, he would look once more on the sea. He closed his holster, fastened one large sack round his middle with a lump of rope, and draped another marked A1 cattle cake over his flying helmet. He must keep on his flying helmet, or else he could be shot as a spy. He thought with his new beard and his mud-encrusted trousers he might pass as a tramp. He said goodbye to the rabbits and stuffed his pockets with frozen Brussels sprouts. Then he set off, beginning to sing to himself in that peculiar monotone he had heard tramps use in his childhood. It was a bitterly cold day. Not many people were about. But as he was cutting down a back lane, a woman came out to her dustbin with a dish of scraps. A stout body in a flowered apron and checked carpet slippers. She stared at the approaching, shambling figure. Rudy hummed, Ich hat einen Kameraden, in a high-pitched whine. He looked at the scraps hungrily. Cabbage and lumps of pie crust. The hand that was scraping him into the bin with a knife paused. Rudy halted and looked up, making his eyes wide so that the white showed all round. Where are you from? asked the woman. Rudy understood her. He had done English at Oberschule, but he didn't reply for his accent was strong. Instead, he mouthed gibberish and pointed first to the plate and then at his mouth. The woman's face melted from doubt to kindliness. She offered the plate timidly. Rudy clawed up the scraps and thrust them into his mouth. Even in his fear, they tasted marvellous. Wit, said the woman, holding up her hand. She vanished back into her yard. Rudy wondered whether to run, but he couldn't. His ankle was too painful. The back lane was too long. He waited what seemed a lifetime until the woman reappeared with half a loaf and a large wizened apple. Now there was a man behind her, her husband doubtless. He had a bald head, a thrusting chin, a collarless shirt and red braces into which he stuck his thumbs aggressively. What you hanging round here for, pestering women? Beep, beep, oh gum, said Rudy earnestly. Hush, Jack, said the woman. Can't you see he's a dummy? Riff-raff, said her husband. I'd shoot the likes of those. 
No use to the war effort at all. How much use are you, always on the sick with your back? asked the woman, a spark kindling in her eye. Leave the poor thing alone, he's not doing you any harm. She thrust loaf and apple into Rudy's hands. Ye are, love, and the best of luck. Look, 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 said Rudy, and shambled away. He could hear the man and woman start to quarrel as they entered the house. Rudy wandered on till he found a bombed house and a huge wooded garden. The gates were wired together, but he got over them somehow. The house was abandoned, but it had water trickling from a burst pipe in what had been the kitchen, and one room still had a roof and glass in the windows. There were old pink mattresses thrown about, and torn curtains for bedding, even plenty of broken wood for a fire, if he had only had matches. Why? He could live here for weeks. He settled down and ate the apple and half the bread. He made himself leave the rest till later. He'd been luckier than he deserved. The tramp disguise was working. It would not have worked in Germany. There were no tramps there now. Hitler had put them into hospitals, and they were never seen again. He started. Footsteps sounded on the gravel drive. He peeped round the filthy curtain. A man in a blue uniform was staring at the house. Gestapo? Did the British have Gestapo? He wore no gun, carried no truncheon, but wore a tall, pointed hat. Pull its eye. The man limped and looked very tired. Even in his own present state, Rudy felt sorry for him. It would be a pity to shoot him. Was this the moment to surrender? It would be so easy, that walk to the Politzai barracks. What could seem more harmless to hostile civilians than a Politzai walking with an old tramp? And once in a cell, he would be safe from ropes and pitchforks. But Rudy was a gambler at heart, on horses, at cards, even on racing two cockroaches. And at the moment, his luck was holding. He heard the sergeant enter the house, heard his heavy boots echoing from room to room, coming nearer. All Rudy could do was get behind the door, Luger in one hand, loaf of bread in the other. The door opened. The sergeant's helmeted head appeared. It seemed to Ruby he was looking for something on the floor, not for a person. Rudy held his breath, finger on trigger. The door closed. Rudy waited till the footsteps receded, and then took several great panting breaths. The sergeant left the house and went round the back. Rudy crept from room to room, watching him. The back garden was wild and huge, with old statues and urns overthrown by the bomb's blast. The sergeant began to walk among them, down towards the back fence where a mound of tumbled rubble lay under the trees. The sergeant paused, and then began to pick his way gingerly. Suddenly his shiny boot vanished up to the ankle. Damn in hell! The sergeant slipped and nearly fell, hanging onto a sundial for support. His boots were covered in thick yellow mud. He shrugged and turned back towards the house, rubbing his boots on the long grass as he came. He passed, and his footsteps faded. Immediately, Rudy felt the call of nature. Quick, the last thing he wanted was wet trousers, but not in the house. He might be there for days, and he couldn't stand the smell of a place where someone had urinated. He'd go down the garden under the trees. He grinned. The mud wouldn't put him off. His flying boots couldn't get any muddier. With difficulty, he reached the trees. He looked back to make sure nobody was watching. Funny, that house looked familiar. Where had he seen it before? He couldn't have seen it before. He'd been once on holiday in England before the war, but that was Brighton, hundreds of miles south. You're getting delirious, comrade, he thought to himself. After he'd been among the trees, he felt much better and stared about. There was a little doorway in that mound of rubble, not much bigger than a rabbit hole. In fact, there were three doorways all in a row. What was it? A bomb shelter? A coal cellar? Rudy couldn't resist his curiosity. He had a feeling he was being foolish, but he had to know what was inside. Down the hole he went. He straightened up and looked straight down the barrel of a machine gun. By the light of a candle, he could see four helmeted figures crouching over the gun. His luck had ended with a vengeance. He put up his hands as high in the air as he could push them. As he did so, the sacks fell from his waist and head. Chapter 10 Clogger had done a wonderful job with the concrete floor. He'd even got the holes in the right place so that the tripod fitted in neatly. 
they brought out the gun and screwed it into the tripod. It swung easily and precisely, covering land and sky. It would certainly never jump about again and menace to life and limb. Now it would fire where it was pointed. Might as well change the magazines, said Sem. After a lot of fiddling, the empty magazine was removed. I'll just test the gun while it's empty, said Chaz. He pulled the trigger and there was a satisfying sharp click. But when Sem insisted on trying it, there was no click. The trigger felt slack, dead. Try pulling all the levers, suggested Sem. They pushed and pulled everything for ten minutes, but the trigger remained dead. Even amidst Audrey's protests, putting a full magazine on made no difference. You've bloody broken it, said Chaz in disgust. It was broken for I touched it, said Sem. Was you? Wasn't so, was so. Ah, oh, gee, us a go at sorting it then, said Clogger. My dad could I mend watches. What else was there to do? What good is a gun that won't fire? All right, but be careful. They watched hopefully. His fingers seemed too sure and clever. He loosened one nut, then another. Then there was a ping and a shower of shiny pieces fell all over the new concrete floor. Crikey! Don't worry, I can mend it. You and whose army? Clogger got on his hands and knees and began frantically picking up the pieces. Get out of my light, he grunted angrily. But somebody was scrambling down the loophole to get in. Somebody? They froze with horror. That somebody was big. An adult. And it wasn't John. It was a stranger. An adult stranger. Chaz felt his stomach pull together in a tight knot, the way a spider does when you touch it. This wasn't real. This was a nightmare. The dead German air gunner had come back for his gun, helmet and all. It was like his granddad's nightmare when the Austrian soldier came back for his hat badge. Chaz grabbed the machine gun. Even a dead air gunner wasn't going to take his treasure. But the German had his hands up. Quick, it's a Jerry, get his gun. The phrase sprang to his lips from so many war films. Clogger reacted too, like someone in the movies, getting behind the German, patting around his waist for a weapon. He flipped open the holster, pulled out the Luger, and backed away to the wall of the shelter. Dumb Kopf, said Rudy to himself bitterly. These were children playing at soldiers. But the gun was real. It was the kind he used himself. He stared around as his eyes got used to the candlelight, at the neatly piled sandbags. Were these children or soldiers? Was the British army as short of men after Dunkirk as the Fuhrer had said? Or was every Britisher armed, even children? Was England one vast armed camp, just waiting to massacre any poor German who landed? Were these the awful English who would fight on the beaches, as Churchill said? It was very confusing. For a long time, they all stared at each other. Then Rudy said, Please, hands down. Mine arms tired are. Hand a hock, screamed Clogger, pulling back the round handle on top of the Luger. That too was what they did in the movies. Steady, thought Rudy. I must be calm or I'll get my head blown off. He said carefully and slowly, Please, may I down sit? I tired am. Let him clogger. It's safer. Clogger nodded and gestured down to the concrete floor with a pistol barrel. Rudy sat down very slowly and put his hands on the back of his neck. Only his eyes moved here and there. Who were these kids? The British version of the Hitler Youth? Another was pointing a long black air rifle at him. He glanced at the machine gun. It was on a good solid mounting, but it was stripped down. It couldn't have been fired anyway. He'd been fooled. Now they were holding him prisoner with his own verdammed pistol, which was dangerously cocked. They were passing it gingerly from one to the other. Oh, Rudy, Rudy, he thought, lifting his eyes to the ceiling. If only your mother could see you now. Perhaps they would fetch soldiers soon, and the soldiers would take him away to a nice, safe prison camp. What are we going to do? screamed Sam. He's a Nazi! He's no so like a proper Nazi, said Clogger dubiously. And indeed, the tattered wretch before them was not much like those black, shiny-booted stormtroopers who goose-stepped nightly through their dreams. He ain't got no swastikas. He's not a blonde beast. He looks hungry, said Audrey. Can I give him a mug of tea? Suppose so, said Chaz grudgingly. The German slurry removed his flying helmet and sucked at the tea noisily. 
His hair was long, black and greasy, and going a bit grey at the sides, like Mr McGill's. He really looked like somebody's dad, a bit fed up and tired. What are we going to do with him? Take him to the warden's post. What? With a loaded luger stuck in his back? That'll cause a few questions. Besides, he'd tell them about us. But he can't speak English. He can a bit. Besides, they'll interrogate him in German. Errol Flynn did in that film. Then they'll spit about the fortress and the machine gun, and then we've had it. But they're only supposed to give their name, rank and number. That's in the Geneva Convention. The what? The Geneva Convention. What do you know about the Geneva Convention? My dad told me. Oh, tripe. Besides, that only means he mustn't tell the interrogators anything about Germany. It doesn't mean he won't spit on us. Rudy watched their worried faces woozily. It was warm in here, with the smell of paraffin. He hadn't been warm for a week. He was so tired. The place was going dark. Hey, he's fallen to sleep. Better get him inside. Hey, rouse, rouse. Rudy sat up with a bewildered jerk. Poor sod, he's knackered. Clogger pointed towards the interior of the Anderson with his pistol barrel. Rudy went like a sleepwalker. He had a blessed vision of a real bunk, a patchwork quilt, and then he knew no more. The children looked at his snoring shape. Blimey! Chapter 11 It's getting near the spring tides, opined Mr McGill, looking up from the Daily Express. That's when they'll come, mark my words. But it's not spring yet, said Mrs McGill. It's only February. I don't mean that kind of spring, woman. A spring tide's when the sea's higher than usual. It'll carry their flat-bottomed barges up over the beach defences. What's flat-bottomed barges, Dad? Mr McGill laid down his paper. They're boats with flat bottoms so they can get close ashore. Hitler's gathering all he can find in Holland and Belgium, and when he's ready, he'll tow them across full of soldiers using tugs. But they won't come this far north, said Mrs McGill. They'll land on the Thames or Liverpool or something. Her grasp of geography was never great. Charles could never convince her that Edinburgh was not near London. Huh, <laughs> said Mr McGill. Maybe that's what Hitler and them wants us to think. They'll get all our soldiers down south and then they'll attack up here and cut the country in half. Oh, don't talk like that, said his wife, or I shan't sleep safe in me bed. That hilt is liable to do anything, said Nana, the crafty git. I reckon they don't watch the beach close enough. Hilda could nip ashore off one of them U-boats and would never know he was here till he walked in the front door. And then I'd tell him a thing or two. I haven't forgotten Grandar's best top coat and them two china dogs they'd done for. Mother, said Mr McGill patiently, Hitler wouldn't come on his own. He'd bring his own army. Aye, mevy. I only wish Grandar was twenty years younger. He'd see him off. Do you really think they'll come, Dad? said Chas, thinking of his own personal sleeping German. Well, said Mr McGill in a businesslike way, Hitler can't afford to hang about forever. We're getting stronger all the time. There's all those Canadian soldiers arriving on the newsreels and we're churning out more and more spitfires. Bye. I saw twenty-five all together from the top of the gas holder yesterday, and a grand sight they looked. Spitfires is too fond of flying about all day like paper kites. What about at night? said Nana. They can't stop the Germans then. Mother, the Spitfires cannot see them at night. Don't see why not. The Germans could see the bomb war hoose and spit Grandar's coat. They can't see either. They were aiming for the ships in the river. Why, they're blinder than a drunken sailor then. Mother, that's what I said. Were the Germans really coming, wondered Chas? If so, there'd be use for the machine gun yet. But the gun was broken. Perhaps their prisoner could mend it. He wondered how Clogger and Nicky were getting on. Rudy wakened as from a black pit. Someone had taken off his boots while he slept. He was deliciously warm, and there was a smell of frying. Is your breakfast? He saw a determined face with freckles and a shock of ginger hair. The boy held a plate of fried bread and bacon in one hand and the still-cocked pistol in the other. Rudy took the plate, eyeing the gun nervously, and wolfed the food, and then felt again the call of nature. 
He made appropriate signals, embarrassed because one of the children was a girl. They led him to a clump of bushes well away from the camp and watched him solemnly. He was glad to get back into his bunk. He was sweating, his legs were wobbly, and he had a racking cough. It was as if, having reached a place of safety, his body was exacting payment for what it had suffered. He fell asleep again almost immediately. He's poorly? Aye, he's got the bronchitis, I'm thinking. Do you think he'll die? asked Audrey. Should we fetch a doctor? No, they all chorused. We've got some cough mixture at home. I'll go and fetch it. Day and night ceased to exist for Rudy. Awake, he alternately shivered and sweated, scratching himself where his rucked-up trousers chafed his body. Asleep, he fended off endless spitfires attacking from the blind spot under the tail. The only comfort was an endless succession of tea, cocoa, medicine and soup, and the worried face of the girl-child who spooned them into his mouth. Often, all the children would sit and watch him with that same worried look until he was certain he was dying. The children baffled him. They weren't ordinary children, like those he had played with at the Oberschule before Hitler came. They were too solemn, too adult, except that even adults sometimes laughed. But they were not solemn like those little pigs of Hitler youth, who swaggered everywhere in their swastika armbands and would report you for getting drunk in uniform, or even walking down the street with a tunic button undone. If you criticise the bosses in Germany these days, the last place you did it was in a children's playground. No, these children were strange in that they neither laughed nor quarrelled. Oh, they argued, argued a lot, but they never fell out or walked off in a huff. It was as if they depended on each other like the crew of a bomber, sink or swim together. Of course, they weren't always there. Only two never left. The one with red hair and freckles and a chin like a rock. Nothing would ever shake that one. He was already a man. The other was nervous, with dark, wistful eyes. He jumped at every noise. He was the weak point. The one who, if Rudy was ever to escape, must be tricked, frightened, exploited. But the dark one was a danger, too. For the two boys guarded him alternately, sitting at the far end of the opposite bunk with the still-cocked Luger in their lap. Night and day, whenever he wakened, one or the other was there. They held the pistol so differently. The redhead held it calmly, pointing out of the door, finger clear of the trigger as quietly as a carpenter holds a hammer. But the dark one's fingers played constantly over the whole gun, worrying at it. Lugers had delicate triggers. Even with the safety catch on, they could go off if you dropped them. In this metal box, the bullet would ricochet round like a demented bee till it found somebody's flesh. That gun had to be uncocked for everyone's sake. The times the dark boy held it were no good. He was too jumpy. Rudy must wait till the redhead held it. Stan Little had almost forgotten what it was like to be a school teacher. Every day as he walked past the school, he looked up at the roof. Every day the tail of the bomber mocked him. Workmen had tried stretching tarpaulins across the hole to make the roof watertight. But the wind first waved them like huge flags and then blew them away. Rain dripped from floor to floor ceaselessly. The first week, Stan and the other teachers had salvaged books and globes and wall charts. They organised classes for the school certificate forms in the games pavilions and groundsman's hut. And then they stuck. There were no church halls or cinemas or even churches available to teach in. They were being used as rest centres and soup kitchens for bombed-out families. Life got more and more unreal for Stan. He would stop in the middle of teaching Chaucer to the sixth and remember the Germans. For Stan had actually fought them for three incredible months in 1918. Old Jerry wasn't a comic figure to Stan. Old Jerry was a grey flicker of distant men who killed unerringly and were very hard to kill. Old Jerry was a tattered, faceless corpse on the barbed wire. Mud, stink and exploding chaos. And old Jerry was coming again. Already in Stan's mind's eye, every Garmouth field was pitted with shell holes, every neat terrace a row of eyeless windows, every winter tree not only leafless, but twigless and branchless. It didn't bear thinking about, but Stan could not stop thinking. He watched every newsreel, read every newspaper that might tell him how old Jerry had changed his tricks since 1918. For if Jerry crossed the sea, Garmouth Home Guard, 84 old men and boys, 
would be the first to greet him. Stan lectured them, drilled them, taught them everything he knew. They were keen. But which were worse? The boys who treated it like a lark? Or the old men who had fought on the Somme and the Marne, whose lungs wheezed every time they ran twenty yards? They had rifles. Rifles the Canadian army had packed away in Vaseline because they were out of date in 1912. Rifles the Boer War had been fought with. And a weapon against the invincible panzers, too. A lump of drain pipe with a foresight welded on by the local blacksmith. A pipe that fired rockets when they didn't misfire and drop fizzing out of the front end and making everybody run for it. They had a target, an old car pulled along by a winch. It was plated up with corrugated iron and given a wooden turret with a broomstick gun. They painted swastikas on it and gave demonstrations to the public. Sometimes a rocket actually hit the crawling jerry tank and burst in a shower of blinding thermite and set the wooden turret ablaze. Then the public would clap and cheer and slap each other on the back, saying, Jerry had better not land here. Didn't the fools know that German tanks had armour three inches thick? The home guard was a con to keep the housewives feeling safe in their beds. Yet it was to the home guard HQ that Stan walked every day. It was better than a wrecked school where plaster fell off the walls and rusting desks oozed black water if you touched them with your finger. It had Sandy. That morning, Stan noticed, Sandy had been busy again. A bank of earth had been raked clean, and the legend First Company Garmouth Home Guard had been impressed with whitewashed stones. Morning, sir. Lovely morning. Think it's the day for Jerry? Ah, uh, hmm, said Stan. It was raining. Uh, two letters came for you, sir. A poster from Northern Command about disguised German paratroops. Put it up, said Stan, but he could see it was already up. And an offer of two shotguns from Farmer Moulton at Preston. Sounds good. They are, sir. They are. Came up nicely with a drop of oil. Sandy indicated two new guns in the rifle rack. No ammo, though. But I think I can win some from a mate at the war ag. Told him we were terribly pestered with the rabbits. Sound major, said Stan, in the voice of dismayed approval that he knew Sandy expected. All for the war effort, sir. Jerry could be here by lunch. Can't go over the top of that ammo, sir. And I got a new copy of fire regulations from the castle. He had a spare copy doing nothing, so I won it. Oh, and there's a silly policeman to see you, sir. Stan tramped on upstairs in his thin, shabby home guard uniform. He wore it all the time now. It made him feel better, more ready. The sergeant with a limp was sitting in the company office. Not that machine gun again, said Stan irritably. Afraid so. Two more bits of evidence come up, both trivial in themselves, but go on. First, I found an old complaint in the files from Mary Brownlee, mother of John Brownlee, a mental defective aged 40. And what's he been up to? Getting himself dirty, plastered with clay and mud. His mother, she's a well-meaning body, always tries to keep him nice. Seems she hasn't been able to recently. He comes home whacked, boots soaked. What does he say about it? Can't string two sensible words together. His mother's tried following him. When she does, he just wanders round in circles, keeping clean. But the moment her back's turned, he vanishes and comes back filthy. No clue? One. He's been seen in the company of guess who? Charles McGill? Right. They live in the same street. When he saw Mrs Brownlee watching, McGill sheared off sharpish. What's the other complaint? Even more trivial. Man called Parton, same pattern. Daughter stays out at all hours, comes home filthy. Daughter's name Audrey, red hair? Yes, I've tried questioning her. Won't open her mouth, to me or her parents. They've tried hitting her, I'd guess, but it hasn't got them anywhere. And there's not much else they can do about it. That'd be Audrey Parton of 3A at our school. Yes, and McGill's in 3A, and Jones, his little mate, and the nickel boy who was supposed to be killed by that bomb and the Duncan boy who ran off home to Glasgow, and the brown boy who took that German flyer's helmet is in 3B. It's all too much of a coincidence. Supposed? But surely the nickel boy is dead. Well, if he is, he's the first case I've heard of, of death by bombing that never left a trace, and young Duncan never showed up in any of his old Glasgow haunts. We checked. So? They've got that gun, and they've built a hideout for it. Remember those sandbags that went missing? And Nickel and Duncan are living there, and the others are keeping them fed. I've checked all the families, 
and the girls keep on finding the odd pint of paraffin missing. The partons are some candles short, and the Jones is a hurricane lamp. And there's been nicking from shops. No proof, of course. They're too smart for that. Stan fought down a wave of exasperation with both kids and sergeant alike. Told your inspector about this? The sergeant shrugged. I've tried. Trouble is, Mr McGill keeps on complaining that we're harassing his son. I got a flea in me ear and instructions to lay off the case permanently. And had you been harassing young McGill? We've tried to follow him. No hope. He's on to us, and he's as fly as two monkeys. He's led us a dance for ten miles, and ended up throwing pebbles at tin cans in the river. You might as well try shadowing a seagull. He walks along the tops of walls, gets through holes in hedges a dog couldn't follow him into. Even my youngest constable can't keep up with him. And we haven't got the manpower. The sergeant's voice went into a querulous wail, and it was all Stan could do to keep himself from laughing. How about following the others? They're all the same, even the girl. So why not leave them alone? Another two feet and they'd have killed that old woman in Simpson Street. Can't you think of something, sir? But they know me better than they know you. Oh, let me think about it, Sergeant. The Sergeant got up, relieved. He had dumped the problem on someone else's shoulders, which was all he really wanted. Thanks very much, thought Stan. He decided to go up to the observation platform on top of the mill. He always did that when he needed to think. The home guard shared the Polish binoculars and telephone with the observer corps. There was an observer on duty, purple with cold, his woolly scarf whipping in the drizzly breeze. All quiet? All quiet. No junk as 52s yet. The man laughed abruptly, as if he'd made a poor joke, as abruptly stopped. Junk as 52s? Yeah, haven't you heard? Jerry always uses them to drop paratroopers out of an invasion. Did it in Norway and in Holland. Usually they're disguised as farmers or women, even as Dutch soldiers. They take over roadblocks and bridges and telephone exchanges, radio false orders and raise all hell with the defences. Some of them, they reckon, can speak English better than you or I. But you can always tell the planes that drop them. Junkers 52s, the ones with three engines and corrugated wings. Stan's stomach gave a jump. More sly, Jerry dirty tricks. Who told you this? Stan's voice was sharp with fear. Why, it's common knowledge, sir. Everyone's talking about it. It's just silly rumours. You know it's against the law to spread worrying rumours. It helps the enemy. Stan knew he was being pompous, but he couldn't help it. Suit yourself, said the observer corpsman huffily, and turned his back. Stan stared round gloomily. Can I use the binoculars? Suit yourself? I know damn good for aircraft spotting. Shake all over the blasted sky, I'll bring me own. He tapped a smaller pair slung round his neck. Stan buried his eyes in the great Polish lenses. Twenty times magnification. They must have been hell to use on the deck of a heaving destroyer. But by God, they brought things close. There was the harbour, with its guard boom and guard ship. The castle on its beetling cliff, with the six-inch guns that defended the gar buried deep in its cliff face. The beach, empty of everything but waves washing through the barbed wire and tank traps. Stan sighed comfortably and settled down. It was good to get up here above things for a bit. He moved the glasses across the town. It was fun watching people shopping, sweeping pavements, gossiping, not knowing they were being observed. Why, there was the square where young McGill lived, at that house with the green door. Suddenly he stiffened. Maybe this was the way to trace that blasted machine gun. The ginger boy had the pistol. It looked odd lying across the copy of Beano he was reading. Achtung, said Rudy. Pistola. The blue eyes flicked up, and the black round eye of the Luger. Rudy put up his hands and waved the barrel of the gun aside nervously. The boy watched, a frown on his face. Rudy tried something else. He mimed pulling a non-existent pistol out of his holster. He pretended to cock it, and then pulled the trigger. He made the noise of a pistol exploding and traced the bullet ricocheting wildly round the shelter. First he showed it entering his own body, and then the boy's. Tut, all dead. The boy looked thoughtful. He was worried about it too. See, si, said Rudy, and went through the mime of uncocking the pistol several times slowly. The boy nodded again, but did nothing. He was wondering if this was some escape attempt. So Rudy went through the mime of tying himself to the bunk by the wrist. 
The boy's face brightened. He called something to his friend. The friend came with a bicycle lock and chain. Rudy chained his wrist to the stout upright of the bunk. The boy examined lock and chain closely. He was no fool. Then gingerly he tried to uncock the gun, holding it well away from him, eyes screwed tight shut. Rudy sweated. That way it could go off. Nine, nine! So! He mimed it over and over again. Finally, after great straining, the boy managed it. He grinned, cocked and uncocked it a dozen times, finally leaving it uncocked. Rudy went through another pantomime with a safety catch. When that was accomplished, they smiled at each other. Something attempted, something done. Suddenly they liked each other. The boy pointed at the gun. Pistoli, he asked with a grotesque pronunciation. Pistola, Rudy repeated correctly. Pistola, said the boy tentatively. Yeah, good, said Rudy, and the boy laughed with delight. He pointed to a white enamel mug lying on the floor. Crook, said Rudy. The boy pointed to the hurricane lamp that burned day and night in the shelter. Sturmlampe, said Rudy. Now the other dark boy was laughing too. They played the game all the morning and it was lunch in no time. After that they played the game every day. Rudy looked up from the comic. Was ist Dosprit Dan? His grasp of English was starting to return. If he could make himself word perfect, it would help his escape when spring came. He was feeling stronger every day now. Dan, said Clogger, pointing at the cartoon of the cowboy. Clogger, pointing to himself. Rudy, pointing at Rudy. The German nodded. But Dosprit, was ist das? It came out as Dosprit. Clogger rolled his eyes wildly and tore his hair like a madman. A nutter, suggested Rudy. Nein, uh, no. Clogger began to pace wildly up and down. Ach, yes, said Rudy. But why Dosprit is he? In these stories he is always winning. Everybody laughed. Everybody was there. They didn't feel like guards with a prisoner now, more like a class with a teacher, even a family, especially the little dark one. Every day he sat nearer and nearer to Rudy. Now he was actually leaning against him. There was something wrong with that boy, a terrible need. He moaned in his sleep and awakened crying. The others were very protective towards him. Where were his parents? Killed in the bombing? Give us a song, Rudy, they chorused. Ich hat einen Kameraden. Rudy obliged. He had a creaky voice, but the confined metal of the shelter helped, like singing in the bath. How long since he'd had a bath? The children took up the words of the sad old soldier's song. They sang so sweetly that Rudy was close to tears. What was happening to him? He grew less like a soldier every day, more like a lehrer in some kindergarten. He built up you lot, shouted Clogger. Someone might hear us. They hushed, exchanging furtive glances. Rudy felt part of the plot. Who was on whose side? Had the children no loyalty to the British? Had he any loyalty left to the Germans? If he hadn't been shot down, he'd probably be dead by now. Blown apart in mid-air, or fried, or as full of holes as a colander, and everyone leaking blood, like some he'd dragged from wreckage. It was good in the shelter, playing cards, learning English, plenty to eat if you didn't mind endless corned beef stew. If only he could have a bath. Now the children were arguing again. He turned to listen. I tell you, we can make them work. It's in the Geneva Convention. Ya yeah, bollocks. You can't make a prisoner of war help you against his own people. You can if it's not war work. I know a farmer's got two Italians. They were captured in Abyssinia. They mend walls and milk cows and things. Ya yeah, nuts. Anywhere and large in the fortress is war work. Not building a bog in a storeroom, tis, tisn't. I quite prepared to build a bog em, announced Rudy. It convenient for me will be too. I do not like going out into the bushes on wet nights. Bogs is not war work. It was the longest speech he'd ever made in English. They looked startled. What kind of bog? Oh, the very best kind, are you sure? As they had on farms when I a boy was. Bit a seat, on bucket, and hold her for the paper. We'd have to keep you fastened up by one ankle. That will be in order. And so the bog was built. 
The only underground, bomb-proof bog in the country, they informed each other, except for the Kings and Winston Churchills. The children produced heavy oak doors from the nickel house and a bucket and sandbags, and Rudy enjoyed getting his shirt off and sweating in the early April sun. When it was finished and joined to everything else by a covered trench, even Audrey agreed it was all right. She said her granny, who lived in the country, had one, and said they were all right if properly aired and seen to regularly. Our ventilator, so, said Rudy proudly, patting the sandbagged opening on top. Unto it I will see every morning, but not fit this great drain pipe tied to my ankle, no. Sorry, Rudy, they said, and untied him. They still carried round the pistol, uncocked, but they often left it lying carelessly on one side these days. Rudy fancied he could have reached it twice, but somehow it would have spoiled the building of the bog, and it was a good, well-made bog. What other thing can I make that not war effort is? asked Rudy. And building as the April days lengthened, and no enemies, either British or German, came, was all their joy. The fortress became an intricate network of trenches, tunnels and underground bunkers that threatened to rival the Maginot line. The children, Rudy could only assume, became better and better thieves. Daily they dumped bricks, doors, windows and even coils of barbed wire at Rudy's feet. Rudy did his best with the wire, but he was no infantryman. He stretched it, tangled into the briars and bushes, all round the fortress. Ah, well, said Chas, it'll keep buds of brown out. Chas spent his days carefully lettering two signs to hang on the wire. One for the back, to keep out the British, read, War Department, no admittance, and one for the front, just behind the concealing fence, which had a skull and crossbones and read, Achtung meinen. Everyone, including Rudy, pronounced them very effective. It scare me silly would, if I a poor soldier were. The little dark boy laughed and thrust his arm through Rudy's. That's good, Dad. Hey, Rudy, were you really a fighter pilot? Yeah. And shot down two Spitfires? Rudy groaned. They didn't want that story again, did they? Well, how come you got out of your plane alive? The guns were still firing when it blew up. I tell you a secret. That day I was having a joyride with a friend. I observe I was. Rear gunner, said Chas starkly. Messerschmitt one one oars don't carry an observer. They carry a rear gunner. So? Rudy knew what was coming. So you could mend our machine gun if you wanted to. Huh, said Rudy. He'd have been scared of them once, but not now. What will you do to me if I do not mend it? We could shoot you, said Chas. I, the Geneva Convention, plead. Prisoners of war are never shot. That's right, shouted everyone indignantly, turning on Chaz. Well, we could hand you over to the army. Rudy laughed. So many questions they would ask. Interrogate me with rubber horses and bright lights, like the American movies. I spilled the beans, mate. Everybody laughed. Then Clogger said, We do want the gun mended, though. It's important. Everyone looked at Rudy solemnly. He wriggled uncomfortably. It would be wrong to give children back a gun like that, because they were still children. But somehow he couldn't insult them by saying that, because in another way they were no longer children. We wouldn't fire it, promise, except it... Chas paused and blushed. He had almost forgotten that Rudy was a German. Anyway, we wouldn't fire it, just, just have it. It's our musket. What could Rudy say to save their face? He thought long. I'd do you a deal. I need a boat. You a sailing boat get, I the gun will mend. It was, he thought, the right thing to say, adult to adult. They couldn't possibly get a boat. Chapter 12 Damn this for a game of soldiers, thought Stan Little. He couldn't feel his feet, they were so cold. He couldn't stop the great binoculars shaking. A fortnight off and on he'd watched the house in the square, the one with the green door. Often he'd seen young McGill come out, always with that wary glance round as he left the garden gate. For a fortnight no policeman had tried to shadow the boy, but he was wary by instinct now, like a wild animal. The binoculars had been a disappointment. Things got in their way. Houses, hedges, factory chimneys. Sometimes when the boy vanished behind them, Stan could guess which way he was going. But sooner or later... When he vanished for the third or fourth time, he vanished for good. And Stan had to hand it to him. 
In all the time he'd watched, he'd never seen the boy go the same way twice. This morning, there was a difference. There was someone following. Stan swore, could these policemen never let well alone? Then he saw it wasn't a policeman, but someone quite different. Stan knew two things straight away. McGill had immediately become aware of being followed, though he didn't look round. And the someone different was up to no good. Stan suddenly felt colder than ever, and afraid. Should he rush down and interfere? But how could he hope to catch them? They were a quarter of a mile away already. Hopelessly, Stan continued to watch through his binoculars. Fuffin' fool, thought Chaz. Does he think I don't know he's there? He walked extra quiet, listening to the footsteps behind. They were too light for Fatty Hardy, and that sergeant limped. But the feet wore boots with heel plates. Some eager young copper, perhaps. Chaz grinned with glee. Let's see how good this one is. Let's see if he can get through a hawthorn hedge without snagging his nice serge trousers. Let's see if he can cross a glass-topped wall without turning his backside out. Chaz dawdled along to the hawthorn hedge. There were only two gaps in it, hidden by dead nettles. Chaz walked past the first and suddenly wriggled through the second. Once through, he ran back silently to the first. He peered through it. A pair of large black boots was just vanishing through the second. Chaz scrambled back into the road and streaked off the way he'd come. By the time the copper found the second hole, he'd be a mile away. But half a minute later, the boots were behind him again. Chaz slowed to a walk, saying good morning with great innocence to a friend of his mother's who was pushing her pram. So he was a smart copper, this one. Chaz tried him on the glass top wall, but the copper was equally good at walls. So Chaz gave him the water pipe that spanned the red burn. The red burn was only a foot deep, but full of peculiar and staining red mud. And the water pipe was stickily tarred and only six inches wide. Chaz always ran over it. You kept your balance if you ran fast enough. But coppers always lost their nerve and tried sitting astride. Joy of joys, they often got stuck in the middle. But this copper crossed the pipe on his feet. Must be Scotland Yard, muttered Chaz, getting flustered. They would be expecting him at the fortress. He was already half an hour late. Right. I'll give him the mud flats then. Chas had kept the mud flats in reserve until now. They were a vast swamp by the river below the town, covered at this season with dead white reeds four feet high, and crossed by black oozing streams that sported the unhealthy rainbows of oil patches. What paths there were crossed the streams by sodden rotten planks. They were only used by anglers and small boys, and you had to know them well, for they were the terror of all local mothers. Children had drowned there in the past. The flats were only 200 yards from the Nickel House. I'll be drinking my tea in ten minutes, thought Chaz. He ran across the first bridge, ducked and sped sharp left. Crouching low, he changed direction six more times and then crouched on a dry patch under the skeleton of a wrecked fishing boat. Then he realised uneasily that he'd put himself in a cul-de-sac. There was no way out from the wrecked boat except the way he'd come. Still, he must have lost the policeman pretty thoroughly by this time. He started to giggle and then stifled it. Footsteps were squelching towards him, searching carefully. In another second they'd be on him. Was it a policeman at all? He realised what a lonely place he'd chosen. Only fishermen ever came here, and they only came on Sundays in summer. Rudy wakened and looked at his watch. They'd all slept in this morning. Last night the boys had been overexcited, whispering. Rudy had heard the town clock chime one, through the blackout before he dropped off. Clogger was snoring in the top bunk, loud enough to keep the flies away. Rudy glanced at the bottom bunk, where his guard always sat, and gasped. His moment had come, the moment of weakness he had predicted, and also as he'd predicted. It had come via the little dark boy. Nicky lay full length on the bottom bunk, right arm outstretched, fingers closed loosely round the luger. The pistol lay on the rough tartan rug, not two feet from Rudy's nose. Rudy slipped his wrist out of the cycle chain that should have fastened him to the bunk. He'd perfected that trick weeks ago. He leaned over and took hold of the Luger barrel with two fingers and began to draw it gently towards him. Nicky's finger was just sliding off the trigger when he moaned and tightened his grip. Rudy waited, for he saw with a slight shudder that the foolish nervous one had the gun cocked again. 
and the safety catch off. The footsteps squelched nearer. What was it that was following him? A convict? A murderer? One of the undead that Sems had lived in graveyards? Or one of those awful strange men his mother was constantly warning him never to speak to? Why mustn't one speak to them? Or take the sweets they always offered you? His mother would never say. If he asked his father, Mr. McGill always just shuffled his Daily Express angrily and told him to shut his bloody yap. A head was emerging over the reeds. The sun was behind it, and he could see no more than two protruding ears. The being stopped and looked at Chaz. In a second, all his wild imaginings flew away, and a much worse fear took their place. The being was Bodser Brown. Gently, Rudy tried again. This time the child didn't even moan. The German uncocked the gun, put on the safety catch, and returned it to its rightful place in his holster. Both boys slept on. What now? Should he simply walk out? But that would mean no more food, no more tramp disguise, for his sacks had long since been put to other use. Besides, the moment they awakened, the children were worn the pollet's eye and the army. They'd comb the whole area. He wouldn't get a mile. Silence the children. He couldn't bear to harm them, and tying them up would do no good. In an hour, the others would arrive and release them. Wait till they were all here and tie them all up. He doubted his ability to tie up six in a way that would last half an hour. Use the gun to take charge of the fortress. Hold all six permanent prisoners. Water would soon run out. And besides, four of them would have to return home by dark. Missing children would start a bigger hue and cry than any German airman on the run. The more he racked his brains, the more impossible it seemed. Besides, he realised sadly, he just didn't want to escape. His patriotism towards the fatherland was dead. He tried to coax it back to life, thought of the Fuhrer, thought of his old father and mother and how ashamed they'd be of his cowardice. What would the neighbours back home say? I'd be shot as a deserter if the Fuhrer knew, he mused. But his parents and neighbours and the Fuhrer would never know. At home, by now, he would be a dead hero. His photograph in uniform, draped in black, would be on his mother's mantelpiece, a source of pride. Meanwhile, it was drizzling steadily outside, and he wanted his breakfast. Better a live jackal than a dead lion. But he had the advantage of being both at once. <laughs> he couldn't help laughing. It remained to save the little dark boy's pride. He slid the luger back just as carefully between the outstretched fingers. Then he slid his wrist back again through the chain and yawned loudly. Through his lowered lashes, he watched Nicky awaken and grab frantically at the gun. I'm hungry, announced Rudy. Oh, I could eat a horse too, said Clogger, stretching. My turn to make the tea. Rudy smiled. Life was good. Chaz looked round desperately, but there was no way out except the path Bodza Brown stood astride. Nor was there anything to hit Bodza with. He wrenched at a rib of the old boat, but his hand just slipped on the oozing wood. Next minute he was lying face down on the wet grass with one arm twisted behind his back and Bodza's knee on his neck. He twisted his head, for black water was getting into his nostrils and mouth. Get off, you swine, he snarled. It was a gesture without hope. Poor old Chazzy McGill, crooned Bodzo with evil sentimentality. Where's your brains now, Chaz? He twisted Chaz's arm up tighter. Why don't you shout for help? Go on, shout. Chaz shouted. It couldn't do any harm. Louder, Bodzo twisted Chaz's arm tighter. Louder, he gave another twist. Louder. Nobody came. Right. To business, said Bodza briskly, moving his knee from Chaz's neck to the small of his back. Where's that machine gun? Sod off, gasped Chaz. He gave a vigorous squirm that half threw Bodza off and crawled for dear life. But it only made things worse. He was now hanging face down over a little black stream. And he knew what was coming next. Thank you, McGill, said Bodza. That saved me a lot of trouble. Chaz took a deep breath and closed his mouth as his head was thrust under water. He was under a long time, while his chest swelled and swelled until it felt it would burst. 
then his head was released. He breathed out. He felt Bodge's hand coming down to push him under again before he could breathe in. He moved his head quickly and Bodge's hand slipped. Chaz snatched a breath before he went under again. He felt strangely calm. Chapter 13 After half an hour, Bodza began to get worried. Things were not turning out as usual. Usually by this time, kids were blubbing, begging for mercy, willing to do anything, which made Bodza feel hot and good and squelchy inside. And then he let the kids go. But McGill wasn't like that. He just went on spitting out swear words whenever he had the breath. And once, when Bodza's hand had slipped, McGill had bitten his wrist hard and savage like a dog. Bodza stared, fascinated at the horseshoe of teeth marks in his own precious flesh. They hurt. They seeped blood into the muddy wetness of his arm. Bodza started to fret. The dirty water might turn the wound septic. And now McGill lay silent, motionless, breathing in a funny sort of way. Had he fainted or had a fit? He'd acted so queerly. But Bodza gave his arm a twist. Want some more, McGill? There was no response. Bodza got to his feet, suddenly shaking, terrified. What had he done? Next minute, McGill was up and gone, running now like a small, muddy rat. Bodza roared with rage and pursued, fooled again. McGill crossed the first plank bridge and seemed to fall. Got you, roared Bodza, and made to cross the plank. Chaz twisted round, caught the end of the plank and threw it into the water. Bodza, unable to stop, went into the stream up to his waist. The coldness of the water made him gasp. By the time he'd scrambled out, McGill had crossed the next plank and thrown that in the water too. Bodza gathered himself and crossed the stream in one gigantic leap. McGill ran for his life. He was catching him now. In fact, he'd stopped with his back against a fence. Why? That was the old bombed-out nickel house behind. What was the little rat shouting? Clogger? Why was he shouting clogger? So we start again, McGill. Where's that machine gun? No, he won't. Look behind you. Think I'd fall for that trick, stupid. Perhaps you'd better, said a new voice behind him. Bodza whirled. Clogger, Duncan? But you went home to Glasgow. Some people thought I did, said Clogger grimly. What shall we do with him, Chaz? He's been torturing me to get me to tell about the gun. Oh, he has, has he? Now wait, said Bodza, backing away. It's none of you a business, Duncan. It was a fair fight, one against one. When did you fight fair, said Clogger. He turned to Chaz. It's up to you, Chaz. We can't afford this lad any more. Shall I do him proper? Chaz didn't even think. He was black with hate. Do him proper, he said. It had been a fair fight. There had even been a time when Clogger's nose had streamed red and Chaz thought horror upon horrors he might lose. But Clogger cared no more for his bleeding nose than a fly. He just kept on and on, white, silent, steady as a man chopping wood. He never touched Bodza's face, always hit his body where it wouldn't show, and Bodza was much too keen not to get hurt. So in the end, Bodza was lying on the ground, being very sick. Chaz watched, fascinated, as the green strings of slime trailed from his mouth. Had enough? asked Clogger. Bodson nodded silently. Ah, you've had enough for now. Enough till you get home and blab to your mother that I'm still here in Garmouth and where I'm living and that Chaz knows all about it. You know where the machine gun is now, don't you? And your precious mother will run straight to the police. Bodson's eyes flickered. Clogger had read his thoughts exactly. They'll send you away to Boston, he managed to mumble. All of you, if you tell them, try and stop me. I will. Clogger raised his boot and kicked Bodzer in the ribs three times. It made a terrible noise, like a butcher chopping a leg of lamb. And he kicked him three times more, and three times more. Bodzer was much more sick now. When he looked up, his eyes had changed. He looked as if he understood something he had never understood before. You can put me in Borstal, said Clogger, but you can't keep me there. I'll get out, and when I do, 
I'll come looking for you, Brown. And I'll finish off what I started the day. You understand me, Brown? I'll kill you if I swing for it. Bodza believed him. Chaz, staring in horror, believed him too. This was a clogger he had never known existed. A clogger he had called out. They left Bodza lying and walked back to the camp in silence. Somehow the silence went before them. Sam, Audrey and Carrot Juice just sat and stared. Rudy, pretending to read, watched round a corner of Beano. I'll wash my face, said Clogger loudly, to no one in particular. Audrey poured out hot water without a word. Clogger carefully cleaned the dark, cracked blood off his mouth and chin. Then he looked up at Chaz. You didn't like that, did you? So you'll no be speaking to me any more. You've no time for Glasgow hooligans. Chaz neither looked up nor spoke. He drew in the dust of the floor with the toe of his Wellington boot. Do you want to go run into the police about me as well? Silence. It was you who said to do him proper. I didn't know what doing him proper meant. You didn't he think it meant giving him a clout on the ear and sending him ball into his ma? You didn't he want the police round here in an hour, did ye? Chaz shook his head mutely. Then what other way would ye have shut his trap? Chaz shook his head mutely again. Ah, you're no but a bairn. I'm not a bairn. He ducked my head under the water for half an hour, and I told him nothing. Clogger walked across to Chaz, and tipping his head back by the hair, examined him closely. Chaz was as white as a sheet, with great black rings around his eyes. Clogger let go his hair, and ruffled it with great affection. God, man, you're half drowned. Aye, I guess you're a hard man in your own way, Chassie McGill. Hard on yourself. Chas felt a hot traitor tear start in the corner of his left eye. It was the admiration in Clogger's voice he couldn't bear. Oh, let's have a cup of tea, he said. I'm OK. He proved it by being splendidly sick for the next quarter of an hour. Stan Little knocked on Chas's front door. Mrs McGill opened it. Why, hello, Mr Little. Do you want Charles? You'll have to go up to his bedroom, I'm afraid. He came home a right muck last night. Thick with mud and soaked to the skin. He can't raise his arms above his head this morning. And he looks like someone's been at his eyes with a blackened brush. Expect he's been fighting again. You know what lads are. Half an hour later, Stan knocked on Bodza Brown's front door. Mr Little, said Mrs Brown, I was just thinking of calling the police, but you'll do as well. Bernard came home in a shocking state last night, soaked to the skin and plastered with mud from head to foot. He's been crying all morning. I've had the doctor to him. You should see his poor little ribs, they're black and blue. He won't say a word, but a mother knows. It's those big lads been at him again, that Charles McGill. Oh, I don't know what the world's coming to with all this hooliganism. You should just see his bruises, poor mite. She went on for a very long time, saying the same things over and over again. Finally, Stan gave her a look that stopped her dead. I wouldn't advise the police, madam. I've just come from McGill's house, and he's in just the same state. What's more, your son's far bigger than McGill, and I happen to know he started the business. Stan was amazed how sharp his voice was. He supposed it was the permanent whine in Mrs Brown's voice, a permanent conviction that the world would always do her and hers down the mingy look on her face. But it wasn't her face that Stan remembered as he walked home for tea. It was the two boys' faces. McGill as pale as death, but oddly triumphant. Brown, cowering and hopeless. It was easy to guess who'd won the fight. But there was more to it than that. Something that Stan couldn't put his finger on. Both boys, of course, shut up like clams when he mentioned their injuries. Ah, well, thought Stan. At least I know they haven't killed each other. Then he went back to worrying about German paratroopers. Chapter 14 Nicky was as stubborn as a mule. I never went sailing with my father before the war. Yes, you did, said Sam. You used to boast about it at school, and I saw you out with him once. It was a boat with a red sail. 
He hired that from a fisherman. No, he didn't. You told me he had it in his own boathouse on the river. It got bombed, said Nicky stubbornly. Where was it then? Everyone stared at Nicky in silence. He fidgeted a long time. All right, it's still there, at Pryor's Haven, but the key to the boathouse got lost when our house was bombed. Where was it kept? asked Clogger. We'll find it. They searched the ruined kitchen half the day. At last, Clogger straightened his back, groaned wearily and said, Ah, it is lost, I reckon. We'll have to force the lock on the boathouse door. It's all right, muttered Nicky. I've got the key here. He reached down into his shirt and pulled up a key on a string. For hell's sake, what's the matter with ye? roared Clogger. Are you part of this gang or no? It's my boat, said Nicky. It's my father's boat. He began to snivel. Clogger stared at him. Aye, well, in that case, I'll be away home to Glasgow the morrow. I can't afford to hang around here all my life. You can have the fortress, Nicky, all of it. That's yours as well, and you can sort out Rudy as you think fit. I'll be packing my things. Nicky looked round the others for support. They all stared at the floor. Nicky suddenly felt alone and very frightened. Sorry, Nicky, said Chaz, but we've got to give Rudy that boat, because otherwise he won't mend that gun, and the Germans are coming soon and will need it. Who says the Germans are coming? My dad. He says if they don't come soon, they won't be able to come, and then they'll have to admit they've lost the war. There was a murmur of assent. Everyone knows they're coming. The soldiers dug pits on our soccer field to make their gliders crash. The BBC said Vickers had to ring the church bells when they came. Oh, all right, said Nicky hopelessly. What do you want me to do? Take us and show us where the boat is, said Charles, embarrassed. But I can't go out. People will recognise me. Not in a balaclava helmet, they won't. You'll pass for a slum kid. You're mucky enough. The boathouse lock was rusty, but Clogger had brought an oil can and it yielded at last. They passed into a gloom that smelt of tar, rope and stale water. They pulled the door shut behind them, and there was only light from a little window high up. Half the place was filled with the licking, smacking waters of the river. The other half was full of white boat, yellow masts and red sails. There was a packet of Captain cigarettes on the side bench, falling apart and brown with damp. Nicky could remember his father putting it there. Halfway home in the car, his father had remembered that packet of capstans left behind on the bench, but he'd said, Never mind, we'll pick them up the next time we sail. There never had been a next time. My mother never came here, said Nicky, staring at the cigarettes. She said sailing was a man's thing. The other two boys shuffled awkwardly. I see the boats out of the water. Clogger hefted the boat's weight. Yes, that stops her rotting in winter. I reckon we can manage it. Give us a hand, lads. Slowly they edged the boat in. Chaz was clumsy, and the stone of the jetty scraped the dinghy's white paint. Nicky felt it was his own heart that was being scraped. But in it went. Oh, it's filling up with water, said Clogger in disgust. It's no good, it's rotted. No, no, cried Nicky. It's just that the planks have shrunk apart from getting so dry. Leave her sunk a day, and the seams will close and she'll be fine. She always does that. Next moment he could have bitten his tongue out. He'd had a chance to save his boat, but now it was too late. Can we fit the mast and ropes and things? asked Chaz, curious. Best to do it now. We mightn't have another chance before Rudy goes. So, with heavy-hearted skill, Nicky showed them how, while all the while, just over his shoulder, his father seemed to watch disapprovingly. They went back the next day and the next, and dashing Nicky's last hope, the seams of the dinghy did close and it became watertight. They loaded everything useful in. Audrey added a gallon can of water and some tins of food. Charles brought his own compass. Everything was as ready as it ever could be. Chapter 15 It was not yet midnight, and already it was the worst raid of the war. The door curtain of the Anderson shelter was framed a ghastly orange pink, and even a mile from the river they could smell the burning oil. They've got the docks this time, announced Mrs. Spaulding with mournful satisfaction. Anti aircraft guns barked on and on like a pack of cheated hounds. There were more of them than there used to be, but they weren't making much difference. 
Charles watched fragments of cork dropping off the shelter wall. He counted them as they lay on the floor, anything to keep his mind off things. His mother was knitting with great calmness. That was always a bad sign. Mrs. Spaulding had her ear perilously close to the door curtain, ready to retail the latest piece of bad news as it was shouted from shelter to shelter. Ashington's been hit. There's fifty men trapped by a bomb down the Rise and Sun colliery. South Shields gas hold has been hit. It's burning. Then with a sudden squeak of real fear in her voice, she said, What's that? They all listened. Nothing but bombs and guns. Silly, stupid bitch, thought Chaz. Haven't we got enough trouble without inventing more? What did you think you heard, Mrs. Spaulding? Asked Mrs. McGill icily. She didn't hold with such hysterical goings-on. I thought perhaps I heard the church bells ringing. Perhaps someone's getting married, giggled Chaz. Then his heart froze, for in a lull of the guns, they suddenly all heard the bells, sweet with overtones of Sunday morning and Christmas. But that was long ago. Now bells meant invasion. In Chaz's mind's eye they came, the hard-faced hordes in their cool scuttle helmets, the crawling, irresistible panzers, the lines of stukas like straight bars across the sky. All his childhood they had stormed through the cinema newsreels, jackbooting triumphantly through Vienna, Prague, Warsaw, Paris. Now they would jackboot through Garmouth, followed by the Gestapo. Knocks on your door, people dragged away in the middle of the night, firing squads. A traitorous voice awakened in Chaz's mind. If you behaved yourself, if you didn't resist, if you made friends with them. A hand clutched his stomach tighter and tighter as the adults sat silent and the shelter filled with the queer smell of fear. It must be some mistake, said Mrs. McGill tight-lipped. Nobody answered. It came from up Blythe way, said Mrs. Spaulding. There's plenty of the army up there to deal with them. Again, nobody answered. A clutching hand was spreading from Chaz's stomach. It was groping between his legs now. You couldn't make friends with the Gestapo any more than you could with diphtheria or scarlet fever germs. They were not human. And he wouldn't sit here with the adults shaking, waiting to be slaughtered like cattle. He wanted to fight and die. It suddenly seemed good and clean to fight and be dead. The Gestapo couldn't get hold of you once you were dead. There was the gun. The gun, the gun. He swallowed and controlled his breath. He must seem calm. Mum, I, I want to go to the lav. Not now. His mother opened and shut her mouth like a rat trap. But Mum, I'll wet me cell. And it's alone, Mum. No bummers. The Germans aren't here yet. I'd better go while I can. Mum, I'm bursting. All right, go, screamed his mother. Chaz climbed out of the shelter carefully because his knees were shaking. He walked calmly down the garden path towards the lav. He even remembered to open the lav door and close it with a bang, like he always did. Then he was streaking down the back garden, past his dad's greenhouse. There was a half moon, and he could see the rabbits in their hutches, peacefully eating the dandelion leaves he had gathered that morning, a million years ago. He stopped. The rabbits. They deserved their chance, too. When the Germans came, they would wring their necks and eat them for sure. He turned back. He opened the greenhouse door, and then the hutch doors, one by one. The rabbits leapt down and onto the moonlit lawn, sniffing curiously at their newfound freedom. And then Chaz was gone through the bushes, running for the fortress. What can we do? cried Mrs. Jones, wringing her hands ineffectually. Oh, those stormtroopers, they rape young girls, said Miss Jones breathlessly, hugging her small and neat bosom protectively, as if the SS were already on the doorstep. But old Cemetery Jones stood as firm as a rock. I've been getting ready for this day a long time, he said heavily. It's taken thought, but I've done it, and no one the wiser. Come on, missus, fetch your valuables. Come on, you kids, fetch those blankets. Where are you going, Cecil? Are you mad? We're going to the graveyard, woman. Mrs. Jones shrieked, but Cemetery Senior took her hand firmly and led her out of the Anderson, round the cemetery lodge and out among the tombstones. The guns were silent. The bells still chimed. The moon rode high, and the angels on the graves flickered white as they passed. Sam and his sister followed with the blankets, mesmerized. A larger bulk loomed up, a marble block as big as a garage, with white ionic columns and marble urns on top. 
It had a huge bronze double door. The Irving tomb, announced Old Cemetery in his best undertaker's tones. Those doors is best bronze and three inches thick, and the marble's best quality and two foot thick. Stop a Howard, so that would. He fished in his pocket and produced an elaborate bronze key, which he thrust into the double door. But, screamed Mrs. Jones, what about them dead Irvins? Moved them in with the Ibbotsons three months ago. People must learn to accept smaller accommodation in an emergency. I've got it very nice in there, missus, just as you like it. Bit of carpet on the floor, mattresses on the slabs instead of coffins, plenty of tin food, even a picture on the wall. God love us, said Mrs. Jones, and she let herself be guided in by the light of his torch. I suppose it's better than the Germans. An old damp smell came out of the tomb and tickled the end of Sam's nose. He didn't like it, didn't like it at all. Fastened up in the dark, not knowing what was happening outside. And that smell. In the end, he didn't make any decision. His legs started working of their own accord. Suddenly, he was running for the cemetery wall, hurdling gravestones and flower pots like some Olympic sprinter, heading for the fortress. Come back, you young fool, shouted Sam Senior, waving his torch around in increasingly wide arcs. But he was no sprinter, and his son had vanished. He still had two to care for, and two was more important than one. He went back to his wife, muttering, Young fool, just when I had everything so nice and comfortable. Daddy, where are we going? asked Audrey. Shut up and get those garage doors open. Mr Parton was panting, even before he began pulling the starting handle of the big black car. But where are we going, Daddy? Mr Parton swore a string of oaths previously unheard by his family. Stop that language in front of the children, Bertie, said his wife, already comfortably settled in the back of the car. In her best fur coat, she almost filled the back seat. Her arms were full of hat boxes. Young Bertie peeped from under her elbow, white-faced and open-mouthed, but wearing his school cap. Shut up, you stupid cow, roared Mr Parton, swinging on the starting handle like a dervish. The car jerked into backfiring life. Right, in! Mr. Parton flung Audrey roughly into the front passenger seat and slammed the car door shut. He got behind the wheel and fumbled for the car lights button in the dark. The windscreen wiper started working. Daddy, where are we going? To your Auntie Emily's in Westmoreland. But why? Because the faffin Germans are coming, that's why. You mean the invasion? Well, I don't mean flaming Guy Fawkes night. The car jolted out of the garage and turned left too sharply, scraping the offside wing on the gatepost. But Winston Churchill said we were to stay put if the Germans invaded, otherwise we'd block the roads for the army, like the French refugees did. Damn Winston Churchill, he's safe enough. He'll be flying to Canada now with the royal family. He doesn't care about us, so why should we care about him? But nobody else is leaving. Well, they ain't got cars, have they? They ain't got petrol. Eight quid for eight gallons that cost me on the black market. That's a week's wages. But, Daddy, we're running away. Shut up, will you? The car took a corner dangerously on two wheels. Audrey looked out miserably. She liked doing what was right, and this wasn't. It wasn't patriotic either. How would she face her friends at school when it was all over? The Partons, the only family who ran away. Her friends. The fortress. Stop, Daddy! Look, look! There was a squeal of brakes and the car stopped with a suddenness that shot Mrs Parton and her hatboxes painfully forward. What the hell? shouted Parton, but the door on Audrey's side was swinging open, and she was gone. She ran and ran, not looking where she was going, but not running away from the enemy. She ran till she tripped and fell, then lay low. In the distance she could hear her father shouting and swearing at her. It sounded as if now he really hated her. She kept silent, tears in her eyes that were not from her fall. Her father called and called, but finally she heard the car doors slam, and the car move away. She got up and realised where she was. Limping and sobbing, she headed for the fortress. In the Brownlee shelter, Mrs Ridley sat keeping an eye on Mrs Brownlee, and Mrs Brownlee sat keeping an eye on her son John. He's badly tonight, said Mrs Brownlee. John's green eyes roved round and round the shelter, never stopping for a minute. His great hands wrestled with each other over and over. 
Every so often he would start to his feet, and it took all the women's efforts to make him sit down. They had tried all the usual ways to pacify him, cups of tea, sandwiches, but even his favourite penny lollipops had little effect. Two lay half-sucked on the floor. It was like being fastened up with a terrified elephant. Mrs Ridley was afraid of the Germans. Mrs Brownlee was afraid of what the Germans would do to her son when they caught him. She knew very well what had happened to mental defectives in Germany. One lethal injection solved the problem. John was simply afraid. He could smell the fear in the air, his mother's fear. But he could never understand where the fear was coming from. He could no more understand about tanks and stormtroopers and bombers than he could have understood a maths problem. To him, the whole world had become terrified. Like an animal, he wanted to run and bury himself in a black hole. But he didn't have a black hole to run to. Another bomb dropped very close. It did no harm to the shelter, but it burst the sandbags that protected the shelter door like paper bags. The earth from them trickled through the door, under the blackout curtain, and formed a little pile on the floor. John reached forward and began to shovel it out again with his hands. As he did so, it triggered off a memory. There was another shelter where he had shoveled earth with his hands, but that shelter had been full of laughter and fun and children who were kind. That was the safe place he must run to now. He reared up to his great height and put a foot out of the door. Outside, the guns took up their furious song, and clouds of shrapnel whistled down. No, John, no! Where are you going? Come back! The two small women flung themselves onto him, but he roared and flung them off. Where are you going now? He roared in triumph, and was gone. Mrs Brownlee picked herself up. Don't go out there, love, gasped Mrs Ridley. I've got to. He'll hurt himself. At the end of the square, John paused. He didn't know where the marvellous happy shelter was. And then he saw something shining on a doorstep ahead. Somebody had put out their milk bottles for the morning. John knew he had to pick up the bottles. That was the way to the happy place. Pick up the milk bottles and follow the boy round to the right. Then turn left. John thundered on. And after him, terrified but faithful, Mrs Brownlee followed at a distance. Chas? Chassy? Mrs McGill wandered from room to room of her darkened house. An answering call came from the front upstairs bedroom. She opened the door. Two figures sat by the open window, in silhouette against the circling searchlights. Chassy? The figures turned. No, it's me and Grandar, love. It was Nana. What are you doing? Why aren't you down the shelter? Mrs McGill nearly lost control of her voice and regained it with an effort. Grand and me's waiting for the Germans, Hinny. I've got the bread knife and he's got the carving knife and I've got me bottles handy. She pointed to a row of pop bottles on the windowsill. What's in those? Oil of vitriol, Hinny. That'll burn their thieving faces off. I can just reach them if I throw from here. But they'll shoot you. Aye, well, they can shoot us both together. Forty years we've had and they're not separating us into those consecration camps at our age. Well, go together... Sink or swim. Grandar coughed rackingly. Hey, man, wrap yourself up better. You'll catch your death. Nana rearranged the mufflers round his neck and straightened his cap. You should be in bed, Grandar, said Mrs McGill. Nay, lass, I'll face them buggers on me feet like I always did. Chassie's run off somewhere and I can't find him. He said he was going to the lav, but he's gone. And he's let his rabbits out all over the garden. I can't catch them. They're eating all the spring cabbages. He'll be off to the fighting, maybe, said Nana placidly. McGill's always went to the fighting young. Grandda he volunteered to fight the Boers when he was only sixteen. Oh, Nana, he can't have, Mrs McGill was screeching now. Rest yourself, Hinny. If the Germans don't come, he'll be home by morning. And if they do, he'll have as much chance as anybody else. She settled herself comfortably. She was wearing her best hat and coat because the Germans were riffraff and had to be kept in their place. Mrs McGill ran downstairs. Where could she look? What should she do? Chapter 16 It was a wild scene from the top of Billings Mill.
clouds boiled across the moon, and black smoke boiled lower and in a different direction across the clouds. Three observer corps were on duty. One side of their steel helmets gleamed blue with the moon, and the other side red with fire. Stan Little, more than anyone in Garmouth, could see what was happening. Dock fires were spreading. A tall black crane stood out in silhouette. A pink flush to the north would be blithe, and a fainter glow to the west would be Newcastle burning. Below him, the mill was plunged in darkness. Had a bomb knocked out the electricity cables, or was there sabotage? Why had the searchlights at the castle suddenly gone out half an hour ago? He felt the solid reassurance of Sandy move up behind him. All small arms issued, sir. All personnel have reported and been sent to their place of duty. Stan reached for the left-hand phone, a landline to the single concrete pillbox that guarded the coast road bridge a mile away. Hello, hello, hello. For God's sake, Sergeant Mullins, answer the phone correctly. Uh, uh, sorry, sir. Number one post here, sir. Everyone arrived? All but one's dyke, sir. Uh, wait on, sir. He's just turned up, sir. Got your pickets out? Yes, sir. Anything moving? Uh, one or two cars tried to cross the bridge. Civvy refugees, sir. Turned them back, sir. But they're just going round by the other road. Any news your end, sir? Nothing. Keep alert. Yes, sir. The sergeant was reluctant to go. He sounded pretty lonely. Stan rang number two post, a sandbag cottage over the docks. Pretty hot down here, sir. Nothing moving but fire brigade and rescue. Number three post on the coast north of the castle reported an empty beach. Stan tried to ring the military at the castle. The female operator said all the lines to the castle were in use. She was half hysterical, but shouting at her only made her worse. Was she really hysterical or faking it? She sounded a bit foreign. When Stan asked her where she came from, she said Gateshead and burst into tears. Only the tears didn't sound like real tears. Oh, hell, thought Stan. I'll be imagining German paratroopers under my bed next. Why not try Royal Navy Blythe, sir? suggested Sandy. I thought the first church bells came from that direction. Been a lot of gunfire up that way, sir. Good landing area for troops, sand dunes, farm beaches. Stan tried the operator again. She was still sobbing but she managed to get R.N. Blythe. Garmouth Home Guard here, Blue Flash. Stan gave the password of the week. Hello, old chap. What's all this Blue Flash lark, then? The hair on the back of Stan's neck prickled. Why didn't R.N. Blythe know the password? The smooth voice at the far end droned on. Blue Flash was last week, old son. Password's red sun this week. It's Sunday night, you know. Password changes 1800 hours Sunday. The voice spoke perfect English. Superior, sneery, too perfect English? Like Lord Haw Haw? Stan shouted, I know damn well the password changes 1800 Sunday. Last week's was Black Stone, this week's is Blue Flash. Let's have a look. <laughs> Dear me, old lad, you're quite right. My mistake. It's all this racket outside. Can't hear myself think. Where did Red Sun come from then? shouted Stan angrily. Must be next week's, mustn't it? said the voice. A trifle uneasy now. But we're never told next week's till the Wednesday. Well, someone's dropped a clanger then, haven't they, old chap? The voice was almost a caricature now, sounding falser every minute. A foreigner's idea of a public school drawl. Who are you? roared Stan. The telephone line suddenly went dead. Stan shuddered. Had he given the code word to enemy paratroopers? Mr. McGill spoke slowly and clearly down the phone. Two houses demolished in Emily Street. Gas main fractured, gas burning block and street. Possibly three people trapped in wreckage. At least one still alive. Access by back lane leading from Morton Street. He put down the phone, wiping his eyes wearily. When he looked up again, his wife was standing there looking like a ghost. Maggie! The bands ran off somewhere. He ran off when the bells went. I can't find them. Come and help me look. The burn, he said steadily. Why's the burn run off? Her face crumbled before his eyes. First the mouth began to shake, and her eyes crinkled up. Then tears began to stream down her pale cheeks under the blue headscarf with the birds on it. He'd never seen her like this. Another damaged report was slapped in his lap, hurriedly scrawled in indelible pencil on the back of a damp cigarette packet. He picked up the phone to Area HQ again. The report was hard to decipher. Boy lying injured in the front garden of 11 Wimbledon Turret. No, 
That should be 17 Wimbledon Terrace. 17 Wimbledon Terrace. Yes, it's off Mendip Road, second on the left going towards the river. Boy cannot be moved. Suspected fractured spine. Ambulance essential. He put down the phone. His wife had collapsed, sobbing over the operations table. He shook her by the shoulder timidly. Stop it, Hinny. It mightn't be him. He might be all right. She raised a face to him he didn't know. Stretched, mad. Her hands reached for his shoulders like claws. Come and look. Come and help me. Help me. Help me. I don't know what to do. Mr. McGill looked round desperately. His assistants were watching. One had a new damage report in his hand. Mr. McGill took it automatically and picked up the phone. Outbreak of fire in a warehouse in Dock Road. Building contains bales of cloth. No noxious fumes as yet. Fire in danger of spreading to nearby paraffin store. Dock Road blocked by rubble. Access by... His wife's shoulders were blocking the access map. He couldn't see where the access route was. For God's sake, get this woman out of here, he shouted, as if she were some common stranger. His voice was hard as stone. Two wardens hauled Mrs. McGill to her feet. Hey, steady up, missus, said the older one awkwardly. They half dragged her to the doorway. She turned and looked at her husband. Your own bairn and you wouldn't look for him. God forgive you, for I never shall. And she fled, sobbing into the night. Mr. McGill was seized with a wild urge to run after her, but the phone rang and steadied him. Fire engine gone to Dock Road, he said to his assistants in a whisper. One of the other wardens stuck a red pin in the map. Nobody looked at Mr. McGill. He felt very lonely, but quite determined to stay on that phone till the Germans shot it out from under him. Time to go, Rudy, said Clogger, but he really meant time to mend the gun. Rudy glanced round all the familiar faces, but they were no longer familiar. Clogger held out the greasy cloth with the machine gun parts wrapped in it. Rudy hesitated. It was wrong to put such a gun into the hands of children. But what was right tonight? His own people were invading. He had heard the bells. He was confused. These hordes descending on the Blythe beaches, were they friends or foes? These children preparing to try to kill them, were they foes or friends? Rudy no longer knew. He was muddled. Too weak and muddled to resist the oily cloth thrust at him. The children's air of expectancy. He bent in the lamplight and fitted the parts back into the gun. What Clogger had struggled with so many hours was the work of a minute. He cocked the gun and pulled the trigger on an empty breech. It was done. So that's how you cock it, said Chaz. That's what we did wrong. We forgot to re-cock it. His voice sounded glad, excited. Now, who'll take Rudy to the boat? I will, said Nicky. Everyone shook hands quickly. Nobody looked at anybody else. Nicky's and Rudy's footsteps faded into the night. The silence was awful. Let's sing quietly, said Audrey. The song they sang was Ich hat einen Kameraden, and a lot of tears were surreptitiously flicked from faces. The telephone from number two post rang. Everybody on the roof of Billings Mill jumped. Sergeant Watson here, sir. Yes. Uh, do we search everyone who passes us, sir? There's a terrible lot of people on the road, walking with bundles, heading towards Newcastle, most of them. Yes, stop and search everybody. Try and turn them back if you can. They'll only block the roads and spread panic. We don't want it like France, do we? Right, oh, sir. Stan hung up and rubbed his bristled cheeks. He felt stiff and painful. Three hours had been waiting and still no definite word of the invasion one way or the other. The telephone exchange had stopped answering altogether. Hit by a bomb, captured by the enemy, or just choked with calls. What about us taking the van and running down to the castle, Sergeant Major? They might know something definite. I'd like to, sir. Only, well, aren't there enough folk flying around like paper kites already? I think we'd be better just sitting tight and doing our job. Something might happen at one of our posts the moment we turned our backs, sir. That's the hardest part of any battle, sir. Sitting and waiting, with respect, sir. Sandy clicked his heels together. Carry on, then, Sergeant Major, said Stan. God bless you, Sandy, he thought. God bless your simple heart. Mullins here, sir. Jerry's come, sir. At least I think he has. Can you come quick with all the lads you've got, sir? 
They got the twelve men of the reserve into the tiny van somehow with a desperate clatter of rifles. Stan drove, thinking about number one point. It was a good, solid concrete pillbox. A platoon which held it was the strongest platoon. Thirty-two men with old Canadian rifles and an ancient Lewis machine gun, the pride of the company. With fourteen extra, we can make some kind of show, thought Stan. But why can't I hear any firing? They pulled up by the silent pillbox with a squeal of brakes. Mullins was waiting. The men leapt out quickly and took shelter behind the pillbox, glancing round the corners nervously. Which way are they, Mullins? On the road, sir. Beyond the bridge. In lorries they are, sir. About two or three hundred strong. Ten lorries and a command car, anyway. They've got out and are lounging about. Mr Whitelord's talking to the fellow who seems to be in charge. Talking? They're trying to bluff their way through, I reckon. They can't know how little we've got inside this pillbox, can they? And they're coming from the direction of Newcastle towards the coast. Part of their bluff, sir. Isn't that what you do? How do you know they're Germans? They're foreigners for sure. You should hear them babble. And they haven't got no movement order. Mr Whitelord asked them for that straight away. All the while, Stan, Sandy and the sergeant had been walking across the bridge to the trucks. British Army trucks, said Stan. They captured plenty of Dunkirk, sir, said Sandy. British uniforms, said Stan. But they're not wearing them British style, said Sandy. Too sloppy. No backbone. Two figures stood in the middle of the road, arguing violently. One was Mr. Whitelode, the other... Well, he certainly wasn't British. A heavy black moustache swooped to the corners of his mouth. Eyebrows equally heavy drooped to high cheekbones. His accent was heavy, and his gestures dramatic. I'm glad you've come, sir, said Whitelode, a bespectacled ex-public schoolboy with flat feet. This officer says he's a major, uh, um... Kozlowski. Stanislaus Kozlowski, Major. Polish Free Army, at your service. His jackboots clicked loudly together. The salute was like something in the movies. A handshake like a bear's. I am bloody marvellously amazed to make your acquaintance, Colonel. What are you chaps doing on the move without a movement order? We no wait for any bloody movement order. Germans come is enough. We go kill bloody Germans. Do we need a killing Germans order also? Poles can kill Nazis without orders. Look, old lad, if everyone goes off half cock without orders, we shall have chaos. <laughs> oh, yes, Englishman. You want everything nice and neat, like your bloody private edges, like your wife's kitchen at home. My wife not at home. Wife and children is dead, rode out of Warsaw. Nazi fighter shoots them into very small bits. Not neat, eh? I'm sorry, said Stan, getting cross. But he was really starting to wonder if this could possibly be the hyper-efficient German Wehrmacht. I take you to my general, announced the moustached man, dragging Stan in a bear-like hug down the road. General Prince Gerard Novicki. Stan didn't even try to struggle. It would be too undignified. General Prince Novicki, standing in the pale moonlight, was like a figure out of a musical comedy, with a four-cornered peak cap, riding cape, and pale aristocratic profile. The man stood only five feet tall, and must be seventy if he was a day. My dear Captain Liddell, and you are of the British Home Guard, I see, and you hold this bridge most stubbornly, even against your allies. Stan felt ashamed. The Germans could never have invented him. How can we settle our differences, Captain? Let us go to your HQ, and leave our stout fellows here to guard each other. I shall make sure mine do not open fire first. He called out orders in a foreign language, not loud, but silvery, so they carried over the noises of that night. Let us drive to your HQ in comfort, in my car, Captain. Stand fast, Mr. Whitelode, muttered Stan, as he was led away. He felt outwitted somehow. Fatty Hardy had the situation well in hand. The main problem was to stop German parachutists and saboteurs getting down Savile Street. After all, it was the main street of Garmouth. It hardly occurred to him that saboteurs might prefer to sneak down back lanes. Anyway, he couldn't be responsible for everything. So it was there he made his stand. He requisitioned three passing special constables to help him, and luckily one had a car. With a car, they blocked Savile Street, leaving only a three-foot space to get past. In this space, Fatty set a table and chair from a bombed house, and on the chair he placed his own ample bottom. The light from a nearby burning house gave enough light to read people's identity cards. Then two soldiers home on leave turned up with their rifles. 
really thought Fatty, it was the perfect setup. It was. A queue of refugees rapidly formed. Three fire engines on their way to fires were unable to get past because their crews couldn't produce identity cards. They departed with such streams of language as German saboteurs could never have achieved. It was just after this that Rudy and Nicky ran round the corner and slap into the queue. In fact, they tried to hurry past before they realised it was a queue. Hey, get in line there. Who do you think you are? growled a big man, carrying a clothes basket full of blankets and tinned food. Everyone turned and stared at them. They retired to the end of the queue. Let's run, whispered Nicky. Rudy took the child's hand. It was as cold as ice and shaking violently. Let's walk, said Rudy. He managed to keep calm for the boy's sake. But when they turned away, a soldier with a fixed bayonet turned them back. Get in the queue, you. If you've got no to hide, you've got no to fear. He waved his bayonet in their faces. He was wild with fright like everyone else. Fatty Hardy made a fuss about everybody as they came up to his table. Identity cards were not enough. They had to turn out their bundles, say where they were going. People swore at him and he swore back. It got tenser and tenser. And the queue in front of Rudy and Nicky got shorter and shorter. What shall we do? whispered Nicky. And nothing is we can do. Those soldiers, they will shoot us if we run. Only thing to do is for you to leave comb of my hand. On your own you are safe. Be sensible, hein? But Nicky clung to Rudy's hand all the tighter. Then it was their turn at the table. Identity cards? Rudy's tongue clove to his mouth. Hurry up, identity cards. Fatty Hardy squinted up at them. He was sweating. Rudy felt Nicky take a huge breath. We ain't got none, said Nicky. He spoke like a ragamuffin. In his tattered balaclava helmet, even his own schoolmates wouldn't have recognised him. Shut up, kid. I'm talking to your dad. M me dad's deaf and dumb. Nicky clutched Rudy's hand tighter still. We we're going to see if, if me gran's all right. What's your name? Webster. Where do you live? Simon Street. But Simon Street's down there. Fatty Hardy jerked his thumb towards the silent road beyond the barrier. Rudy felt Nicky catch his breath. No, it, 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 it's me gran lives in Simon Street. Fatty Hardy glared at Rudy hard. I never heard of no dumby down Simon Street, and I only live three streets away. Hey, there's something fishy here. What you two up to? The two soldiers, hearing the urgency in the policeman's voice, closed up with their bayonets. Rudy closed his eyes. And then there was a faint shout of, Help! Everyone turned. A huge figure was approaching, running with flailing arms and wide-open mouth. A little woman ran close behind. It's John! gasped Nicky. The flailing figure ran straight through the queue, scattering people like ninepins. It crashed into the car's bonnet with a whoosh of breath. Grab him, shouted Fatty Hardy. Two special constables leapt in and grabbed John's arms. He bellowed like a bull and threw them off. Then he threw over the table at which Fatty Hardy was sitting. Hardy grabbed at him. Men ran to help, and the table collapsed under a scrum of struggling bodies. One man leapt out with a bleeding ear. He bit me! The nazi swine! Mrs Brownlee stood wringing her hands. Oh, please don't hurt him. He's gentle as a lamb. Don't frighten him. At last they hauled John to his feet and Fatty Hardy slipped a pair of handcuffs on him. Oh, please, he's not a Nazi, wailed Mrs Brownlee. He's just our John. Fatty Hardy looked at the heaving, gibbering figure. Where are you going now, said John. Where are you going now? By heck, it is that idiot from the square. He's gone nuts. Looney bin for him, missus, straight away. Get him in the car. Oh, no, please. I can handle him. He's quiet as a lamb, usually. Tell that to the doctor at Morpeth, missus. Rudy felt a tug at his hand. Come on, muttered Nicky. Nobody noticed them go. Nicky swung back the river door of the boathouse. Use your oars till you get clear of the castle cliff, he said. And then pull on this rope to raise the big sail. The little one's more complicated, but it's not so important. Right, said Rudy, clambering down into the dinghy. It rocked alarmingly to his landlubber's feet. He settled down and unshipped the oars. Thanks a lot, Nicky. A clever trick it was, telling the pullets I was your deaf and dumb dad. I thought I a dead man was. Rudy? 
Yeah? I wish you were my dad. Can't I come with you? Rudy could hear the tears in his voice. Nein. Where I go, no place for you is. I could sail a boat for you. I'm an expert, honest. Only the boat's going, and you're going, and there's nothing left. Nein, Liebling, there is much left. Your comrades, your gun, your country. But I like you better. Better even than my father. And I you. But we both our duties have. Perhaps I see you after the war. Then we all comrades be, eh? The boy began to cry uncontrollably. There was nothing to do but push off into the night, leaving the sobs to dwindle. The moon was very bright, the rollocks noisy, and the guardship on the boom very near. Rudy found the oars hard to manage. The boat kept on turning towards the guardship. They must see me soon, Rudy thought. But overhead a fresh wave of bombers roared in. The AA guns roared, and every eye on the guardship turned skyward. Rudy looked up at the black planes with their tiny wing crosses, twisting and bouncing in the searchlight beams. Poor bastards. Then he looked at the burning docks and repeated, Poor bastards. War seemed very stupid. But he rode on, trying to be a hero. There was nothing else to do. As soon as he rounded Castle Cliff, he felt the wind. He raised the sail and headed northeast. If there was an invasion, that was where the German fleet would be lying. A light breeze filled the sail, and the water chuckled under the bow and stern. At the mill, the General Prince graciously took a chair, neatly crossing his tiny riding boots, while Stan got put through to the Northern Command HQ at York. Northern Command, General Wilberforce's staff, said a voice in lazy Oxford English. A Garmouth Home Guard here, Blue Flash. Yes, OK, Blue Flash, far away, Stan explained his problem. The languid voice on the far end groaned. Oh, God, not in a Vicky's lot again. A little fellow with a comic opera fancy dress. Oh, yes. That Polish army, all right. <laughs> and don't I know it. What have they been up to now? Stan told him. But there isn't any German invasion. Every radar screen's been clear all night. Some short circuit in a police telephone box at Blythe started the bell ringing, and it's all snowballed from there. God, what a bloody fuss about nothing. Tell them Vicky to pack up and go home. He's wasting petrol. You tell him, said Stan. Now it was all over, he felt unbearably weary. Put him on, then. General Novicki listened, head cocked like a bird. Ah, so. But I will just go and look for myself round Blythe. Better is safe than sorry. That's the last of your month's petrol ration, quacked the voice on the phone piercingly. If German come, we find more, No. No, Vicky put the phone down with a cherubic smile. In Blythe, we for Germans will look. But a drink to you and your brave chaps before we go, Captain Siddle. Little, said Stan. The General Prince produced a flask and two glasses. The drink burnt Stan's mouth like flame. He was vaguely aware that the Prince smashed his glass into the fireplace and was gone. With a throat like a nutmeg grater, Stan picked up number one phone and told Sergeant Mullins the convoy could go through. Rudy came awake with a start, and he was still in the dark in his little boat. He must have dozed off. It had got so peaceful. Peaceful and cold. He looked back towards the shore. The guns had stopped. The bombing had stopped. The pink fires over the gar were dying down. In the other direction, where the German invasion fleet should be lying off Blythe, there was simply darkness. Suddenly Rudy knew there was no invasion. His nearest fellow German was 300 miles away. It had all been British hysteria. He was more alone than he had ever been. He held on towards Germany for half an hour, while his feet and hands turned slowly numb. Finally, he swore, swung over the tiller, and reversed course back to Garmouth. Cold heroism was not in him. He was going home to the fortress.
Chapter 17 In Garmouth, the hysteria died as the bombing died. The truth of no invasion spread as quickly as the false rumour had done. It was suddenly a working Monday morning and raining. Fatty Hardy puffed indignantly to himself as he pedalled his bike up the Blythe Road. As if false invasions weren't enough, four silly kids had to go missing. Four sets of panicking parents were raising hell at the police station. Fatty had been told the kids' names over the phone, but he hadn't really listened. What he had grasped was that he'd been given the heath to search, right down to the sea, a square mile of dense grass all on his own. After being up all night, he'd not get home till tea time. Hello? What was this? Soldiers? Lots of soldiers in lorries? Aha! Uh -huh. If he could persuade them into helping, he could be home for breakfast in an hour. He held up the authoritative arm of the law. The convoy ground to a halt. A heavily moustached face peered out of the leading car. Constable, the best of good mornings. How am I bloody able to help you? Foreign soldiers? Fatty glanced at the man's shoulder flash. Ah, the Polish Corps, the Polskis. Well, better than nothing. They had two eyes each anyway, he explained. Ah, yes, helping we most certainly will. We form a line down to the beach, huh? And sweeps towards the bombed house, huh? Yes, my men could doings with their walk. They are cooped up all night. We find no jerrys nowhere. I tell General Prince Novicki and we are starting. The Poles fanned out rapidly. They carried their weapons from habit. They started. Far off across the heath, the nickel house rose from its necklace of winter trees. Chaz came to with a gasp, his chin resting on the rough weave of the sandbags. At first he was ashamed at having fallen asleep, but then he saw all the others had fallen asleep too. He was as stiff as an old horse. His tummy rumbled loudly. Like the others, he had spent half the night eating anything he could lay his hands on. Eating and swallowing stopped you feeling sick all the time. What had they talked about? What it was like to be hurt. What it was like to be dead. There had been a stupid argument about God, which had ended in Nicky attacking Sem, and the usually calm Sem fighting back viciously. Audrey had declaimed the Agincourt speech from Henry V, which she had learned by heart, and everyone had yelled it was stupid rubbish, then she had burst into tears. What an awful, stupid night. He looked out of the firing slit. Everything was still, silent. The world felt totally empty. Where are the Germans, he thought. God, has everyone run away and left us? It was the dawn of a new day, though not a bright one. Mist lay thick on the grass of the heath, all the way down to the sea. And then Chaz moaned. Out of the mist, lines of soldiers were walking. Their uniforms looked grey, and they called to each other in a harsh foreign language. Hundreds and hundreds of them. Clogger! Carrots! Wake up! They've come! Jerry's here! They leapt into life, hearts thumping like engines. Clogger grabbed the Luger and leapt out into the trench. Sam grabbed the air rifle and leapt the other way. Nick grabbed the magazine for the gun. Lord, yelled Chaz. Cock! Range! A eye up to the white fence, shouted Clogger. That's 350 yards. 300. Go on, said Chaz. I've paced it a dozen times. Your puny pace is no a yard, said Clogger firmly. Tis so. And Chaz set the sight firmly at 350. He never realised the Germans used metres. He lay down and put his eye carefully to the sight, wriggling his shoulders to get comfortable. He watched the first man come up to the fence. Hey! Fatty Hardy's with them, pointing things out to them. He's a quesling, shouted Clogger. Perhaps he's their prisoner. I can't help that. Fire before they're right on top of us. The gun roared and slammed in Chaz's hands. When the smoke cleared away, there wasn't a man to be seen. I can't have killed them all, he thought. And then, all along the ground where the Germans had been, came little winking flashes of fire. Fatty Hardy felt bemused. One minute he'd been walking along feeling very important, and next he was lying face down in a muddy little stream where someone had pushed him. Hey, what's the game? he spluttered, starting up. A brawny Polish arm knocked him down again. He brings down. Germans! Another flight of bullets sang overhead. Then the Poles were firing back, a tremendous booming din. 
Sand and rock splinters spouted from the area in front of the nickel house. Under cover of the fire, groups of Poles were crawling forward at amazing speed, cradling their rifles between their flailing elbows. Hey, stop that shooting, said Fatty Hardy. You'll kill somebody. That is our work, killing Nazis, said Major Koslovsky placidly. But there ain't no Germans. What are these shooting at us then? Boy Scouts? His paratroopers landed. The Major shouted further orders. Another flight of bullets passed overhead. The Nazi fools are shooting too high. Soon we have them. One hand grenade and boof. Then abruptly the firing stopped. Hardy looked up. A scarecrow figure waving a dirty white flag on a twig was walking out from between the trees right in front of where the enemy machine gun lay. Ah, see? Typical Nazis. Cowards and improperly dressed too. I have a mind to shoot him as a spy. You can't shoot a man who's carrying a white flag, spluttered Fatty Hardy. It's not fair. <laughs> the English gentleman, always so bloody fair. Perhaps if your homes had been burnt to the ground, you would not be so concerned to be bloody fair. The scarecrow figure reached the first poles. They searched him for weapons and frog marched him back to the major, arms twisted cruelly behind his back. From a doubled up position, he gasped, Rudy Gellart. Sergeant Luftwaffe, 764-532. Spy, shouted the Major. You will be shot, and all the others with you. The no others are. Back there is children. Children? Yeah, six school kids. Light dawned on Fatty Hardy. Is one called McGill? Yeah, Chassie McGill. Fatty Hardy wiped the dribbles of water off his face. He adjusted his helmet and his most fearsome expression. Suddenly, he knew where he was. McGill, I might have known it. Chapter 18 Charles sat helpless. There wasn't a German in sight except Rudy. Rudy was talking to Fatty Hardy. Then it all got very muddling. A police car turned up, disgorging the sergeant with the limp and two more constables. Then a van turned up and disgorged Mr. Little and ten home guard. Are they all Quislins? wailed Sam in wonder. Then all the German soldiers got up in a very relaxed sort of way and began trailing away, smoking cigarettes. He couldn't fire at them for fear of hitting the English people. Somehow he couldn't shoot Stan Little, even if he was a quizzling. Then more cars arrived. His mother and father got out, and Mr. and Mrs. Parton. Cool, there's me dad, said Carrot Juice. And mine, said Sam Jones. Hey, do you think the Germans are using them as hostages? Dunno, said Charles abruptly, as if he were brushing off a fly. For the Germans were retreating all the way to the skyline and getting into trucks. The mist was clearing from the landscape now, but Charles felt it was settling into his mind instead. The Germans drove away. Then all the police and parents began advancing on the fortress. They didn't look scared as hostages should. They just looked very angry. Charles saw his father's fists were clenched. Oh, God, what have we done? wailed Sam. The world had two faces. Which was the true one? The world of the long night of waiting? of Stukas and Panzers, stormtroopers and death, or the world of day, of punishments, hidings and magistrates' court. They couldn't decide, and the advancing horde gave them no time to decide. Something broke inside the children. The Luger cracked once, and the bullet whined wildly into the sky, as one police, parents and home guard flung themselves onto their faces. They looked pathetic, ridiculous and hateful lying there. Go back! Sod off! Leave us alone! screamed Chaz. Sod off! I will shoot! Suddenly he hated them all. He went on and on, shouting, Go away! Go away! Sod off, you bastards! Leave us alone! The parents did not move. Then Rudy alone got to his feet and began walking towards them. Get back, Rudy! Get back! Rudy went on advancing 
blocking off the field of fire of the gun. The children could no longer see what was happening behind him, and they had to know. Oh, God, said Clogger, and fired the Luger. Rudy smiled stupidly, raised one hand towards them, and fell to the ground. Oh, Rudy, cried Audrey, and ran out to him. In a second, all the children were gathered round him. He was lying on his back, pale and trying to speak, with a red stain spreading across his grey flying jacket. The ambulance had gone. The children stood in one huddled group, the adults in another. Shock still froze every face, but on the faces of the adults it was beginning to melt into righteous anger. The police sergeant fingered his notebook impatiently. Mr. McGill fingered the buckle of his belt. Mr. Parton's voice was raised in a querulous demand to know what things were coming to. All the adults were already busy, tidying up things in their minds, making them into more comfortable shapes. I don't know what's got into him. Wait till I get her home. Hooliganism. Stan Little made up his mind. If being home guard commander had its responsibilities, it also had its privileges. Clear the area, he said to his men. Then he said it sharper. Clear the area. This is a military matter. The home guard began to push the parents away apologetically with their rifles. Sandy finished off the job with a look. That means you, constable, and you too, sergeant. You put this matter in my hands and I'm keeping it there for the moment. Your time will come. The lame police sergeant flinched. Stan felt a pang of regret, but the children would never tell the truth with that peevish face around. Both policemen walked away, back stiff with rage. Now, how about showing us all this, McGill? Will you? The children led him and Sandy inside. They answered every question with monosyllables and shut faces. Only when Sandy boomed, This is a good hole, a very good hole indeed, well made to last. I could have done with this hole in the Somme in 1917 did their faces break into peaked grins that vanished as soon as they appeared. Stan left it to Sandy. The kids were obviously warming to him. I'd like to take this whole thing over, sir, for the home guard. We haven't got nothing as good as this. What was the sergeant major talking about? The dugout was well made enough, but totally in the wrong place. It defended nothing. Then he looked at the children's faces and understood. That brief smile was back again. And will you hand over your weapons, please, lady and gentlemen? We haven't got nothing as good as that machine gun. Chaz nodded. He picked up the Luger and put it into Sandy's giant fist. I dare say they can come up to the mill sometime, sir, and see the guns. Stan nodded. Sam and I will come, Chaz said, if we're not sent away to a school. These two can't. He indicated Clogger and Nicky. They'll have to go into a home. Stan wanted to say he'd see it didn't happen. But he couldn't see it didn't happen. He couldn't even promise that Chaz and Sam wouldn't be sent to an approved school. He looked at Chaz. Will you tell me how it all started? Chaz looked at him. No, sir. You'd never understand. Grown-ups never do. Is there any way I can help? Can you get Clogger and Nicky into the same home? Nicky needs Clogger. I'll try. And can you get permission for us to write to Rudy if... If... And let us know how he gets on. Every child's face softened. Lucky Rudy, thought Stan. Lucky enemy. If he lived. I can certainly do that. Thank you. Can we have a minute together, sir? Alone? As Stan emerged from the dugout, Mr. Parton came storming up to him. This is outrageous, Mr. Little. Why can't we see our children? I shall complain to the Education Committee about this. I am not acting under the orders of the Education Committee. I am acting under the authority of Northern Command York. Kindly address your complaints to the Brigadier there. Stan's voice was cutting and very precise. And, Mr. Parton? Yes? Where were you going in your car when my men turned you back on the Coast Road Bridge last night? On a visit to my sister in the Lake District. We go every spring. In the middle of the night? Yes. Leaving your daughter behind? That's none of your business. But where did you get the petrol? Stan turned to the police sergeant viciously. There's a case for you, sergeant. Black market. I look forward to seeing it reported in the local newspaper in full detail. 
What are you looking at me like that for, Mr McGill? said Mr Parton petulantly. I'll not say much for my lad, said Mr McGill slowly. Except he thought he was fighting the Germans. Oh, hush, said Mrs McGill. Chazzy could have killed somebody. I'm not talking about his sense, missus. I'm talking about his guts. Aye, said Sam Senior, looking hard at Mr Parton. That's one thing the kids didn't lack. Guts. And he spat on the ground. Cheero, said Chaz to Clogger suddenly. Cheero, boy, said Clogger. Not carbon on them. Don't let the bastards grind you down. Write to me. I'll let you know about Rudy. Aye, Levy, if they let me. And he grinned, because he remembered Chaz wreathed in smoke from the gun, standing swearing blue murder and quite unafraid, while Polish bullets hammered into the sandbags all around him. You're a hard man, Chazzy McGill. It was a bonny fight. Maybe we'll be in the real one before it's over. I hope so, said Chaz, and went round the gang for the last time, shaking hands, looking at faces. Bye, Nicky. Nil carborundum, said Nicky faintly, trying hard enough to cry and managing it. Bye, Sam. See you in court. Sam laughed, his old ridiculous laugh. Bye, Audrey. You are as good as any boy. Thanks, said Audrey. Bye, carrot juice. Thanks for letting me in on it. It was great. So they parted, never to be all together again. They walked across to their parents. Their arms were grabbed roughly, and they were led away. You're not to play with that McGill again, said Mrs Jones in a savage whisper. That cemetery Jones has always got you into trouble, said Mrs McGill. You've nigh broken your dad's heart. You're not to play with those big rough boys. You know you're easy led astray, said Carrot Juice's dad. I don't know what got into you, said Mr Parton. You'll stay home at nights in future. I'll make a lady of you if it kills you. You're too much for me, said Clogger's aunt. I'm having you put away. Come on, son, said the police sergeant to Nicky. You're going to tell me all about this. You're a cut above the rest of this riffraff, you know. Your father was a ship's captain. God knows what he'd have said. Nicky took a deep breath. Get stuffed, he said. <laughs>